And we're live with a chunky-ass set of discussion points to have, but I've been excited about some of these to, to talk with y'all, so... Welcome to the Rooster Teeth Podcast. Oh, it's ama- that's sad. It amazes me how we <laughs> can so film, bad. like, a three-hour podcast in only an hour. Like, it only takes us an hour to film three hours worth of content. It's amazing. Oh, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> I wish. That would be cool. <laughs> we, yeah. We all just sync up and uh, speak in three times the speed, and then I actually <laughs> slow it down in editing, and it seems normal. Uh, yep. Without further ado, uh, who wants to jump in first? Because we got to get going. Uh, I could volunteer. Go, Bradley, go. So here's Bradley, the thing. Whenever, doing? like, every year there's a million good-ass new games coming out, right? But oh, you yeah. always have to put some time aside to, like, replay some old shit. Like, last year was, like, my year of Kingdom Hearts. Uh, what a time. This year, against my will, uh, oh. I have been doing RuneScape again because I just got sucked back into the addiction. Um, so replaying it's been really fun, and I'm kind of doing stuff the right way because most of the time when I would play it when I was little, I... Would just kind of roam aim- aimlessly and do uh like all the extra miscellaneous shit uh but this time i've been like i've been like oh i want to complete all the quests and i want to use like all the best gear um and one thing i've noticed along the way is that i think i mentioned this to y'all a couple weeks ago i never really talked to the npcs or paid attention to the dialogue much when yeah. i used to play it um but some of this shit's hilarious like i was doing a quest and before I do the quest, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to Google all the equipment I need so I just have everything so I can just go do the quest without having to go back and get stuff. Uh, and in the que- So it's like you have like six pieces of clay, four pieces of iron, a bucket, two pieces of bronze, a red berry pie, whatever. Sure. And I go, I go to the guy who starts this quest off, and he, he lists all the items I need, and my character's like, you are not going to believe this. I just so happen to have every single one of those items in those exact quantities by pure coincidence no in my way. backpack. No. <laughs> so like there's a bunch of fun shit like that. Um, but just been having a ton of fun with RuneScape. Um, also, and this is very important, new orange dreamsicle frosty at Wendy's for everybody. I was driving down the street, saw the sign, got one that night. Do yourself a favor, get one. It's fucking delicious. But here's a real question. Yes. Did you get one for your wife as well? No. Um, but it, for that, Sounds we have... They, they, they have, like, this yeah. pomegranate lemonade thing that's fucking delicious. Mm-hmm. So we got her covered. Oh, and okay. then for my other quickie... Oh, my God, this rhymes. Quickie. Ricky Stanicki. Um, yeah. What is this? D- oh, my God. I was watching the trailers for this movie. I, I knew I was going to watch this movie the second I saw the first trailer. Essentially, the premise is there's these three guys who have a fake made-up friend named Ricky Stanicki. And they their whole lives, they've just used him as like, oh, accidentally ran over the neighbor's mailbox. Oh, I let I let Ricky fucking borrow my car. Or it's like, oh, the guys don't want to go to a baby shower. It's like, oh, Ricky Stanicki, he, we got to fly and see. He's, he's, he's the, the fallback guy. Yeah, he's the fallback. And I think eventually they just get to a scheme where there's like, guys, we can't like, they're not they're not gonna believe this like they're obviously gonna learn he's fake um and so they end up meeting a guy played by john cena who who by the way who he's he's been in movies for a long time he's great but i feel like the movies he's been on lately have he's like been on a um but his deal is he's kind of like a vegas sideshow performer um a lot doesn't get a lot of love and He meets these guys in a bar in Vegas, and he's essentially just like, I I know I could be the best actor ever if I just got a chance. I just never got a chance. That's why I'm here doing this stuff. Um, And so they're like, oh, my God, he can be our guy. He can play. He can play Ricky Stanicki and convince our wives and girlfriends he's real. Um, And that's basically the premise of the movie. Won't say more. It is just fucking hilarious. That sounds fun. Also starring Zac Efron. Also starring Zac Efron. Another, like, great comedic actor, so... The... Oh, yeah, no, he was he was killing me. I, I was in tears watching this movie. I just rewatched Neighbors, like, the other day. He's great. Uh, yeah, he's pretty... He's good. Um, and, yeah, uh, John Cena and uh, Batista are, like, cream of the crop as far as, like, wrestler turned oh, yeah. actor, so... Yeah. Dude, you're gonna see you're gonna see John Cena saying and doing things in this movie you never thought you would see John Cena saying or doing. 
move on. Which one of us is the Ricky Stanicky that actually hasn't been real all along, but we've like... I made up. Y'all made me up. Yeah, I made, true, we, we made Bradley up, actually. We actually yeah. use a voice modulator, and we switch off who's talking as Bradley. Uh, it's mm -hmm. current, Tyler is speaking as him right now. <laughs> See if you can guess throughout the podcast. Who's who. <clears throat> all right. Okay. Moving on. Who's next? I nominate uh myself okay. uh however tyler has... i'll go i'll go yes uh, help me out here there yeah. we go no um... you know what you know i got this oh Holy, dude that sounds good don't i sound yeah. much better now yeah okay yeah, yeah. there we go all right um mine consists <laughs> of a couple of games that i was wrapping up because i got hit with the jrpg trio of a calamity you're uh, not supposed to say jrpg anymore who says who says other oh, on Twitter. internet says internet articles no that one guy from square was mad at the yoshi p yeah yoshi p was mad at jrpg i'm sorry yoshi p like compare final fantasies to dragon's dogma and they're very well very different types of rpgs yeah they're both japanese but dragon's dogma yeah. feels more uh skyrim than anything um yeah so we had uh Yakuza, which I actually finished last time I was talking about how fantastic that game is and how good the character mm -hmm. work is. I finished it. Turns out it's a very polarizing ending, so I didn't find oh. that out till I beat it. Uh, I thought it was incredible. <laughs> that was uh, okay. insane. Like, thematically, one of the best stories I've ever, re like, gone through. But, like, I had to, some stuff had to click in my mind to make the antagonist, like, as good as they are for me so it was rewarding i like stories and games that like you have to put in a little effort but once you you dig a little it you makes you think they're going for it makes you think i like thinkers um mm -hmm. gameplay fantastic long game uh don't want to play i'll be there when i'm uh 29 with six perceived levels yes you oh jesus yeah that's how we do things <laughs> now i forgot um <laughs> Yeah, no, it'll take a while. I'm down. I'm now done with every Yakuza, and I actually don't want to play Yakuza for a while. I hope the next Yakuza they release is Kiwami Three, which would be a remake of Three, so I can just like not bother. Uh, as I like Three even, but I like I just don't like too much Yakuza in the last two years. I need to take a if a pause. If they remade Yakuza Three, do you think they would remake it as? An action game or as a JRPG game? Action game. Okay. Yeah, they wouldn't change the gameplay style. Um, <laughs> a lot of people like that Yakuza 3 combat, and you'll you'll see that in the future, Joe. Uh, and then, yes. very slowly, I make my way through Persona 3 Reload. Um, it's nice because since I know the ending of this game, there's no rush to not get spoiled. So it's like, I could just play it at my own pace. You ever turn on a game and like the the first thing you see when you turn on persona 3 reload is a content trigger warning of like this game has bullying and suicide and depictions mm -hmm. of violence Whoa, both of those, and abuse huh? yeah. but like what i was about to say is do you ever see a game where the like as soon as it's on you just start smiling and then i connect it like th that's how i feel like i turn on persona 3 reload and i feel so good but the first thing i see is like hey this game's dark as shit and i'm like yeah I love it. Yeah. I'm so happy. Yeah. Um, God, like, the vibes are immaculate. I can't get over, like, how much I love every play session with this game, but also just how much they've improved it. Like, the writers really get it because um, they've added oh, a lot of extra combat at content. And I was worried because Persona 4 and 5 are pretty different from 3, like, tonally. Um, mm -hmm. So I was really worried that they, like, would kind of botch it with like newer writing style but like they they're improving these characters even more than i thought possible so like i'm just vibing i'm still in august which for anyone who's played a persona game is like oh that's not even like 40 percent of the way through like so it's, hours it's good that uh it's good that like this like kind of like writing styles and stuff they've been refining in the new games didn't bleed over into the older one because like if you've been waiting so long for a remake for a game like this you want it to like match the vibe exactly like i was very concerned because like uh, persona 5 royal has a fantastic story but it's like it's just a very completely different way than that that they what they do to handle three so like as as good as that was i was like i hope it doesn't 
get a little messy, but it, it's it's great so far. Also, all the social links are voice acted in this one for the first time. It took them this long. Oh, nice. And it adds a lot. Like, it makes some that, like, oh, would be a kid that it was very annoying uh, to hang out with. Is, it brings <laughs> them down, humanizes them a bit more. It's great. Um, I also then... So, Stellar Blade's about to come out. I'm very excited for this game. But I don't know if y'all have been following the discourse around this game at all. Uh, no. I've, I've, I've been following it a little bit. So, like, it's interesting yeah. because I've, I've since found out that, like, I'm, like, the only person interested in this game as a game. Uh, yeah. Literally yeah. everyone else that talks about the game is just gooning over the main character. Like, literally oh. every post is just Eve gooning. I'm like, I'm... Uh, is it just me? I, I mean, am I the only one excited to play? Like, that's I don't the thing. Know. This is a game that, like, it was a big deal during a. It was like one of their big presentations during State of Play, right? Yes, it's like a yeah. Android action game with Near vibes. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't really like the writing of Near, which is a oh. hot take. So I was. Excited was this the game where um, they were like, "Look, we realize that players are going to spend most of their time looking at the yes. back of the player, so we game. decided to make it nice to look at." Yes. Yep. And I love that. I just like yeah. it's just upsetting that that's the everything everyone talks about. It's like weird. Like don't go in that subreddit, man. It smells we, weird. We, we know like, why you want to play the game, Whitler. It's okay. No, I mean yeah, but no, it's okay, buddy. It's like there's it's a video okay, game buddy. there too. No, I like action games. Get off my back, bro. Um, and then, you know, Eve gooning aside, I wanted to take some time and just shout out and celebrate the life of Akira Toriyama, who passed mm -hmm. away since last time we talked. Oh my god, dude. Oh, I, uh, this this I was, one hurt, because what? Dragon Ball is just really good, actually. That's the thing, like, there's Dragon Ball, there's Chrono Trigger, there's man, his man. stuff on Dragon Quest. Dr. Like, Slump. I feel, I feel like everything that man touched was just pristine. Apparently Mario is heavily influenced by uh, Arale from well, Dr. Slump. Obviously. So that like just like more, even Mario has been influenced by this man. So I don't know like just Dragon Ball Z is by no means like my favorite series, but yeah. man I had such a good time reading it back when I read the manga. No, um, we did. It's just such a good vibe. Part, I Dude, I was literally watching Dragon Ball Z when I got the news. Oh, that is really extra sad. It's, it's been like my workout show this year where like I only get to watch it when I'm working out, so like it motivates me to work out more and uh ah, that's a good, I know that they're on Namek, dude. Oh that's like Namek's Bradley, uh, you're you're like I think my other D B Z fan here. What's like your favorite D B Z moments in Arc? Like I kinda I kinda love the Saiyan saga because like it's at that realm where it's still kind of half grounded in the Dragon Ball stuff, and we're just getting the start. The, yep. the Saiyan Saga to me feels less like the beginning of Dragon Ball Z and more like a finale of Dragon Ball. That's Because it's like, I don't know, it's like all of your favorites from Dragon Ball all getting together to stop this one big menace against the planet. Bro, even Yonjirobe shows up, dude. And, and he does, he kind of does work too. <laughs> Doesn't he cut off Vegeta's tail? He cut off yes. Vegeta in the craziest page turn. Like, my yeah. god. Um, so no, I've been loving going through that again. And uh, Toriyama is such a such a master of like uh, paneling. Is like what oh, I, yeah. like you can just look at a Dragon Ball page and it's so breezy. And like the Dragon Ball Super stuff is not at that level, unfortunately. So like it, you could really tell it apart. But you're saying, Joe? I was gonna say like it, I feel like there's some credence to that, Bradley, because like that's like the last arc that's like an actual like adventure. I would say. Yeah, because they they go to Namek and everything, whereas like all the other arcs are like, the Cell Saga is pretty contained because they can just fly around, so they're just there, they're not exploring anything. And then you have the Boo Saga, which is just a tournament and them fighting Boo. Um, and then yeah. I guess they go to Heaven. Uh, multiple times they go to Heaven. Now Bradley said the Saiyan Saga, yeah. which is distinct from the Namek Saga, so I think he means oh, up Saiyan to Saga. Vegeta, which is gotcha, I wouldn't gotcha. say it's particularly adventurous, but I see what you mean with Namek being adventurous yeah uh that tends to be people's favorite arc is uh the namek stuff for oh my me, god oh for my me god. it's cell i'm a i'm a cell arc believer all day every day Cell um, is so and, badass and i am a uh boo arc enjoyer which is you know a lot of people shit on the boo arc but i think there's people a lot do. of great stuff there uh r.i.p go also dragon quest yeah. the slime is the perfect enemy 
uh, design of all time. So it's like just so so much influence and it just works. Yeah. Oh man, I I just remembered because like I, I it was in the coming days after the news of his passing, there were all these different mangaka for stuff like like literally anything like creator of like Naruto, Attack on Titan, yeah. like every everything you've ever heard of, and all of them were like when I was growing up. I would wait mm -hmm. for the new Dragon Ball chapter to come out every single week. Oh, he, he, like he, yeah. he, he, he created so many <laughs> people out he there. He birthed every action adventure series we follow yeah. today, like in some way. Like his influence is crazy. He's the direct influence of Oda, which, by the way, Oda mm -hmm. and Kishimoto, which is the Naruto guy, their messages were hard to read because, like, they were very close to him. It seems so. That was a mm -hmm. big bummer to read. I mean, it's got to be like one of those things where it's like you know you look up to somebody to be your like. Like your inspiration, and then getting like personally close to them, and then like you have like the double whammy of like your friend dying, and then also like your direct inspiration of who you yeah. are. Yeah, it is like, a the double whammy is a good way to put it. Like, it's <laughs> I, I, I would, I think even for someone like me who only knows of Dragon Ball Z, like watching it on Toonami, like yeah. you I was Super, never right? great. I it, yeah, you know, as I was older I watched Super, but I mm -hmm. like I, I skipped uh the pink Goku saga. Like I just watched the tournaments, you <laughs> yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The fun stuff. But even for someone like me who's a very casual Dragon Ball enjoyer, if I wasn't drawing an anime character on my desk in, in grade school with Goku hair every single time, <laughs> yes. then it's like yeah. like every guy you know, like you draw a stick figure, he's got Goku he's hair. He's got Goku hair. And who has it? Who got... amongst us hasn't tried a Kamehameha and maybe even power up into Super Saiyan? You have to try at least once. You, have you, never, to, you know. never know. You never know. <laughs> I did it, but no one was around to see it, so. Oh, uh, yeah. shit. <laughs> Get out of here. I did a fucking uh, spirit bomb, but no one helped, so it was very sad. Ah, shit. It did, nothing came yeah. out. All right. I'm a baton pass over to Joe. Oh, God. All right. Uh, sorry for the background noise. I literally could not hear uh, the people talking in the background. Uh, okay. Yeah, I know. Um, all right, then. I got a lot. So, I'm sticking to Willer's Yakuza train. I finished Yakuza Kiwami 1. Sick. Um, I, I think the best way to describe that game is, like, going from one, 0 to 1, it was very disappointing. I want to say, mm -hmm. uh, it like it, it feels they didn't do anything to the story to change it. They didn't try to connect things back to zero or well, like, cause they did. They added the niche key scenes, which are the best parts yes. of the game, but they stand out right. as the best very explicitly. Yeah. It's like, it's, that's the only thing. Right. Yeah. And, um, so it's, it's too faithful. Yeah. And so it's, it feels like, you know, like we're just going to update this and we're not going to like, it's it very much is like, the worst version of a remake. I don't know, worst version. A worst version would be a, an inoperable game. But just very disappointing to go from zero to one. Um, and I was getting very tired of the combat. Uh, I'm in. I'm a little bit past halfway to of Kiwami two, and I, uh, I am enjoying that way way more. Kiwami two so is actually super fun. Um, and yeah, like it's, it looks beautiful, mm, and the story's cool. Yeah, it's got it's got yes. some dumb shit, but it's it, it's the antagonist in particular is is just so cool yeah. and so good. Yeah, so like I, I'll probably just not be doing like much bigger like takes with Yakuza because it'll be very infrequent. Uh, but that's halfway. We got hit by a bunch of games I wanted to play, so it's just ended up like being put to the side for right now that's the beauty um, of yakuza it's, it's always there to fill in the true, gaps whenever true, you have true. time the other thing about yakuza 2 is that it has the fucking cabaret game again and it's 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 like i want to keep playing i have to beat the game though <laughs> <laughs> well, well you can't beat the game without completing the cabaret storyline like that's not yeah, how that it's... works it's, uh, it's some of the Yakuza cool. games there's mandatory side content for like yeah. a full completion even of, I, of, of the main story yeah. you gotta do it I do like Willard did you like my, my message to you about the photo shoot game uh, <laughs> yes the grab your room photo shoot it's like what the hell is this oh I see <laughs> um, Joe stumbled also, into the horny mini game there's always one 
Yeah, I also didn't realize this until like I, I went on the Reddit or something. Those are actually Japanese porn actresses. Joe, I thought they were just models. My guy, uh, you've been dealing yeah. with porn actresses since Sakuza Zero. I you know. know all those phone cards you were picking up. Yeah, uh, baseball cards. You, the fucking you're you're you. Uh, what's her name? Marissa Marina. Your yeah. K- Kiryu's real estate. Uh, girl, right? Yeah, she is yeah. a porn star. I had to verify. <laughs> uh, I, that I was, one, wow. that one was verified. Yeah, that, but that photo shoot one was a lot for what I was expecting because it was really funny. To, yeah, <laughs> your ass is not ready for Yakuza Six, bro. I'm not even. I'm not even oh, gonna I'm sure. tell you what. Sure. Like Yakuza Six horny mini game, I like. I could. I, I was besides myself. They went too hard. Um, but no, I, Kwame Two. I've I've really really been enjoying. I knew you would like Kwame Two. I was yeah. worried about yeah. one and three for you. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, on the win, I watched Prey and the Emancipation of Harley Quinn. Do y'all even know what this movie is? This is no. Birds of Prey. Yeah, I know yeah. this movie. I is this live it. action? Yes. Oh. Uh, this is yeah, like this the is Harley like... Quinn like Suicide Squad semi sequel. Like, how do you explain yeah. this? Yeah. How many semi sequels are they gonna have? <laughs> well, oh, God. two. It's it's like three with Peacemaker. It's like, yeah, it's like we want to separate Harley Quinn because we like Margot Robbie of Harley Quinn, but we want to separate her from the Suicide franchise so we want to make her stand alone but at the same time you want to set up our own superheroes because apparently our mainstay of superheroes we already fucked up so we're going to bring in these I would say B minus tier maybe even C tier superheroes quote unquote to like be a potential like backdoor pilot you're jump being off generous kind of probably yeah but uh, it's, it's it's the movie is so weird and it's, it's also incredible incredibly boring i thought it was um, good that's a bummer yeah i just i was it like it it has it just goes nowhere and it also is all over the place it does the same thing that suicide squad does where it starts three times <laughs> it, it frustrates it like literally harley quinn is like talking about something she's like wait let me go back and she goes back and talks about the sandwich and then she goes like wait wait, wait let me go back again and then you go back again and you're like okay we're done now right and then you get halfway through the movie, and she's like, wait, I forgot something. And then she goes back further than that time, and that goes for another 30 minutes. She's chaotic, uh, tongue gal, uh, winking face emoji. So quirky. Um, quirky anyways, though. don't recommend. Uh, but I just thought I'd bring that up because it was just, I just was, it gave me a second aneurysm. Um, the other thing is, is that Rooster Teeth uh, was announced its closure by Warner Brothers Studios. Yeah, they're done done for real yeah and, and they're, they're they're still operating right now but like in the coming months they're shutting down um i just think it's important to bring up because rooster teeth is kind of like one if if not one of the most important companies when it comes to like internet media like they are like kind of like the ones that really started and kicked off this whole like media franchising or media like empire in terms of like entertainment like they had like red versus blue and then they blew that up into like their other uh, kind of uh, series as well, like Ruby and the Rusty Podcast. Like they, it's it's kind of you forget about it, but like they really were like a tentpole and making like developing what the internet is, dude. Especially today. like even like I don't know if they invented Let's Plays, but they were doing yeah. that shit like Chief in ancient Hunter. times. They even had yeah. a ch- they had the channel called Let's Play. I think Whoa. they did. You know what's so crazy? It's... All my friends yeah. love Rooster Teeth. I, somehow I dodged every single one of their product, even it's though insane. I've grown up. How is that possible for us? Because we've used the internet our whole lives. Like I don't know how we managed to do that. I, I don't know. I don't think those those that content would be your style of content, anyways, Willer. I only I just... saw Red versus Blue, and then I was like, I, I thought Rooster Teeth was on the Machinima train of abusing uh, like YouTube content creators in the first like four years of youtube yeah, and you know what i think like i think they just did a bunch of different shit because i've talked to people yeah. who are like i never watched red versus blue or their let's plays i just listen to their podcast and then there'd be yeah. one person who's like i never watch any of the other stuff i just watch ruby or you yeah. know I, I feel like they just did so many different stuff that it, it, they were media is not even red versus blue like nothing i can cons- the most i've consumed from yeah. them is 
playing as the characters in blaze blue cross tag. Like, yeah, that's the, Ruby the closest characters. I've gotten. Hot take. Yeah. Just because they were the first ones to do Let's Play videos doesn't mean that YouTube was never not going to have Let's Play videos. I if it was, I mean, someone would have done it. I mean, we live yes. in this history. There's no going back. Like, they were just yeah. the first, okay? Yeah. But, like, the point being is that, like, they kind of were the proving point of, like, this is possible and it can be profitable. I mean, they were around for 21 years. Yeah. Like, they had cons. Kind of like, they had it, cons for yeah. their products. Like, that's crazy. Yes. Uh,. 21 years IMO is a very short run when what I would classify is a very unsuccessful like in business uh, terms very unsuccessful in amount business? of terms of dude business, they, yes, they, yes, they in put, terms of the internet they put yes, red versus said. blue on DVD on DVD yeah. which yeah, is good. like no that's not good that's good good for them Come that's on. going they outside of your medium to cater to people who are not your audience but Tyler they were like inventing the playbook like they didn't know they were doing something like they were charting yeah. new ground as far as a business goes so for 21 years like what other internet business can you say lasted the 21 years that they did that smosh which is still around uh, yes smosh is yeah legendary as well mm -hmm. uh, like they, two two kings can coexist but in this like I, are you talking about internet businesses that have like google I don't, they don't really count, like, they're not, like, content Netflix. creation -y. They, they weren't, like, they didn't create, like, they're, they're, it's a, they're part of internet culture, I think is the big thing. Like, that's where they thrive. It's not, like, providing a service, it's yeah. creating oh, yeah. entertainment. They use the platform the to create yeah. their business I, as opposed I'm gonna to I'm going to get Netflix roasted for my opinion about it, of course, but, like, right. this is my hot take. I'm glad. I, I'm glad you I, still I, have your fire. <laughs> it's obviously like a failure of a business because it's now defunct. Like I'm not denying that, but it's the, but there's also several other businesses that have started before and have gone out of business, but have uh, inspired or have been like jumping off point for a lot of different things. Uh, I always listen to the fucking Rooster podcast every Monday uh, when it came out. It was and I was a subscriber. Like I subscribed to Rooster Teeth to listen to that podcast and. Uh, and when Bernie Burns left, and like a lot of them left, I'm like, I, I'm done, and I just stop enjoying the. Oh, company. you know what? I can yeah. name two others: Mad TV and College Humor Media. <laughs> college like, Humor. Uh, man. I'll give you College keep Humor. That, keep that in mind, because that's coming up later. Oh, yeah, sure. for sure. Yeah. Oh, this is Joe's secret thing. Okay, we we got we got there. <laughs> um. All right, and then, but yeah, I just I just think it's interesting. Um. Uh, and then finally. Uh, my friends and I have gone through the gambit of all the Arkham campaigns Ooh. now at this point. Um, I've actually run through them, I think, three times now with people in person. Um, so, But we've been playing online a lot because one of my friends uh, is away from me, so I can't play with her. Uh, so we're like, all right, well, what do we do? It's like, well, we're online. Let's just do custom content now. So we did a uh custom campaign called uh arkham horror dark matter which is a somewhat of a soft sequel to one of the campaigns that's based off the king in yellow but set in the future and is like uh like a space faring kind of like uh extraterrestrial kind of a campaign it's a left uh for yeah it's a for a custom campaign that's made by one dude that did it on his free time very very impressive uh it's got its own art it's got its own really unique mechanics uh, that are functional, but I think has some flaws to them. But like, we're really fun and we're using some very, very creative ways. Um, and we really enjoyed it. Uh, but man, you can really tell uh, the power of an editor because we were reading through like the different sections of the game and there were some run-on sentences or just like grammatical errors, just every single paragraph. Um, so it's just like, man, there's some like... You can really tell who's a professional writer who's not. I'm not trying to park on them, but it's funny. Joe hates them. I, it's true. I hate indie people. Uh, but we enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. We'll probably play more. I give us all like six out of ten if I'm comparing it to the other Arkham mm. campaigns that I've played. Uh, but yeah, but like it's eight full campaigns, eight full scenarios, which is crazy. That's like six hundred cards this guy had to make by himself. Yeah, Jesus. Good on yeah. them. You know what? You're and allowed Joe, some Joe, run on sentences. Yeah. When you say a campaign, that's like four different. How many missions are in like a single campaign? Eight. 
And each mission probably takes like three to five hours. It probably takes about two hours. Okay. Uh, but it, still. It, yeah. It's yeah. No, like it's impressive. Um, but yeah, that, but we start with that one because that one's like really like uh, that one's really well liked within the community. Also, by the way, I don't know if y'all know this, but the art community is like really dedicated like not only do they have their own website where you deck build they have a fully functional professional looking app that one person maintains and like keeps up and uses everything for that you can build your decks on that also tracks all of your campaign information that also includes every campaign and every fan campaign made wow like that's it's kind of crazy and there's tons of the shout shit. outs to single dedicated fans carrying entire communities I, I, yeah. <laughs> um but i think that's it for me and my quickies at this point oh uh yeah. yeah baton pass to sick tyler who is sounding pretty good now i will say you're, you're i good. i am dousing myself in water and trying <laughs> he's he's swimming right now Gl glurp 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 <laughs> last later. um so I started playing Honkai Star Rail again because it's their year anniversary. So I did a little pre-build up, you know, going into it because, and Bradley knows how this works, at their first year anniversary, they released their Raiden Shogun character. Ooh, pretty much. I remember when that happened. Patch. I don't even play the game, but I remember when that happened. Bradley knows what I'm talking about. You guys love your katana waifus. This is all they, She is a katana waifu. Um, they released, like, this big trailer of her seducing another character and, like, her dual split personalities. But that's not why I'm here to talk about. Like, obviously, I got the character. I saved up my roles like <laughs> yeah. a good boy. Uh, still, still, uh, light spender on the game. Less than $100 put in. I'm a He's good a dolphin. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I'm here to talk about the new area of the game. Okay. Because you got a new planet. Um... In this new planet, you are at Disney World. Oh yeah, Disney World. But you're incepting the Matrix in a low in Ocean's Eleven. Obviously, interesting. Break that down yeah. for me. Um, so you go to this new planet, and it's based like it's like this big cruise ship where you sit in a bathtub and you go into Dreamland and like. Dreamland is like the actual event, and there's like oh, yeah. this family hosting this big party. Um, and while you're there, this dream girl shows up and is like, Yo, we can go even deeper. And then you go deeper into the dreams and you start like finding really weird shit. Ooh. Um, I don't think Kelly would appreciate you going that deep with another girl, yeah. But uh, then, um I like it gets weird and as a casual player I don't care too much about the story. It's like Mickey Mouse shows up as Clocky. Um <laughs> I love Clocky Mouse. They they have the Orpheus TV room where you start fighting the nightmare robots. Um there's a T-Rex enemy that's a giant dinosaur which is kind of cool and he's got a chef hat and uh oh, he spits quirky. fire all over. Yeah, he spits fire all over everybody. It seems um, like Honkai does cool conceptual stuff that Genshin may, is, it may not go quite as crazy with. Oh my god, they do all kind of shit that people wish Genshin would do. Yeah, the, the, the meme is Genshin could never. Oh. That, that really is. Dude, you know how many times I've seen that fucking phrase? Because here's the thing. I think it was only a month or two ago Honkai had like their anniversary event. Um, no, everyone... it's, it, it's going on now. Yeah, it's going on now. That's what I was yeah. talking about, yeah. And I just like all the stuff you get for it looks so awesome. And I remember the second I saw all the stuff uh, Star Rail players would be getting, I was like, I guarantee if I go to the Genshin subreddit right now, there's going to be a million people bitching and moaning. And I'm going to be one of them. And you know what? There was. <laughs> Deserved. Deserved. Uh, uh, Hon Honkai Star Rail gave you a top tier DPS free five star unit. Um, The last two events in 2.0 and 2.1, they are giving out two four star units of your picking. You get to choose. The first one was from four different units. The second one is from eight different units. Right. Um, they have four other old events that they just put into the game that you can do at any point to get other four star units. Oh so God. it's like if you want to get a new four star healer, that's really good. You can go and get this unit. Um, 
there's a there's a lot that's good for it. But the good thing that I do want to talk about, um, there are like six different in game contents for Honkai Star Rail. And as someone who's a casual player, there's a lot for me to do because it's like I just got to level 60. Like I was literally doing level 60 stuff, the level 60 quest earlier before we started. Um, because when that unlocks, you can do like the highest level in-game content. They have like a roguelike mode. They have a new version of that roguelike mode where like you got to try to like power fantasy up your like characters as much as you can, which is really cool because it's like you've spent so much time like, on the RNG to get these characters where you can, and then you're like, oh, cool, now I, I get to do RNG to actually try and, like, kind of beat the game. It, and, like, they get even stronger. It's a really cool, fun part to do. Um, on, not only that, they're releasing a lot of new stuff to make older characters better, Okay, which is very interesting. So, like, imagine if they made Crystallize viable, Bradley. Oh, my God. Man... Yeah. They they recently they recently finally released a character and there were memes saying Geo is back because they finally made a good Geo character and I've been using her ever since. But like the five star one? Oh yeah, she's so good. But I get what Am you I... mean though. When you said Geo is back, it made me immediately think of my main from Guilty Gear. I'm like, <laughs> what? They buffed the shit out of her? What the hell? Let's go. Um, but yeah, it's 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 fun. It's simple. It's very casual. I've been playing it on PS5 on my TV, so it's burning my retinas out. Um, Gold. It's a good break in between Elden Ring because I got to Giant's Flame, and it feels like I'm in Kaelid again for the first time. Because oh, uh, yeah. this is my first time in the Giants plane. They dial it back up, and you, you're in new territory. So I was I was not ready, and I feel like everything I've done for the last 100 hours was for nothing because I'm just getting my ass beat. Uh, well, it wasn't for nothing because you would be getting atomized if you didn't do it. So you could be yeah, doing worse. I, I did uh, beat the area, the liturgy town. I, I beat that Fuck, super quick. That is the most fucked up puzzle in that game. Tyler just did it yesterday. Uh, it wasn't that bad. Dude, you knew about the torch. I think I did that puzzle without the torch, by the way. I, I okay, that's it. your fault for not reading weapon descriptions as you go through the game. Yeah, it is my fault, but I'm not even that, like, I, I, you shouldn't hate me that much for it. I, I, I shouldn't use the things that they put in the game. How? Why am I going to read a random torch, bro? That's not even, like, a why? boss weapon. Why is there a new torch in the game at the 70-hour uh, mark? Ah, uh, whatever. You know, Tyler may be bullshit, but he's got a point. <laughs> he's bullshit, anyway. but I believe it. <laughs> um, I fought a bunch of cool bosses in Lindale. Lindale is probably, like, the I peak of the game. love Lindale. Um, oh, my God. What an That is probably, like, their expert designer who's been at From Software for, like, the last 20 years. The Royal like, Capital as a dungeon is just, like, overwhelmingly great to explore. It know. is... It's got bosses, it's got the lore, it's got dungeons inside of dungeons. Um, it's <laughs> it's sewers. amazing. Yeah. The yeah, sewers like, that lead into other dungeons? Yeah, that shit's wild. Um, the, the secret dungeon inside of the secret boss room? Like, what? Oh, that is that, that one's too much. Sometimes they gotta reel it back a little bit. They, they, yeah, they, I, they that one that. is too much. Did you get to the room that you have to get, like, the third ending, which is, like, just this absurdly weird room that you have to learn how to navigate? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Somewhere in there. Um, I was gonna ask something. Oh, are you talking about the third dungeon that, like, confuses you? It's a room where you have to do platforming in a, in, in a Souls game. Which is yeah, a yeah, I, I did I did that one and I made it to the bottom. But then um, you can't, don't go through that door unless... Yeah, right. Sir Ket was there with me and yeah, she was yeah. like, don't go through that door because that's the only way to drastically change the game. And I was like, I'm going to go back through the fucking door. <laughs> to be fair, it's the edgelord ending, but it's like one of my, it's like maybe my favorite. It, so. It's kind of the way I've been playing my whole game, like with going with such a tall like I'm not doing faith strength. I'm not doing faith dexterity. I'm not doing intelligence and dexterity. I'm doing intelligence and faith and I cast all the fucking spells with a one-handed sword and I use the fuck out of my shield in this game good, good for you i remember you and were, it, nobody's you, stopping me have fun using your shield against millennia because that is uh where the that train ends that <laughs> I, I i i i 
li- genuinely so, do so not even. Will, hey, hey, blah, blah, blah. I know that that's the final boss. No, she's not. Oh, cool. You that's don't know the final that was no, no. Then that is my expectation of the game. I don't know what the final boss of this game is. Great. You never have. I, I have been that spoiler free. I thought it, I knew Melania, but I'm I'm close because I just got to the Hallig tree. Did you find so a like, boss called Fire Giant? Not yet. No. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So stop talking. We're gonna no, move we're on done. to we're One Piece. Uh, I was also gonna say you've uh, been feeding Shabibri her ga- her grapes. So you. I did. You're I did. A freak, bro. You, you should. Go to that. <laughs> I should. Um, I watched the One Piece Wano with my fiance. Let's go. Um, I really look forward to them remaking this when I have like a ten-year-old child and putting it on Netflix. Oh yeah. In like fifteen years, one day this the yeah. seasonal anime will reach here and it'll be peak. It will like, but <sighs> I will say I if anybody makes a master cut of that, I would highly recommend anybody go back and watch that. It is peak peak One Piece. I, yeah, my Wano appreciation has grown over time, especially as I've, I've watched more analysis and, and gone and, over and the chapters more. And the anime, like, when it's not dragging its feet the way it does certain scenes, is fantastic. Like, yes, like, obviously. Everybody knows that it drags its feet on certain parts. I sit here on Crunchyroll. I click through the parts that I know it's dragging But then also, along. they give, like, a carrot filler episode which was something I complained about. It's like, they just said, they didn't even say goodbye to carrot in the manga. They yeah. just said, see ya. She's oh yeah on. we got the carrot filler episode it's great good. this is good filler this is what we yeah want. because it's the parts that are canon like the anime is making canon moments yeah and it's uh it's very nice it was great i cried probably three different times uh something that a still form probably will never make me do uh unfortunately the so, music the thing. music hits but hey. it is the music it's the voice actors they, they're all fantastic yeah. Um, I would highly recommend going back to oh uh, watch Wano. Willer, hold on. Let me double check our schedule here to make sure you didn't like put it on the official. Oh, you did. Okay, never mind. What I'm uh, thinking is they need to start shipping manga volumes with little sound chips in the back so you still get the soundtrack <laughs> when you turn to the right. Well, page. they do for the card game now. <laughs> oh yeah, they do. They have the sound loaders. No, no fucking cap, Bradley. Whenever I read the manga, I have to. I have like an OST track that I flip through. To like synchronize with what's going on in the manga probably enhances the experience a lot i uh yeah i was gonna oh i forgot like just as a bonus jumping off of anime manga stuff i also caught up on i read a bunch of undead unluck which is a series me and joe read um i'm up to chapter 104 joe we have beaten autumn which was the best arc so far ah that that arc is phenomenal. That was very good. Um, I don't like what's happening now. We're fighting what's a seal. Um, I don't know. This I'm is it. Very unengaged yeah. with the seal stuff, but we'll, we'll jump back on it. Um, it's it. It comes back around. I think there's a reason behind it. Um, oh, I yeah. just have to get to the second half of the manga. Um, <laughs> yep, <laughs> the alleged start of the manga. Will the happen classic. Soon. Yeah. Well, it's actually, he might be onto something this time because the manga is very. T- Wait, Tyler, did you ever watch the anime for Undead Unlock? Because I always felt like you would like I... some of the weird shit that's in it. It's it's on my to watch list once okay, the cool. season ends. Cool, cool, cool. It has ended. Yeah. It ended uh, last. Oh, week. good to know. But yeah, I kind of have a rule now where I try to watch anime after the season has ended because that's I got too fair. much other shit going on in my life. By the way, <laughs> should I be watching the Dan to Dan anime? No, yes. You should be reading the Dead you Dead manga. Should, no, I'm here. I should do. I should do that instead. Because like Bradley, the manga understand. looks gorgeous, Bradley. It's yeah. it's like we there's a meme between the three of us that we just say weekly manga because it shouldn't be. It's 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 the art that you would think it would take someone two months to create that chapter. Yeah, but he's doing it weekly. It's it's incredible. Just one of those manga monsters. But really, oh God. what Bradley should be reading slash watching, but really reading, is Akane Banashi, because that's very Bradley core, but that's a story for another day. We'll, we'll yeah. fight that fight later. Um, I caught up on Sakamoto Days. Fuck, Ooh, man. That's okay. such a fun series. I, I can't I, wait for that to get... I can't wait for Tyler to experience Sakamoto Days, actually. That's, uh, what do you mean? I'm like... What chapter are they on? Wait, you? I forgot that you've read it. Um, Yeah. The last thing that I... So they're doing the... Au- not an auction it's like a museum and they're protecting the president 
Okay, I got I got past the part where they had to like go investigate the school and they recruited a new member to the yeah. grocery oh, store. That's where I'm at. at that's this point. I, so there's I, an I, arc I, after that that I, we're in like deep now. I I kind of stopped because I couldn't keep track of all the characters. It was a whole lot for me. There's a lot of characters. I I had to roll into it and, and like I slowly get it. I don't think it's a good weekly read because like the fights yeah. are so good that I I'm actually mad that I had to stop where I was in the fight. Um. The psychic boy is fighting, like, a du- uh, an assassin whose gimmick is, like, sports. So, like, he's killing you with, like, shot put and, like, basketball moves. It's so fucking fun. Um, that series has, like, probably my favorite manga action. I think he's brilliant at conveying, like, a kinetic fight through the medium of Move manga. It, yeah. Yeah. It's very good. Uh, yeah, and then Dan and Dan, which we talked about in our Dan and Dan episode. It's great. Yeah. All right. Uh... Joe, what is this secret topic that you you've thrown in here for us to? Yeah, I want to know what we're working with. So, Bradley, I mean Bradley, Tyler mentioned college humor going defunct. That's not entirely true, at all. No, Uh, because they have the the talk show that they spun off. It's not a talk show. Um, so college humor got dropped from like. I guess the equivalent is like a the publisher, like a studio getting dropped by the publisher, basically. Okay. Uh, they got dropped. The current CEO of was what was College Humor, Sam Reich, bought the company as like an individual, like, like person within the company, which is kind of wild to think about. He was like high up there, but like he wasn't like an executive. He was like the creative director of College Humor at the time. Um. He was like, okay, we're going to take this. We're going to make a subscription program called Dropout, um, where uh, we're going to create, like, premium media. People can, like, subscribe to it, kind of an alternative to Patreon, so it doesn't go through Patreon, but, like, we'll produce content there. Um, It has been a huge success. Uh, it's, it's It's been doing really, really well. Uh, I originally subscribe to uh their services to watch their show um actually which is like a nerdy trivia show you have the board game for that you're yes a, i do you're and a I recorded a big game. fan of, the, of that yes game. and i showed an episode once when we were at we were hanging out on my birthday and we were eating like pizza very <laughs> very weird birthday party because it was during the middle of covid um but uh but their other show that i really really like is dropout game changer which is essentially like uh the closest equivalent is taskmaster but like rather than like a constant like contestants for a season each episode is a completely different fleshed out game contestants that are on that that's within their staff and crew um it's so fucking funny like it 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 makes me fall out of my chair every time i watch it it's something i can't put on while i'm working because i will legitimately like stop what doing what i'm doing and watch the show instead. That's what I do with Taskmaster. Uh, so, and I, in fact, yeah. I I took a break on Taskmaster because I was loving it so much. So maybe I'll <laughs> swing into this if it's good. Yeah, but I but like it's just but like there's but he takes like the simplest like ideas and kind of expounds upon them. So like for the first two seasons, like when Dropout was starting, was around Dropout first started in 2019, and they did two seasons of the show, and then of course COVID happened in 2020. And it's like, shit. Uh, this is probably gonna be the end of this. Like subscription service are probably done. Whatever. Uh, they came out with season three, which was entirely webcam based. Everyone was in their homes doing the show. It's some of the funniest content I've seen from them, uh, which is incredible considering that like a lot of their humor is from the way that they bounce off of each other. And they have great guest stars as well. Um, but and like for example, like one of the uh, one of the episodes is they like Sam, who is the guy who runs the show, gives him a prompt of like, I need you to recite the alphabet, but I need you to do it in a menacing tone of of like an evil like like you're about to murder somebody or like a like a like torture them essentially. And they do that, and he's like, Well, you know what? I like you too much that I can't be a really good like judge of your character without a really good yardstick so um we have john carlo esposito come on and he's gonna <laughs> also do all those skits and you were gonna compare them him to you and see which one is better um and 
it was it's just phenomenal and which also john carlo very very funny and huh? also can just turn on a dime between menacing and being like just the silliest person on the that's planet. a thing that comes up on twitter like fairly frequently yeah. that like john carlo esposito needs to stop being typecast as a villain because he's also very yeah. funny um, yeah i remember him in the community episode where like they use his dry like villainy as a humor and i thought that was really mm -hmm. good that's the thing um, i haven't gotten to see him in like humorous contexts at all so like just try to imagine it isn't computing for me <laughs> yeah it's just like but the, the thing about the show that i really love it's in like i've been watching it for like years now and it's it's so hard to come like to just like show like why i love the show or explain why i love the show so much because it's just it's it's like something you just have to sit down and watch and really kind of enjoy and marinate however Two weeks ago, we had Sam Says 3, which is every once in a while, the host Sam really likes a game, and so he does it up to three times, and so this is the last one. Um, and Sam Says 3 ended on this image. Let me let me get, grab it up real quick. Ooh, and the, yeah, the, just the fucking, like, it, it was just... The, how we got here was just so fucking funny. Uh, it's it's like this is it's this to me is like what I want from this show essentially. Uh, it's just these people on the floor defeated and upset about what the fuck has just happened to them. I like the person um, on the left. Um, oh, so to give context right. here is in this game they start at fifty points and every time you. Uh, do something that Sam doesn't say, you lose a point. And at the end, of the, there's a big twist at the end of the game, and it just got revealed to them, and then they've all lost all of their points, essentially. <laughs> and they're just all reacting to it. Um, Is this the same episode where he says, don't look now, but there's a cute little pig and a, yes, and a hat? That's the, that's the exact same episode. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, we're, we're doing Black Mirror episode one? Okay, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, it, it, it's like he just goes don't look now but, but we're gonna bring out our friend yeah. henry and he is a pig who is wearing a cute little homemade hat mm -hmm. and then they uh, it like shows all their faces and they're all just not looking at the pig as he just goes on to continue to describe the pig and how cute yeah. it is yeah um and they're like what kind of hat is it and he's like it is a tiny cowboy hat and he yeah. is wagging his tail like a dog is just loving it's his life to today helicopter. yeah uh but like that and that's just like some part of it but then he does crazy things like um escape the green room which is they took like the green room which is like your preparation room before you yeah. ever like go on stage mm -hmm. and he turned it into an escape room <laughs> that's oh my god room, which is like you turned your entire a part of your office into an escape room and this isn't like like oh like there's just stuff in here they had to cut shit out of the walls and do stuff kind of a situation wait didn't they pit them against each other too yes so now they've started doing a thing where it's a competitive season, escape room yeah at, at the end of the, every season now they do a game of survivor with the cast Whoa. that was on the show and oh my god it's so fucking and there there are a lot of like improv and comedy sh things but now they've gotten like guest appearances like they had howie mandel come on as like a judge for a talent show for a redemption Fun. challenge um but like, they've been doing super successful with it. And I just, like, I got to the point, like, I watched Sam Says 3. And I was like, this is so fucking funny. I just, I feel like y'all should be aware of this exists. And you should look for it and enjoy it. Because they have some episodes on YouTube that are fully out there that will give you a really good idea of, like, what it's like. But, like, and there's a bunch of other stuff that I don't want to spoil. But it's a show that every time, like, I go on, it's like, I don't know what we're going we're going to get. But I'm going to really enjoy it. Like this latest episode was a drawing challenge that has uh, I don't know if y'all ever watched Draw Fee uh, on YouTube. It's like people like yeah, yeah. So like they had that crew come on and they did a game changer show that was drawing based and they weren't just drawing on like paper. It's like okay, uh, you gotta like now do a tramp stamp on some of these people with marker and whoever has the best one uh, wins and that person's going to go get that tramp stamp um later uh very really fun episode uh very very fun but yeah it's it's like i love it so much they're bi-weekly um and they do like two seasons a year too uh but it's small i think they're doing a really good job of like 
still creating very creative content that is like not just like dead brain um just the dead brain content that people are like throwing out there. I think it's it's been really really fun and very creative, and I, all of their other shows are really good too. Um, but you should definitely check it out. And now because I mentioned it to all of y'all, it's going to show up on all y'all's fucking algorithms. It probably will actually. True, <laughs> they're <it's> already there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Surely. But yeah, I, I I highly recommend this show, right. and I've just been holding on to it for years. My just, awareness so is aware, and yeah. I will try to check this out. This seems. I hope it's. I hope it's not as captivating as you said, so I could throw it in the background, but I don't believe it. Oh, you, some can't, episodes... you, you can't put it in the background. Damn. Never mind then. <laughs> oh, man. I just, yeah. The, may, right. Maybe while you play games. Yeah. Maybe. If it's an RPG that <laughs> that I could look away yeah. from. Persona, I, my the, Persona a companion. Yeah. The one, the thing that I love about, the thing that like made me like really like strong and like a big fan was that they did that season three where they were all in webcams and... I laughed just as much as they were in person, like in their studio. And I was like, okay, they have the sauce. They know how to like get a laugh and cook. And, and it's just, it's great. Um, and they have great chemistry together. And a lot of their, some of their games also act as like kind of pilots, back backdoor pilots. And some of their games spin off to be their own games as well for like their own shows, which has been really fun. Um, but yeah, uh, Dropout, everyone should just check out. I think it's one of the better like, premium streaming services out there currently that's putting Excellent. out really good content oh it's a premier streaming service right yeah uh, that's unfortunate anyways i'm gonna do a quick audible um before yeah. we, we're gonna go back into a joe topic we're gonna do joe book club i was just curious what you guys thought of the new marvel overwatch thing that got announced today you know oh. what i saw the trailer for that and i just imagined in their boardroom they're like they heard about team-based hero shooters and they went oh my god we have heroes who were on teams <laughs> and they shoot stuff. We should make one of these. <laughs> They're like, Jim, you're hip with the kids. You understand. Yeah. They, they, they saw Overwatch 2 was on its last leg and decided to put it out of its misery. Yeah. How do you feel oh. about this, Tyler, as a aficionado and disliker? A, aficionado of shooters, but a disliker of Overwatch. Um, this will... Uh, I, I wanted to play this because it has Marvel heroes. I know it looks badass. I just want to play as and Iron Man and fight. That's it. that's my justification for this is the Overwatch killer. Yep, <laughs> no, I mean, you're not wrong. I there's also like a part of me that's like I want to go and I want to play. I want to play as like Magic and I want to do like play as Hulk and it's everything. Cool. Like, it's cool because it's not just guns. It's superpowers. Yeah, so it's, like, it's gonna like feel a little team different. Team up mechanic too, yeah. where they have like Rocket jump on Groot and they now have like an ult that they do. Together. That'll be tricky also, to balance. Also, it's not gonna be like a big competitive game because most games like most pvp games that china puts out they don't really think are gonna hit like uh, big china esports game. audiences yes yeah, right that ease and i think well, also, which you means to accept that like if you're doing marvel you're gonna attract a huge audience yeah. and a huge audience means more casuals which means you kind of have to make it accessible yeah which means that it's every character that they gonna that they're gonna like release is probably gonna be the strongest character in the game a B, each character they put out is going to be more fun than the last character uh, they made in the game because it doesn't have to be balanced. They want the newest character to be the, the strongest. The Pokemon Unite approach of just fuck exactly. it, we ball. Exactly. <laughs> for better fuck or for it. worse, we ball. Fuck it, they ball. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll, I will check this out. Uh, I'm sure we can gather up a crew and, and give this a go. I will say I, some of we... the animations look yeah. slow and sluggish. Um, that's yeah, my one they're thing. primarily like a mobile company, so I... Do they renounce consoles or like if it's a free to play game or anything like that? The visuals looked a little too good for phones. It's probably a mobile game. It's yeah. It's probably a mobile game and a console and a PC game, at least. Okay. Yeah. Um Okay, neat. Uh there's gonna be a follow up question, but fuck it. Uh, <laughs> It'll come back around. Let's move on to Joe's book club featuring Joe. Oh yes. Boyd. You were going ham, dude. Oh, yeah. All right, so three books. I, Who the fuck? Who is this guy? Me. So I read all three of these are sci-fi books. Uh, okay. Not really my intention. It was more of like a flip of a coin. Um, really, Eisenhorn Xenos is a sci-fi book. I'm shocked. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna that. start with that. Uh, so Eisenhorn Xenos is a uh, novel by Dan Abnett. It is. Based in the four, Warhammer 40,000 uh, universe, Dan Abnett is a really well-renowned author within uh, the Warhammer like sphere, like 
he usually is the one where like hey we're doing this huge event in warhammer um we need someone to write it dan's the person that's going to write it he's like the guy that like makes the big like blockbuster kind of like uh books or lore drops or or things like that and they're usually like really good and um his eyes in horn series is kind of the thing that puts him on the map and is the really well beloved and people highly regard the series they say it's one of the best series in the 4k universe and it's a really good series in general uh, i did not like this book at Oof. all uh <laughs> it's um it does all the things in sci-fi that i just really don't like which is uh, it keeps it, it makes things very obtuse. It doesn't really tell you what the hell is going on. Uh, they it, the other thing about Warhammer books is that they kind of assume you already have an idea of what Warhammer is, so they don't really go into detail as like why things the way they are. You just have to like listen to people talk in like gothic esque languages and describe a button in three sentences, or like instead of coding a program, they have to pray pray to the machine spirit. So, like, you really don't know what the hell is going on if you're not aware of the scenario of, like, the, uh, uh, the setting. Um, I just, I also didn't really find it really gripping either. And it, part of it just happens to be, like, Eisenhorn, the character, is incredibly full of himself. And it, it, it has that gothic overtone of, like, I drew my sword and I did a flourish and everyone went whoa and my black cloak floated in the background his blood like blooded like bloodily yes his, his boobs uh, boob boobily <laughs> like he it's also very it can be second person too where he directly refers to you as like i want you to know this about me reader that i was the one that stood between destruction and humanity He's it so was cool. me like yeah <laughs> He's just like me. Which, it, which, which is kind of funny, but it's it's also one of those things where it's like, this is a series I've kind of been putting off, and I hear it's been really good, and I was just like, ah, oh, I'm very disappointed. Also, uh, the book is called Eisenhorn Xenos, which refers to the three inquisitorial sections within uh, the Imperium of Man. Basically, they're they're basically like this like CIA, FBI, like Nazi Secret Service, uh, more like... Uh, Xenos is the people that deal with um, affairs that have to deal with aliens and alien like threats within the Empire. Uh, Hereticus deals with demons and demon influences and heretics within the Empire, and Malleus deals with like internal threats and just like corruption in general within the Empire. In the book Eisenhorse Xenos, there's not a, a single fucking alien in the book, uh, which is just baffling to me. Um, so it's just like, why why are we here? Uh, but anyways, I, I just really didn't really enjoy it. Uh, I'm sure that's a lot of 40k people would be like shocked or very upset and tell me like you don't understand it's a trilogy. You have to like experience his whole uh, arc. I'm like, nah, no, I don't. That's like, but anyways, make the first book good. This is a three yeah. body problem problem, yeah. perhaps. It, yeah, it, it was nice that it was a nine hour book so like it, it split up my two long books that i just finished reading um which was really nice so uh but i also read uh, leviathan wakes which is a which is the first book of the expanse series i don't know if any of y'all have heard oh i before. have heard of that series have you seen read or done anything about it no i've just, I've just heard it's a really good like, okay. series i'm I gonna, like i'm gonna call off that and say like i think you would really love this series and if you don't want any spoilers, you should just stop listening right now. Okay, cool. I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna go pee while you talk, because th this is a, it, this is kind of up there with some other yeah. series where it's always been yeah. like, a, I would definitely I, like this. I highly recommend this to you. 100%. 110%. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go pee. Tell me when to come back. Okay. So, uh, The Expanse takes place in our solar system. Uh, it takes place several hundred years in the future. Um, and so, really right now, the solar system is divided up into like three factions. You have the inner planets, which are Earth and Mars, um, and kind of like they're the big players within the inner planets. They're like, you know, they're like the big, like the United States and like the European Union, essentially. That's the best way to describe them. Um, and they're, they have the most population within the system. However, Mars doesn't have any like natural water reserves, so they need water from somewhere and earth can't just like funnel water in like a pot and like a fucking straw to their planet, which is where it comes in 
uh, the Belters, which are people that live on the asteroid belt of the solar system and harvest the ice that like is found on the rocks or just comes and drifts through space. And they harvest that uh, water and deliver it to Mars, as well as harvesting the, harvesting the minerals off of asteroids and you, delivering them to Earth for um, for construction purposes, military purposes, scientific purposes. They're kind of like they're the, the miners and they're a middle class kind of uh, part of this society. And then the, finally, there is the Outer Planets Alliance, which is this weird faction of, like, terrorists, but also revolutionaries, and maybe its own government, but maybe also not its own government. It's very wild, wild west. People are just out there, and they're kind of just doing whatever the fuck they want. Um, and so we're in this weird balance of, like, the, OAP, the OPA wants to not be aligned with the inner planets and wants to be sustainable on its own, while the inner planets are trying to get back any like moons and other other things that's in the outer planets like in jupiter uranus and pluto and all that stuff like they want to expand and grow humanity uh but also maintain control of it and the opa does not want that and the belters are kind of in the middle of it of like we're the ones that provide water to the opa and to mars and so but at the same time we're all working class people aren't getting abused in the middle of this and we don't have the ability to like maintain a strong military because we don't have big planets we don't have space we just all live on these asteroids and space stations so it's a fragile alliance that is like kind of uh being maintained uh we have two main characters in this book and we have a perspective shift through this book one of them being james holden who is the cap not the captain the the executive officer of a water mining vessel called the canterbury and the and Detective Miller, who is a fucking detective that lives in the asteroid belt as a belter in the series station. And it's pretty generic sci-fi, if I'm being honest. It's it's very well done. Mm. Uh, it's got some good intrigue to it. Like, the kickoff point is uh, Holden finds this, uh, uh, like, derelict spaceship, and it's sending out this broadcast signal. And while he's out there his spaceship that he's on originally gets blown up, like it gets nuked. So him and like the five other people that came with him have to escape and run away from the people that are trying to kill him because they found something out that they're not really sure of. Um, meanwhile, Holden is investigating the disappearance of this girl named Julie Mao, who was on this derelict spaceship. That was the last, her last known like position was on the spaceship that was just floating in space. And so he's trying to like connect the pieces as to what the hell is going on here. And for the first 10 hours, it's just kind of like generic sci-fi. We're just really introducing ourselves to the world. And it's very, like, scientific. Like, belters, people that are born in space, can't go to Earth because their bone structure is completely different because of the gravity there. If they go to Earth, the gravity is so intense that it might crush and kill them. So they have just have a bunch of, like, complications and problems that they it's just not worth them going to Earth. Uh, which is its own like political thing and kind of ethical thing as well as like are they technically human because they didn't come from earth or mars like do they do you really count them as people kind of a thing um and it's pretty generic uh, i would say it's and like they do a lot of stuff where like whenever you get like go in space like things take a lot very long time like if you want to fly to a planet it takes days not hours stuff like that and i was just like okay this is this is fine it's it's a bit long for a very genetic sci-fi yeah, like it's a 20 hour book and then at the 10 hour mark the book changes hmm. it stops being generic sci-fi it becomes arkham horror <laughs> <laughs> it becomes fucking mm. incredible like there's joke the, off it yeah, they come into contact with this, like, very eldritch alien thing oh, that this... has been, like, that has been used by scientists and is being used for scientific experiments. There's a little bit of Resident Evil spice in there because there's a corporation that's making, like, biological warfare stuff with this alien thing. Like, we're not even really sure what it is at this point. I'm two books in. And so the book it just goes off the fucking rails and like that first 10 hours is to really lull you into that sense of like okay this is what the future looks like okay 
what happens then when something completely different gets involved in this idea of like this is what a realistic space or like futuristic space looking setting looks like um and i just thought it was incredible it was incredibly gripping it gets to the point where like a big theme about this is like people's mental capacity to deal with the stress of like working and living in space and just being in an environment that is not where they should be um and i think that's incredibly interesting incredibly like it's a really fun thing to talk about in terms of like that i don't think a lot of sci-fi does is like you know where it's like i'm a human being that's born on earth my body was developed to be on earth but i'm living in space and that's changing how i function and i have to adapt to that um and like what does that mean am i actually like a human being because i am out here and my body is changing kind of a situation um it deals a lot with humanity and like what it means to be a person and like just like the ethical dilemmas of leadership that i really really enjoyed um i oh, they take oh, james holden one of the main characters i was really put off at the beginning like his opening dialogue is him trying to like convince the girl he's been sleeping with to be his girlfriend he's like please babe i i love you so much and she's like my guy i have six months left on my contract and then i'm going home i need you to stop um so but like i just thought like the last half of that book was just absolutely incredible uh and did a great job of just like bringing out this eldritch and body horror and really kind of like shifting expectations of what you think an alien species would be and what it's trying to accomplish um I liked it so much that, like, immediately afterwards, I picked up uh, Caliban's War, which is its second book, um, which is also a 20-hour book for Audible format, and I listened to the entirety of that in about a week and a half to two weeks. Um, the bro's cooking. And I, yeah, and that second book is, like, I, I think the first book was had a really slow start and was just kind of it dragged a lot. It was just like, all right, I'm going on a walk. I'll listen a little bit more to this book and see if anything else comes up. It wasn't until like the halfway point when I started to get really invested. The second book starts off with a bang and just keeps going and keeps writing and just keeps on just like it does not stop. It's it's so fun. It's got some great humor to it. It's got some great body horror to it as well. Um, but I just highly recommend that series to Bradley, uh, even though he's not here right now, I think. Um, but I just really, 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 really like that book. I'm going to send him an alert to get back. That seems Bradley style book yeah. is what I was going to say. It's, with the, it's, with the I don't want to... I don't want to go into it because it is a long book and there's a lot into it. But like, I think all the characters have great chemistry and especially in the, the second book, we jump from two perspectives to four perspectives and the author is able to develop all four of these characters individually away from each other and then brings them in and naturally have them all have this great chemistry with each other. And it feels organic and it feels very exciting when you see these a return and as you do so joe's voice and joe likes, disappears into the I, I stole his uh, i stole his life energy he's, he's gone jim no he's actually dead <laughs> i guess shit this is no joke he's <laughs> that's so random it, it, like it, he was mostly fine until you popped in uh but yeah he he develops his characters individually and then he's just able to naturally bring them together and they all just have great natural chemistry. And it doesn't feel like forced chemistry. It feels like this is what this character would say when they finally met this character or when they're in this situation with this character. Like he does a great job of juggling all of these uh, different individuals. Like one of the individuals is an old Indian woman who is like this fucking hard ass political uh, lady. And, but she has this really soft spot for kids and like, has a potty mouth and like she is completely different than like the main crew and she finally gets caught up and like meets up with them and you're like oh this is how this would turn out and that makes total sense and this is how they all get along and everything um but i think it's just a master class of like right individual characters i think the one weakness of this series though so far is that the villains have been very one note and flat um they've been very much mustache twirler twirling kind of villains um but I think the rest of the characters and what they have to go through and their struggles more than makes up for that. 
uh, in be general. like that sometimes. Man, sometimes the are there for themes. Yeah, Joe makes me feel less bad about my my fantasy series and their villains and lack thereof. Yeah, um, I, there's also a TV series uh, for this book series, The Expanse. It was on Sci-Fi and then you got. Oh, okay. that's what you're talking. Oh shit! So you know I've, what? Yeah. I've heard. I've seen Expanse parts before. of The Expanse. Yeah. yeah. Um, I watched the first episode. It's one of those things where, like, I have such a strong imagery of, like, what people look like in my head and what everything else looks like that it's really hard for me to watch that TV show. Um, I might pick it up and try watching it again, but I don't know. Like, I have such a strong, like, idea of, like, this is what the Rosinate looks like. This is what Holden looks like. This is what Miller looks like. This is what Naomi looks like. <laughs> you're you're just of- you're just naming yeah. One Piece characters. I know. I am. Uh, man, talk about One Piece crew. Oh, my... So in the second book, um, one of the characters is Bobby, who is this big, strong, like, marine woman. And um, she has a whole arc of PTSD and everything. But she finally meets up with Holden. And in their first conversation with each other, it's, like, from Holden's perspective. And the first minute and a half is just, like, Holden tried to converse, concentrate on the conversation being had. However, Holden had was really trying to control his hoardiness because man does he like Polynesian woman and this lady was doing everything for him right this moment. Uh <laughs> it's just so it's just Bro's got it, taste. And and she, the lady stops talking and he goes like, I'm sorry ma'am, I have a girlfriend that I really love, but thank you for helping me out and, and then gets up and leaves. Uh <laughs> but yeah I uh, I really recommend the series to you Bradley. I think you would really really like it a lot yeah no Any, anytime i'm in like book circles or sci-fi yeah. circle, circles on the internet and i see I, I see some idea i'm like oh my god that's so cool mm-hmm. someone's like oh my god this is like a thing in the I, expanse oh my god i just i just think that like d- just don't go look up anything about it and just kind of go into it blind um i was only i only picked it up because a friend of ours on discord mentioned something about the series i'm like that sounds interesting and it let me like uh read it let me like knowing that i'm gonna to get to a certain point that was really cool uh but yeah that's that's the expanse first two books i'll probably keep reading the rest of them there's eight of them in the series and they're all like 500 pages long which is crazy um so i will probably be reading and listening to them later but a lot shorter discussions for them but yeah chunky you're not joe you're not done joe oh wait that's what caliban's war is caliban's war it, is it's part of it yeah did it. yeah yeah all right uh I have a question for Bradley. Uh, yes. What's going on with the newest Wildbow series? We haven't talked about our boy, the staple of the early days of this podcast. And then oh, yes. neither of us got into, uh, what's it called? Crap? Pale. Uh, yeah, Pale. <laughs> I just, pale. that's the Crap. thing. There hasn't been a lot of new Wildbow news because he's, you know, been working on the same story for the past, I don't know how many years. And um, oh, it was a short story, though, I thought. Yeah, like, that's the thing, thing, right? Like yeah, we're starting the next short story. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. like the story he just started writing, Claw, which I'm about to talk about, uh, he he basically announced it with a message like, hey, this is just going to be like a short, like, while, while I get the next story ready, this is like, you know, a little experiment I'm doing, which is exactly what he said before starting his last story, which ended up being his longest story by far, which is crazy <laughs> considering the length of the stories he already writes. How do you make a longer story than Ward accidentally? <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. Um, but I think this one might be for real, and he's doing a lot of stuff that's different than what he's normally done. Um, so for people who don't know, Wild Bill stories, uh, the titles are always four letters. Um, and you can usually tell what... Uh, I get. I think the trend based on all the things he's written so far is you can tell what universe it's in based on the first letter, like Worm and Ward share universe, Pact and Pale share universe. So C's a new letter, we get a new universe, and he's doing some cool stuff with this one. Oh. I think um, for the genre, I think he called it a crime serial. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's exactly the word, but... Yeah, that is um, the Yeah, and you know he's doing like it's different with the protagonist for example he's only ever written teenagers up to young adults like i think i think blake might be the oldest one he's had and even then i think he's like 25 tops um so here we have a uh, mom and dad couple i think they're in their late 30s which is already very different and also i think this is the only completely grounded world he's done because there's always something going on with either 
the supernatural or powers or biopunk. This is just straight up people in the world. Cops. The C in the Claw universe stands for cops. Yeah, and I gotta say, uh, if I had to have something to compare it to, it feels most similar to stuff like Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul right now, just because it is in that same world dealing with similar stuff. Like, for example, our main character, Mia, or she's the point of view, and she works very closely with her husband, Carson, um, and they are in the criminal world. They do stuff like surveillance, they do kidnappings, they do murders, they do selling people new identities, stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, they're also a very committed and loving suburban couple with two kids who they love very much. Oh. Um, hmm. That, hmm. Yeah, hmm. And I gotta say, because obviously <laughs> you want to compare it to other similar sounding stuff. And like, what are these characters' motivations for doing this world of crime? Um, and, you know, you have like your Baking Brat, Breaking Bad characters and Waltz, you know, Cancer. it's fun. You know. Cancer slash I, it's fun. Yeah, stuff like that. Or even you can compare it to like you know, Taylor and Worm, where it's not necessarily that she likes it or finds it fun, but, you know, that's, like, where she thrives. Like, whether she knows it or not, she might even be addicted to, you know, stuff like that. The, the Jimmy here, Kim route. Here, I don't necessarily know if it's that. It might be for the husband, you know, just getting a better life for our kids, but our POV, Mia, I get the sense that she's a very paranoid person, um, because so much of this life kind of bleeds into her civilian life to the point where um i think a be the best way to get a read on this main character might be this sentence that she says in the very first chapter where on their jobs she says do everything as if someone very talented very driven and very lucky is after you um but i think she takes that to heart outside of their criminal life as well if she wanted to know where her kids are she could look at a camera she set up in the park and find them. Um, their, their, their house has <laughs> lethal booby traps that the rest of her family does not know about. Um, so I, I think a part of uh, this criminal life might be, you know, they don't feel safe unless they are surveilling and have lethal threats against literally everybody who could ever hurt them in their entire life. Um, but it's fascinating to me. Uh, and to kind of give some like excitement, the first chapter is essentially someone's paying them like 20,000. They want a new ID, new life. Um, they just want to start over. And so they kind of give the full rundown, kind of like vacuum, vacuum guy in Breaking Bad. Yeah. Okay. It's like, you know, go, go here, do this, don't do this, change your hair, cover this up, never talk to anybody from your old life again, blah, blah, blah. So they give this guy the rundown and he goes to their new house that they set up for him to start his life in, which obviously she has cameras all over. And the first thing he does when going in the door is he calls his ex-girlfriend and he's like, don't worry, I'm, 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 I'm okay and I'm staying here and I'm going to come get you and you're going to come live with me. And then they look at each other and like, ah, well, we, we have to kill this guy. Uh, oh. So, <laughs> oh. uh, so that's, the, that's chapter one and I, it's, it's pretty exciting and I like that he's doing something different and I hope he sticks to his like, I'm going to keep it shorter because it, it would be nice if he kind of had just like a, two to three hundred page standard novel that he could pump out to the general yeah. public. You know? God, I would kill for that, bro. <laughs> I want to I wanna oh talk about more Wild Bow works, but if I'm not enjoying Pale, I have to go through four plus arcs of a, like maybe it'll click later kind of thing. Yeah, so so far so good on this one. We'll uh, we'll see if he eventually does his thing and turns it into a, uh, a titan of a series. Yeah, it's called Claw. Yeah, Claw. Interesting. So is this finally where Joe jumps in the wild bow train? No, I was just I was just curious like what to, what he was calling it. Do you think there's any supernatural stuff to it or I I might have not nah. explicitly I think, not. Okay. I think I think that's I think he's really going for something different this time. But uh I like how different it is and you get the benefits of just him being a better writer over his old stuff. Like the family feels so yeah. organic. Uh even just hearing like the little prose paragraphs of them interacting i'm like okay this is a much more experienced author is there the money question is there an audiobook project yet or if there's uh, not there's definitely gonna be soon because okay. uh oh. I, I mean i feel like uh his past few works um they've tried to get an audiobook project going along so that way people can follow it so we'll see how quickly people it's, do it on this tough one. because I, you, beggars cannot be choosers in this sense, I know. right? But um, 
the pale audiobook project was not doing it for me not that good um but then you have the packed audiobook project which i was like i love this man speed chuck oh my god Nunchuck, he's so quality goat. i yeah he like he killed it so um, hopefully we get something so like that i hope it's a a quality one because i'd like to get back on the wagon there's always ward mm -hmm. and twig that i could jump onto as well but but uh next down, time we convene Anyways. Next time we convene, I imagine arc one will be done, so we'll be able to get a more, uh, probably a better view of what we have in store. Yeah, I want to see told... if uh, if you like arc one or two. Yeah. I told Bradley that uh, it sounds like he may be trying to get this one published, which would be cool. really... I wouldn't be surprised. It would be a cool step for him as an author to get his other works published. Oh, that would be really cool. I, I would love that. I would love more recognition... I would love adaptations, but I think he's a, he's a stickler for that. So he I really can't, is. Can't hold can't hold on to that. But all right, uh, we have something of a movie block here. Um, Ooh, baby. We got a couple. I have two movies. Uh, that one that I watched both of these with Tyler, and then there's a third movie that we both watched separately, and then there's a movie that me and Joe watched. So we'll mm -hmm. jump on in that order. So. Uh, Tyler and I watched uh, in a in a movie night two movies. One's called Vivarium. One's called Perfect Blue. Uh, Tyler, you want to talk about Vivarium? Uh <laughs> so, I put that on there. I had already seen this movie. What? And and forgotten about it <gasps> because it was that insignificant. No, I can't believe that, you did when, that to when, yourself, it was why. so insignificant. That whenever Willer put Vivarium on the to talk <laughs> list, I said, "What is Vivarium?" He's watched it twice. <laughs> um, some guy said, "What if we made a metaphor, uh, for a movie about the cuckoo bird?" And then they did. That's that. It's it's yeah. and it's not just the cuckoo bird. It's also a metaphor for suburban nope. life. Nope. Nope. It is literally just about the cuckoo bird. <laughs> It, my interpretation is that it's a hunt. It is definitely about the cuckoo bird, but it is also yeah. very much about suburban life. Um, yeah, I think your interpretation might be too deep, dog. I don't think it's that deep. It's it's about uh, two people who want to get a house together. They live in Britain, um, and what they do is they go to this agency, and there's this weird guy, and it's like we're sitting there watching it. And we go, well, this guy is very weird. This guy's an alien, right? Um, and it's like, yeah, obviously. So Actually, this guy yes. bring, Yeah. So this guy takes him to a neighborhood and he leaves them there. And it gets to a point where they try to escape the neighborhood and they just keep ending back at the house he left them at. And they can't escape. And they stay the night there. And they keep trying to escape. They and uh for, yeah they can't get out they they're, they're stuck in a dimension their way out. yeah like i don't know there's no explanation for it and then they get this box that says raise the baby and we set you free i think i've seen clips of this probably it's got jesse eisenberg You're... as the main character mm. yeah um anyway they end up raising the baby and it's like a concept for cuckoo birds where the baby's gonna end up killing them and it's like not really their child but there's some psychological, uh, what's it called when you start to like your captors, sort of thing go on. It's a uh, Stockholm syndrome. Stockholm syndrome, but like the yeah. Moment, like yeah, it, yeah. But it ends up being like 45 to 50 minutes of eating cereal and Jesse <laughs> Eisenberg digging, digging a, a hole. hole. Like that is half the movie is eating breakfast and Jesse Eisenberg digging a hole. Um, and then it's it sucks because. Like, in the last ten minutes of the movie... Cool stuff happens. They start, like, jumping underneath the road curves. Like... And, like, sliding through dimensions. This, I'm and just gonna like, spoil the movie. You guys should not watch this. At this point of the movie, <coughs> yeah. the kid is a grown-up. And okay. the chance to kill him that they would have had earlier, they missed it. So now he can overpower them. He's a grown-up. Um, the kid's very much an alien. In an earlier scene, we saw some really creepy shit with him. Um... The wife, like, sneaks... The kid now doesn't let the, the parents back in the house, so they're living in the car. Uh, Jesse Eisenberg has died of exposure. Jesus. And uh, the kid goes to work. We don't know what he does for work. He just, I think he's getting alien training. 
Yeah, he's, he's getting alien he, he's training. Gonna, he's being trained to replace the dude at the store. Uh, we only find out at the end. The wife goes behind him and hits him with a shovel. And then he, like, screeches and starts walking all four and picks up the curb, raises it. Like, it's like, it's like... Like he's Bugs Bunny or something? Yeah, like he, like he, yeah. Like, yeah, he Bugs Bunny the curb and goes into a, like, underground apartment complex where we see other families going through this experiment. Very cool, surreal stuff that happens, like, after a lot of cereal eating, like Tyler said. I feel like I could like it just for the surreal stuff. (sighs) I wish. This is a, I wish. <laughs> I found out. I found out that this is a fairly well liked movie. People like the feeling of claustrophobia. Um, it just did not hit for me. Uh, I gave this a two, um, and that might even be a Damn. little generous. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it is a lot it. of Jesse Eisenberg digging a hole. It's too much digging holes. Not gonna. Lie. Damn! I just looked it up on Google, and the bar for one star reviews is way bigger than the other bars. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I should, I'm almost in that camp. Um, I like the idea, not the execution. Um, then we watched an anime classic. We actually watched this first, um, called Perfect Blue. Uh, this is a very well-known movie, um, about a pop idol who quits the idol industry and then tries to pursue an acting career and it is a psychological experience of the self. It explores what a persona is um, to the outside world and how that can take a life of its own. Uh, I will not go as into this, but Tyler, if you want to talk a little bit. You, I'll... Uh, it's animated really well, but it's like that classic 80s, 90s anime trope where there's some cultural difference that I don't understand about the spirit. Um, that makes the movie kind of go, yeah, I watched a movie. At the end, um, it's interesting. It's a good psychological thriller, but I think they did, like, three too many Inceptions in it. Um, makes it a little bit hard to track what kind of goes on throughout the middle part. For of the sure. Movie. In fact, I need, definitely... a, I need to watch analysis to be like, did I understand this right kind of movie? I, this is a movie that I wouldn't steer people away from. <laughs> what what glowing praise let me give some glowing praise i fucking was floored by the there was a moment in the middle where like a lot of the themes clicked for me and i was just so glad that we picked this as a watch i gave this a hard five um i because the one problem is we watched it dubbed and i think that was a mistake I think the dub. Uh, the is, dub was fine. It was not fine, dude. It was fine. It was y'all, y'all mm-hmm. have y'all are way too bicky when it comes to your dubs. No, I'm you not. Have, I watch literally every anime. I'm gonna your, talk your, about your villain bar saga. is way too high. I'm the guy who says watch Attack on Titan dubbed. Watch uh, Demon Slayer. You dubbed, only watch watched Jujutsu it with. Dubbed. You only watched it with me. Attack on Titan dubbed. After we had gotten through like a season, and you're like, "All right, I can ignore it now." That's not even. That is not even true, brother. Maybe uh, that was me. How does that? How does that disqualify all the other anime I watched dubbed? I like a good dub. This is not one. And like the main character in particular, I would connect with her a lot more if I had watched the sub. So I had to like put that out of my mind and just look at the writing as it is and realize that I very much enjoyed it for that. It's an 80s, 90s dub, so understand yeah. that, too. Yeah, well, that's that's what I was trying to avoid. Uh, I, think that's the thing. I, feel, I feel like if I watch this, I'll probably watch it subbed, but um, I definitely recognize this, and I realize I recognize it because um, Super Eye Patch Wolf did a video on yeah. it, which I didn't watch, but I was like, I should watch it, and I'm looking at... I'm just, I'm just looking on Google Images, and I'm going to stop, because I'm like, some of these frames just look like they have so much emotion in them, and I'm uh, like, I feel like I'd like this. I think uh, a minute into the movie... Uh, Tommy said it best. He's like, oh, guys, this has so much sauce already. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) No, I think you would like it, Bradley. I think Joe would really like it. Let's fucking go. That's my uh, recommendation. Good Joe movie. And uh, we'll jump on to the other movie me and Tyler watched. This one separately was Green Book. Uh, what caused you... This is a very non-Tyler movie to watch, which is why I was like, okay. I don't, I don't know why you say... Anyway, I saw a it's, clip it's part a drama. of this movie. I don't know. So this is a movie about... Uh, it's set in the 60s? 
Yes, late 60s. Loosely based on a true story. Uh, well, it's not loosely based. It is based on a true story. I, I found out some parts that are loose, but... Obviously, it has yeah. to be entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Um, about a pianist in the 60s um, during the probably the civil rights movement. Um, JFK hires, is already a thing. A, yeah. Hires an Italian uh, bouncer to drive him on his tour across the country. And when we say Italian, we're talking gabagool. We're talking like the most gabagool. Italian motherfucker you've ever seen. Yeah, like... They, they set the precedent for this Italian guy because he goes to, like, a bar and makes a bet with a guy that he can eat more hot dogs than him. Uh, that and, scene like, was so charming, though. It is. <laughs> Where she's like, like, did you just lose $50? And, like, and he's like, A26. And then she oh, yeah, Velma's in it, well. which is great. She's the wife. God, she's hot. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's a movie about racism. It's a movie about uh, understanding, and it's like, uh, about the battles that the the doctor is going through. His name's uh, what's the doctor's name? Doctor Shirley, who is a very Doctor Shirley. eccentric person. He is uh, a black man who trained in classical music growing up. Uh, so he goes and plays like a tour through the South, uh, and he needs an Italian big bodyguard to help him along the way, and he gets like that name recommended to him. So. Like, it's a, it's a, it's, it's like a weird, it's not weird. It's a very charming story. It's, I would say like a Disney personified example of some, uh, of what are they called? Moonlight towns, sunlight towns, uh, uh, sundown towns, sundown towns in the sixties. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a very light-hearted tale about a, a serious subject, but I don't think it is intended to make the entire movie about that as it is about the relationship between the two main characters. We, that's exactly that's a good jumping off point because then I found out, oh, the internet hates this movie. Why why do they hate this movie? Uh they think it goes like too light on the racism and that like like, they do stuff where, like, apparently the Dr. Shirley was not estranged from his family, but I thought that was a great decision for the movie itself because a uh, key defining thing that makes Dr. Shirley a very nuanced character is that he's very lonely. Um, in his path to becoming a musician, he's ostracized both his family but also his culture. And then people yeah. are like, oh, but then it becomes a white savior movie where the white guy has to teach the black guy how to be more black. Well, it's like... In a sense, yes, but also the white guy is causing most of the problems, and the black guy is the one that's having to save him in well, very also, subtle ways. Also, it's like it's an Italian American in yeah. the '60s too. Like he's, which is a cool because there's also a level of discrimination that he has to face, um, especially as he's both by traveling in the South, but also by having to deal with high class America. Uh, yeah, both, because both places where he's like but, not necessarily welcome. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting contrast to see two people who are unwelcome into these places that yeah, they're going for different reasons. And like Tyler said, what what I ended up like I ended up loving this. It was such a feel good movie because of the characters' dynamic and their relationship and how it grows throughout the movie. Um, it's very satisfying. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. And like, yeah, this is like a, a very high score for me, and I really loved it. And I, I get like. Maybe it's a little too optimistic or a little bit too light in some ways. Um, but when it comes down to the actual writing, the directing, the acting, um, yeah, it's it's really good. I thought this was super fun. Yeah, I, I saw it in a clip and I was immediately like, you know what? It's a slow day at work. I want to watch this movie right now. And I did. And I really enjoyed it. That uh, that ending had me big cheese and big smiles on my face. Very, very good movie. Would recommend. Would. Except if you hate the concept of the movie, I don't know. Which people will find a way. <laughs> if there's a will, there's a way. As I was watching the movie, I was like, people probably don't like this movie because of how lightly it's treating the racism. And Not gonna lie, like based on like I haven't seen anything on, but I saw the cover and the name. I was just like, this has got to be some like racial like, uh, well movie the the, the green or something. the green yeah. book was. 
like a guidebook to sundown towns in the 60s. It's basically gotcha. where can you go stay where a black person is allowed. The thing mm. is, the movie does not sure like there's not shy away from the fact that there's racism. Like you're not gonna watch the guy get lynched, but he gets beaten up. You he gets yeah. discriminated. He plays at houses where they don't let him go to the bathroom when he's the main attraction of that night as, as they go deeper and deeper in the South. So, like, while it's not, like, fully about racism, like, it's not a Black Klansman or, like, uh, other movies, like, mm-hmm. that are, like, really about that. It's written by a white guy, even. So, like, that's a knock against oh. them if you want to go that way. But it's not also yeah. shying away from the racism at all. It's just, like, not making it the whole point, which... I yeah. really like the characters' relationship, so we didn't need to do that, in, in my opinion. Joe. Maybe I'm racist for liking a movie about racism written by a white guy. Well, Tyler, if you're <laughs> racist, then I'm racist too, buddy. We could just be a part yeah. of one of And we're not the same race. We, there you go. Is this not solidarity? <laughs> um, but, but, like, is it? But, like, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, can you make a racist movie without. Or a movie about that has racism as, like, one of its themes or topics without, like,. I feel like in this day and age, like you have to really like dive headfirst into it or like be really cruel with it. Sometimes Man, I don't think that's, that's the thing. That's the, I don't thing. think it necessarily needs to be cruel. Like the the in the the in unfair parts of Doctor Shirley influence his motivation for as being a person. Like it's very ingrained into the character and the writing. So like it, it's definitely not something they shy away. They just don't get like really graphic or particularly pessimistic about mm-hmm. it because they would rather highlight this one beautiful thing that's happening between the character's friendship instead so i think yeah. that's fair it's despite the raises racism this is able to flourish. exactly that's that was my takeaway so this is just one of many racist podcasts in the internet cool <laughs> i i will this has been on my list because it has vigo morrison in it and i as a big lord of the rings fan he was uh, great in this. In fact, yeah. a small nitpick, he's maybe too Italian. Maybe there's my racist <laughs> point. He's he's like a cartoon character at points, but damn, he's charming. Yeah, um, I uh, so it's it's definitely on there. It's just heavy. But now that I know that it's not nearly as like it feels much more lighthearted than I thought like tragic or dramatic, it's probably gonna go higher in like my want to watch it at this and, point. And there are ten scenes where it's like, oh, I yeah. hope they get out of this all right. And like sometimes they yeah. don't, but it's okay. Like it's not gonna be anything super heavy. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. Cool. All right. Uh and then Joe, the two yes. of us separately, watch Dune Part separately. Two. I wanna know your opinions about Dune because I've read the book and I really, really like the so. book Dune. But I want to I want to know your opinions. As you may recall, I like Dune Part One, but it was more like a vibes, yeah, uh, cinematography yeah. kind I, of like. Like the story was you, uh, was good. You and I, you and I had like I think the same thought of like the it was really pretty to look at. It was very cool, but immersive. like at the same time, like yeah, very immersive. But like at the same time, it's like and I rewatched Dune Part One before I watched Dune Part Two. It, it feels like understand like where it's going right mm-hmm. like it, you're just like okay i guess that stuff happened but i'm not really sure the importance of it <laughs> yeah right. stuff happened and it was pretty and cool and i was immersed yeah. but like it, yeah. i probably wouldn't like it's like a 3.5 or a 4 for me uh before yeah. we watch this one we watched an hour uh-huh. recap of dune one and everything that was missing from the book um yeah. that was a very good recap because he got us a lot more invested in the world cool yeah and the characters. I even yeah. came in like halfway through the recap and I was already like, okay, cool. The Jenna Bezerit, whatever. Yeah, cool. Yes. Cool. Very uh, important. It's very, like... <laughs> very important. Yeah. To get reminded of that. Going yeah. into Dune 2, wow. That movie fucking yeah. rules. <laughs> like, I it's, don't know what happened. Uh, they just sprinkled the sauce all over uh, this one. I, saying, I, I didn't know if, like, because obviously Dune is such a huge thing, yeah. but I, I I don't know anything about Dune, and I didn't know if these movies were considered good adaptations or bad adaptations. Uh, after the second one, I think they are fucking incredible. I was um, floored. <laughs> I, I I it's definitely a package of like if you're if you're going to watch them, you need to watch one and two. Um, I I think like just watching one is a disservice. Like you really need to watch both of them. But like the second one, really. Rot that movie flew by, game. dude. Like I, I oh, was yeah. so engrossed. Like I, I, I don't think I've been that immersed. Yeah. In a especially like a sci-fi movie, in mm-hmm. maybe ever. Like I was just in there in that desert with them. I don't even know, man. The, it transported the one, me to another world. Yeah, literally. <laughs> uh, 
uh, one of the first shots that happened that made me go like, oh, yes, we're feeling it is it's the very beginning and it's the Harkonnen like troopers. I think they're Harkonnen. They might be Sadakar. Troopers are on the sand. They're like, oh, God, sandworms coming. And they start going up the mountain and they look like fish swimming up over the side of a like coral kind of like reef kind of mm. a thing. And I was just like, ooh, I was just really vibing. Yes. Um, What's crazy is like the it, movie finished and I was like so engrossed. I was like, I couldn't yeah. tell you the sequence of events in that movie. It was a very weird feeling where I was like, mm -hmm. it was just a vibe that was in my mind of like, I loved like pretty much every moment of that movie. Um, yeah. I, uh, I love the, the more I think about Dune, the book, the more it like that the further it has climbed up my like ranks of books it's in like my top five now i think wow. at this point i that book to me is it does everything that sci-fi book should do and i think people do not understand like like it, 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 it this this is like one of like the og sci-fi books that really kind of like made everything take off um but like there's a lot of like small nuanced stuff in its world building and its purposeness that like that i think a lot of people miss um and like i think the first book is absolutely incredible um what did you think about timothy chamelay and paul um in the first movie you know fine yeah fine for his role whatever in the second movie particularly in the second half like the reason yeah. why they picked timothy charlemagne comes to like fruition I yes think. um yeah particularly when he uses the conqueror hockey um, yes the voice <laughs> yes the, the, the conquer hockey scenes are so good and mm -hmm. like i don't want to spoil the movie or anything but it's interesting when he doesn't use it like mm -hmm. it's not used on the most important peoples that it should be used because it's not about that there's the vibe of that i right. got it's like yeah he needs to be able to take control of this like political situation by his own merit without using mm -hmm. the voice so now, when he uses it sparingly, it's very effective. So the one thing that we brought up in our original like discussion that I thought was really lacking in the first movie, but is is the center of attention in this movie that I love is Paul's inner struggle of who he is. Yes. Right? Of him being Paul and him being the Kizak Hederak. Which is the, this is a story about a chosen one Messiah figure that is kind of talked right. about throughout the galaxy or like the well, universe or whatever by a particular clan yeah it, it saying it's talked about is not is is that an understatement I, I wouldn't say an overstatement but i would actually it's undercutting the politicalness of what that story is because it's not a natural story it's something that's been planted yes. and has been cultivated. And I think that is so fucking like interesting the to me. The cultivation of the Jenny Bezeret of that oh, yeah. of, of that myth is so fascinating. Yeah. Like the, the way yes. the book tackles how a religion is formed in the like mm -hmm. the most basic like way to put it is very interesting. Yeah, it's 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 it was the part of the book I'm mean, like, oh, Frank Herbert is cooking and he's cooking so hot, the only place you can cook is Dune itself. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's in like, I it like that second, that second movie, it made me go like, okay, I'm so glad there's Villeneuve, like Dennis, whatever his last name Vel is. Like, Villeneuve? He really, Villeneuve, he like, he figured it out. Um, the one thing though, is I really wish Princess, the princess was in the first movie as a narrator, yeah. because she's in the entirety of the book. Um, and I don't, and you don't know this, Willer, but like at the beginning of every chapter, you have a segment of her diary before oh. each chapter. This is so um, have, yeah. Florence Pugh's character. Florence Pugh. Yes, she has a very minor role, but I think she does very well. And like because she's like this like character that is in that political world, but has no power and no control over it. And but she's the one that can see what's happening essentially. Um, and she's and she's kind of like the she's kind of weirdly the the layman to understanding of like what's going on i think and how they kind of like mean to like the higher ups of this world mm. um man the scene on the harkonian planet Woo! was fucking awesome fire <laughs> it was like, banger alert <laughs> willard did you know that yeah. entire scene was filmed in a uv camera what does that what does that mean like like it like it it 
it only tracks UV light. Like ultraviolet light. But that, so what, okay. So what does that mean when they were filming it? What did it look it's like? Not, it, it's like they had to do some like makeup effects to like get that. It's not been on a real, like a normal care camera. It's like a camera that you use to like judge the radiation or like effects of like the sun in like an area. But it's filmed in a normal like light, like natural lighting scene but yeah. then the camera gives it it's the visual effect that we saw yes yes wow that's interesting that's very it's crazy. creative that scene alone was is phenomenal oh yeah um it's and like i uh i i was just i was so blown away when i saw that, that character was, was not what i expected him to be um but he was great <laughs> he i thought he was gonna be a lot more meathead i really liked uh yes. some of the nuances with that character that last scene of him in it was awesome yeah. like really telling and really cool super good uh, um uh i'm trying to think what else there is um i was um, just gonna like paul's yeah. like turn is maybe a little fast there like a little sudden i think they kind of build up uh, to it. it's something i had to rewatch and like knowing where it goes and see how no. they handle it the thing about paul is like and this That's, is probably the, dr the, the drug like, trip knowledge. near the end like is very is like a big turning yeah. point but, like, I think the whole point being is that, like, he knows that when he goes south, there's no turning back from, like, what he has to do. Like, that's the okay. whole, like... That's him accepting so it, the, the prophecy. Yes. Okay. And, and, and the thing that I want to point out... Well, I, I don't want to say this because no. it, it, it spoils a bit. But, like, the biggest thing I want to say is that Paul Atreides loses. That's the big thing. Mm, but you're going to say that all j -j 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 -b -b wins... Yes. Okay. The Paul Muad'Dib wins, if, if that gotcha. makes sense. Yo, shout and out to Stilgard. Think... Uh, weirdly comic yeah. relief, but great character. At least I'm not the heap. <laughs> uh, I want to. Uh, the, the one thing I would. What I'll close my points off is how often yeah. does a movie come out where mm -hmm. the main character's mother is the best character? Because that's oh. how I feel <laughs> about Jessica. Jessica uh. is so my favorite character of both of these movies. She's fascinating. Yeah. God. She's and also great. Rebecca Ferguson, think... so, small crush, uh, but also like just as a character, is so good. Mm -hmm. I also really like so Chani's character in the book is very different. I heard the I the know. way that final scene plays out is is very different with Shawnee. I really like the way it ends in the movie more than the book. Yeah, it's uh, it seems more agency. It, on, it's on more agency, part. but also like the message is a lot more clear about what's happening at the end there, whereas. The, when the book, book could came trick out, uh, readers into being yeah. like, "Hey, that was great." <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, and the, that made him go, "Like, I should make a second book to really clarify the what what this means." Um, have you read yeah, book I, two and three, Joe? I've I've not. I just know what they are because I I just as someone who's in sci-fi and like it's important. I I think it's important to always like look where things are referencing and just get a general idea of like what what makes inspiration so you have an idea of like you know oh this is what like this is kind of building off of so i don't i haven't read them um but i get the gist of what they're about more or less and i know one line from book four that is very funny um that's about it uh do you but think I know we'll get this... the, that main trilogy had it adapted because i would very I much think... i'm very invested now so i want to see at least the trilogy adapted into six I think, movies. I, I think on the positive side, we'll get the second book. Okay. I don't know if we'll get the third book. I think the second book is a really good closer to Paul's story. I see. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, that that third book is when things start to really kind of like get close to that cliff edge, if you know what I mean. Our friend uh, Ryan was telling me because I watched it with him. Yeah. Uh, that somehow Duncan Idaho from the first movie is like the most important character in the, in the franchise as a whole, and I'm like, how the fuck does that work? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. That's a story for another day. Um, um. But no, I just I I was I'm, I'm very happy that you really really liked it. Yeah. Um, no, I'm I'm in there now. I'm gonna rewatch the movie at some point. I'm. On... Oh, oh, you're cutting out a little bit. Start start that again. And he's gone. And, and just like that. Yeah. So to wrap um, up Dune, uh, we, we had yeah. a technical difficulty. Uh, yeah. The second movie might get made. And... The second book. But, so, yeah. Yeah, but, I'm glad, 
But I'm glad that you really enjoyed it. I'm also glad that you understood the ending of Dune because there's a lot of people that don't understand the ending of Dune. I, I'm a Breaking um, Bad, Better Call Saul fan. I know. I know, I know I, when I, things are, are yeah, not as they seem. Because <laughs> it's, Dune, is, Dune is shockingly very sudden um, with a lot of what's going on. Uh, I, and maybe I, I'm because also... maybe it's a because everyone knows that what kind of story Dune is these days. So maybe yeah. I, I I shouldn't pat myself on the back for just like getting it from osmosis. No, it's but like it's it's just one. But like it's it's I, very easily you can misconstrue the ending of that and be like, oh wow, um, that's a great thing to happen. Or like, wow, I cannot believe they would make this kind of story kind of situation. The um, the movie helps by yeah. showing flashes of what could be. Yeah, um, I I also really like th they really showcase how um, uh, inaccurate uh, Paul can be. Yes, yes, because uh, you get those you get that those scenes. Um, I'm also going to recommend the book again. I think that book is phenomenal. No! It's one of the best books I've ever read. Um, I highly recommend it, like just to the moon. Um, but yeah, counter. Um... I was gonna say something else about, but also the ending is there are, from what I gathered, there's still positives to this. We'll see how it plays out. There, there's a little bit of positives. The regime was not good, from what I could tell. But no, but that doesn't mean the next one is as good or yes. better. Yes, that's fair. All right, uh, and then you're gonna talk about a Dune board game, I think. Because it's yeah, yes. Dune week. Welcome to the Dune About Cast. Um. But yes, uh, Dude Imperium is a game for uh, one to four players. It is a... This is also not the Dune board game. This is Dude Imperium. Uh, this is a deck building worker placement game. Um, so in it, you each are work at... You're each a faction within the Dune universe. So you could be playing as Paul Atreides. You could be playing as... Um, as Beast Rabon from the Harkonians. You can be Baron Harkonnen. Uh, you can be uh, a bunch of other side characters that weren't even in the movie or, de or like in deleted scenes. Uh, but basically, you have this board, you have a board that you are um, using to send your agents on. And so it, it, it operates just like a normal deck building game. You start with 10 cards, you use those cards to buy new cards to put in your deck that do more and stronger things and the goal of this game is to get the most victory points the game ends after someone gets 10 victory points and the round ends or 10 rounds have passed um what's interesting about this game is that when you look at your card your card is split up into two halves there is the agent half which is what you use to play and you send your agent to go out and you know do actions such as sabotage your enemy players or grow relationship with a faction, or get more troops for the oncoming battle that's going to happen at the end of the round. Um, and so that's a lot of... And so whenever you're sending an agent to go do an action, you block off the rest of your players from doing that action for the rest of the round. So you're not only, like, trying to, like, propel yourself forward, but also stopping your opponents from, like, doing things that would harm you. Um, which is just ba basic work replacement stuff. The other thing, though, is the second half of that card is the reveal half of the card. So you start with two agents in the game. After you've used your two agents in a round, you have to reveal your hand. And you get to do all the effects on the bottom half of the cards that lets you reveal. And this is the primary way you you um, purchase cards from the bank and do some other sneaky stuff. So, like, you might be holding on to, like, a card to, like, purchase more, like, expensive cards that are better. But you might be also holding on to cards that, when revealed, force your opponents to get rid of cards or force them to, like, lose troops in the battle. And so you're constantly having to debate whether or not, like, do I use this card to send this agent over here because it's the only card in my hand that has this symbol? Or am I going to hold on to it until, like, you know... Uh, until the end of the round, and hopefully this is going to let me win the victory point that you can get at the end of the round. Um, I think it's really fun. I've been really enjoying it. I have the digital version, which is on iOS and on computers, and it's really great. The problem with this game is I don't think I have a single friend that would actually enjoy playing it. Womp womp. Um, the yeah, Joker. Uh, yeah, it's I, like I I think it's really great deck building it's got some i really like worker placement games tyler fucking hates worker placement and top, top five worst games ever 
that you're so it's, wrong it's, but it's I understand. just it's it's slow rts it's turn-based uh, rts no not really but I, I understand where you're coming from but like it's it's tower it, defense that's my take yeah. <laughs> i'm just saying sure. uh yeah um but like i i it's got a lot of like good like side player interaction um i think the deck building is a little bit too like it's so hard to deck build in this game because you're essentially like what cards are good to play but also have in my hand that if i don't use them i can they're still useful and stuff like that and it's it's a very very mean game like dude like it's it's like you're constantly trying to like just block your friends and just stabbing them in the back and and stuff like that um and my friends here really do not like player interaction games either that are competitive which also upsets me a lot um <laughs> okay. yeah like they like oh my god like they any of the game that like that you could potentially play a card and be like i played this card and i kill all your dudes that's fucking sucks man that's i think gaming. it's great <laughs> I love and, that. to me it's me gaming but like to them they're like oh man you just ruined my whole strategy i'm like i think if i played one card and it ruined everything for you that's a skill issue but that what am i saying i'm winning the game i can't be right um <laughs> but yeah so like I really like this game. I have it on digital, and I think it's going to stay that way until like I can get it for cheap, um, and I have more space. But yeah, I just I've been really liking it in general. Uh, the digital version is super good. Uh, I'll probably pick up the iOS version to play on the go as well. Um, really, really addicting. Also, super fast. Like I I have played like twelve games of this and only have three hours logged in the game itself, which is kind of oh. crazy. That's, that's yeah. Maybe because it's digital and it's speeding it up. To be fair, yeah, I, it's definitely I, digital and a lot of the math is being like done. I must say, Joe, though, yeah, it's not that I'm against player interaction games. Yeah, no, no. But playing player interaction games with you, yeah, is <laughs> like playing Mario Kart with you. Oh, you know, he cooked really hard just there. I'm not gonna lie, bro. <laughs> <laughs> There's a I mean, there. There comes a point. Where the person you're playing against yeah. has played something so much, or too often, it's it's like you know how to roll the dice properly in a game of Monopoly. The way Joe uh, plays board games was if like you challenged me to a fighting game and I picked my main every time. <laughs> Joe, well, Joe, will murder you. Joe murders you. Joe murders you. I'm just imagining like people who play chess and then like someone who doesn't know how to play chess just moves their pawn forward one space and you're like, ah, you're doing the classic 1987 <laughs> maneuver. I know how to beat you. <laughs> the little bitches true. starter. I, I I I try to hold back as much as I lose a lot of board games and like if I, Joe I, knows the rules, immediate advantage. I well that's that's fair. the problem I have. That's the problem he I reads. have is that's that, too far. Yeah, I, I I do learn the rules, which is the, which is double edged sword because a it means I can get a game to the a game to the table much faster because I know the rules, I can teach it. But it's also one of those things where it's like I know how things interact and you might not you don't have a full grasp on the rules, so. I'm well aware of like what things are good to do. And what That's actually the scenario that happens most often. It's just that that, yeah. that initial you have a game yeah. plan, and then I get stomped yeah. as a result. Like, and, and, I fold to any and, game plan, and, and I try to like I try to hold back, but it, but it's it's always a give and take of like I don't want to like go too hard, but there's a point where like okay someone did a clever move, I'm just gonna start actually playing the game now, and uh, let's we can get going from there, um, but. I've really like I've really really liked this game a lot. Um, so I think it's if you're interested, it's well worth the pickup. It's only like ten dollars on iOS. It's I think twenty dollars on Steam or something like that. Really really good integration. Um, but yeah, right. uh, but it's a great Dune board game. Um, there's a, they they like a remaster of it called Dune Uprising. That would be the one to get I think. But really cool mechanics, really cool card effects. Uh, it, it's very different from what I've played. It's called an Ameritrash game, by the way. That's the official, like, term for that type of game. Um, but yeah, Doom Imperium, highly recommend, but I don't know if anyone would actually enjoy it. Brian might enjoy it, actually. Um, but that might be it. All right, I'm going to roll us over into Bradley. Yes. You watch Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender. I'm super I have, curious I've about been this. Sitting... I have been sitting on like I like I know Bradley's gonna I want to ask Bradley so many questions about the show, but I'm just gonna wait to the podcast. I've yeah. heard that they outdid M Night Shyamalan. 
Wow. Indeed. Impressive Indeed. work. <laughs> Um, I will say, like, there's 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 a lot of love and hate in this adaptation. Um, and I want to start with some of the stuff I love, because there's some stuff I think they act absolutely just knocked out of the park. Like, the sets, um, they look incredible. And, you know, because they recently had a live-action adaptation with One Piece, where I think they went way more practical, like, they physically built yeah. the sets. And even then, a lot of the, like, for example, the Fishmen, I think that's all, uh, like, practical effects. Yeah, it paid off. Uh, here's uh -huh. where they got to flex their CGI budget, and holy shit, the CGI looks so good. Oh, Mashu, my jaw was on the floor. Wow. Um, the, the, and even the bending looks badass, too. Um, and, you know, they have to make some changes, because, like, they'll have to make changes to the story, because, you know, you have this whole se season one of Avatar you're trying to condense into eight episodes, and inevitably you'll have to move stuff around like oh this character shows up in this city when originally they showed up at a different location but it's like i get it they didn't want to spend millions of dollars cgiing a new location when this character is only there for a little bit so whatever put them in this city um or like for example i think there was a i think there was like an inventor who used to be at like an air temple for for example and now he shows up in omashu and at first i'm like oh this is Wait. stupid yeah that actually is, wait, like, is he still in a wheelchair at least? Yeah, they still got wheelchair boy. Because um, his uh, son, I think, is uh, in a wheelchair and he gets to like fly around with Aang and oh, stuff. Oh, that episode. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. And so, you know, originally I think they were holed up inside of an old air temple. But here they're just at Omashu, which are characters we're stopping by anyway. So there's stuff like that. But I don't really think it's that bad of a change. Like we got, we no. they got to do their little plot line. And I was like, this is different, but it's not different bad it's just it's just different and i'm like i think they did a good job um so i kind of like some of the changes they did along the way there's other changes that are a little less good um like for example there's a very particular scene that happens in both the animated and the live action where um katara has a like a scroll of like a of like an ancient water bending technique which i think in the cartoon she stole it from pirates and in the live action it's just grand grand grave it to me um yeah. So, I don't know. I think a lot of people didn't like some changes like that, where it's like, I, you know what? That's one of the changes where I feel like people might hate just because it's different. Because at the same time, I'm like, you know what? She stole it from pirates, but they might not have had time to fit in this whole stealing from pirates thing in the live action. But I That's think what... really. Yeah. random thing in the avatar world like i don't remember that at all that she i know i know the episode you're talking about but i don't remember the pirates like at all and that's why it's probably not that bad of a change is because it's like who who remembers that scene right but i think what was a bad change is she's practicing the move in that scroll and she's having a very hard time with it and you know ang walks up and he he wants to in the original anyway he sees her practicing the move he's having trouble and he's like well i've never done water bending before but I do know a lot about energy and bending, and I feel like maybe some of the stuff I've learned can can rub off on you. Um, right. And in the original, you know, he says that and he practices with her, and he he picks it up a lot more easily than she does, which mm -hmm. kind of actually leads into what Katara's character I think is in season one is that um, she yeah. wants to be able to contribute. She wants to be able to use her water bending, which you know. To her, it's like a beautiful part of herself, which she's never gotten to flex. And, and what she made wants her to... unique in her village, and like she wants to be able to use that in the world to help people. It, it made yeah. her unique, and she also feels out of touch because she's like, there's this whole legacy of water bending and the martial arts and the fighting and the spirituality of it that I never get to, I never get to experience just just because I'm the only one in my village who does it. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, you know, that kind of moment where Aang picks up that technique really easily and it's not as easy for her, um, I feel like that's kind of part of her season one journey is, you know, she feels kind of let down and it makes it that much more triumphant when it sets a later goal on. Post. Yeah, it sets yeah. a goalpost and stuff like that. Well, in the live action instead, she's practicing that move and she's like, hey, Aang, um, do you want to practice too? Because like you're the avatar and eventually you're going to have to learn water bending. And he's just like, no, nah, I'm good. And then they just, <laughs> it's like two seconds and they move on to the next thing. Which, by the way, Aang uh, doesn't waterbend in season one. What? <laughs> what are we doing here? Wait, doesn't it, right? doesn't it end at the Battle of the North Pole where he That's goes the into they, the Avatar they mode? They do go to the North Pole, so you still get like, 
I think you still get like the big water spirit and shit like that. Which, if that counts Where as water bending, water bends. Then... No, but I think he means like in season one, Aang does like a little yeah. bit of water bending throughout until he becomes proficient. It's like it's supposed yeah. to be like the point of season one is we got to learn water. Point of book two book is we got to learn. Yeah. yeah, we got to learn earth bending. Book three, we got to learn fire bending. This one, it's just like I don't know. That just put a sour taste in my mouth where he's like, "No, nah, I'm good." And I'm like, are you serious? You're the Avatar, dude. That's um, your whole point. Like, that's your biggest struggle. In this and isn't this stuff. rendition of him, like, way more plot-oriented since the start? Like, I, yes. Uh, unlike um, Cartoon Aang that has to, like, learn to face his, his burdens, I heard that this yeah. Aang is all about it right from the start. So how the, how, how the hell would he, like, put away his waterbending duties if that's the character they're writing. That's so that's weird. crazy to me. And I gotta say, I think a problem with this might have been the writers, not the actors, because I, I, personally, I feel like these actors feel way more like their characters in the behind-the-scenes stuff I've seen than they do mm. in the actual mm. show. Um, because, like, I don't know, I'll see clips of just... Aang's actor just hanging out behind set with Katara, and I'm like, oh my god, they act like Aang and Katara here, but in the show, they don't necessarily. I think they're less expressive, um, which I think is something a lot of people have pointed out, and I think part of it is the showrunners kind of expressed a desire for this to be more less kitty and more games of thronesy uh because like that's what's going to appeal to everybody if it's more like game game of thrones and so um you kind of get characters who are less expressive and more serious and for example you know a in in the animated ang is like i want to learn water bending and while we do it you guys want to also stop at these all these stops along the way and play and see sights and stuff um and the reason they end up going to the north pole i think is just because you know that's where the water bending masters are. We got to learn water bending. In this one, instead, Aang gets a vision that the firebenders are going to attack the North Pole. So we got to get there as soon as we can. Jesus. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> so then they, they little changes, things that uh, seem like they add up, you know? Like, it, it, yeah. I think it is a lot of little stuff that adds up because moment to moment, there will be times where I'm like, okay, combat here, out of this fucking world. This city looks better than I ever imagined it. Um, but it, it really is the little moments like that. And there's one, there's two corny moments in episode one that I just can't get over. Or one of them that I've seen people really making fun of online is uh, Grand Grand at the South Pole. When Aang shows up, she, she gets her thousand yard stare. And she's like, long ago, the four nations lived in harmony. And she did the, the Avatar Katara. intro, which yeah. like... So doing something like that, like saying the animated series intro and dialogue, it, it's a really fine line between that feeling like a cool callback and feeling like a really corny shoehorned in line. Yeah. It fell on kind of the shoehorned side. Well, yeah. Like, why not the, just start the show with that? The, like, most that's beautiful, what I'm the most beautiful part of that line is actually the person delivering it and that it ends with Katara's faith yeah. that ang can yeah. pull it off so if you mm -hmm. if you make it someone else say it like you take away like kind of like a book end part of like the show which is katara's faith in ang i don't know that's, yeah. that's pretty important yeah you so, you kind of like grew in part of her motivation but, or like it, at least like part of her character it's like making yeah. taylor said you lacked worthy opponents <laughs> it's like what yeah what is she doing saying this this isn't your line and i think the other moment in episode one that i was like this is too much for me man there's a moment where uh, Aang's actor, who I should have looked up the name for before now, sorry. Um, he is, he's basically facing the camera. He's not talking to the viewer, but he's basically talking to the viewer. And I think it's when he originally, like, learns of his quest. Like, I'm the Avatar and I'm going to have to stop the Fire Nation. He, the actor's facing the screen and he's like, I can't save the world. I'm just Aang, the fun-loving airbender kid who... Uh, he, it, it felt it felt like the Ember Island Players episode where that person <laughs> playing Aang is like, I'm the Avatar and I'm an incurable prankster. It 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 felt like that moment in real life. I was uh, like, oh my god. May I recommend a vi so I watched a video on this by YouTuber Drew Gooden, usually uh, okay. comedic movies or uh, videos, but he made a very good breakdown of what he dislikes about the writing of this, um, and just the way he explained it. I'm just curious if you would agree with his points because he it seems like he made some really good points. Another one he brings up is like 
just King Boomy just seems completely off where like Yeah. Stuff like it's it's like not the King Boomy character itself, but like they're not keeping track of what they made the character say previously, where like Boomy will like say, You need to go do your duty, and then he's the one that traps the duty bound Aang to like in like a, a the rock cave that he puts them in where like in the cartoon boomy is very childish um this one mm. apparently is a lot more serious but then they also like they discover a plan that the fire nation's attacking and they're like okay cool we discover the plan and then the fire nation attacks and they were completely unprepared anyway so it's like they're hardly keeping track of like what they've established in the plot is what it seems like um so i'm just curious if you would agree with like those takes if you ever watch it i do definitely and um that's thing. Some char- like some characters might feel inconsistent because you know, for example, Boomy is supposed to eventually be a member of the White Lotus and yes. was all along. Um, and here he might not come across as someone who would be a member of the White Lotus because yeah, he's he still kind of gives that Mad King energy that he gave in the cartoon, but I feel like it's coming from a different place. Well, um, the the thing about Boomy is that like the Mad King is almost just a raid because when Aang talks to Boomy and Boomy gets real, yeah, Boomy like. I yeah, think he's like one hundred percent correct, and like no, like there's the scene where like they're trying to rescue him, and he's like, "Ang, sometimes you just have to wait and be patient," and like, and, and, and like that's a really good lesson for Ang, where it's like sometimes you just don't need to run in there; you just have to wait for your moment, and then the moment will make itself, and then you strike, and that's a big key part of earthbending. But like that's an also character building for Boomy, where it's like he's not King Boomy because of whatever. He's King Boomy because he's actually good at his fucking job, dude. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> um, and then I'm trying to think of other stuff because I want to give like a sandwich of like I said the good stuff and then some of the bad stuff. Yeah. Zuko, how's Zuko? Zuko, that's the thing. I talk like some characters don't feel like they get to live up to their full potential, and I feel like that might just be writing. Zuko, though, I feel like they chose a guy who just gets Zuko, nice. and they. Yeah added they added stuff to the live action that actively makes it better um for example um in in the animated there is a scene where ozai is sending a troop of fire nation soldiers knowing they are going to die to this place but he's like they just have to die it's a distraction it's something we have to do in war and zuko's Mm -hmm. like fuck that you're not going to send people to you know go die um and and that's their big falling out and one adi- one change that they made in the live action is that that crew who Zuko, he, he saved their lives by telling his father not to send them. They are the people who are on the ship adventuring with oh, him in Iroh. Fantastic change. And so it's yeah, like, that's oh, that's crew. fucking awesome. They're, they're endeared to him. And then other cool things is, man, some of the fights are really badass and you, you see, you see firebenders burn people alive uh like they the the bending gets intense dude or like a a spike of earth embedding in someone's chest Whoa. or their back like they so got piercing they, in here I, damn so they they wanted to make it more games of thronesy and uh at the very least i think that led itself towards like exploring more what bending warfare might actually what, be like what worries me about that cuz you've said that multiple times now is that them wanting it to be more Games of Thronesy is like, okay, you, you, it seems like you didn't even understand the assignment to begin with because yeah. Yeah. Avatar: The Last Airbender is already a show for adults. I'm saying it's already yeah. a show about war that everybody of every age is, group is likes. Is it not insane that this is Netflix follow up? Like this was in production at the same time as One Piece, where they actually went the opposite. They're like, oh, this shit's so stupid. Let's embrace it, and then adults loved it. Like. Yeah. This is kind of weird that by trying... And then in the Drew video, he has scenes where, like, the dialogue gets so much more dumbed down in the live action. It's like, wait, which one of these dialogues sounds more dramatic Games of Throny? And it's the one in the show, in the cartoon show, that actually sounds more intense and more heartfelt than, like, the more dialed-back dialogues. I don't know. I feel like they failed Man. the assignment on multiple angles there with the tone. There's so. one producer who's just in there fucking up the writer's room. Well, the the creators, the original creators were originally on this project and they That's why left, I said producer. Yeah, they left they left over creative differences like halfway through. So yeah, not surprised. Yeah, the writer's room was clearly not listening to their takes. Meanwhile, 
uh, the One Piece live action had Oda in there, like, sweating, and they would, like, really work with him to try to find compromises. So I, I, like I saw really a bit shows. about uh, One Piece today, as a side tangent, um, about including Garp earlier in the show. Yeah, he was not a fan of that idea, uh, Oda. He, he had to was be not, and there's a producer that, like, talks in an interview, like, yeah, I convinced him to do that, and it's like, bad choice, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not the anyway. best choice, but anyways. I think the overall, uh, like, uh, I think the overall re review would be, you know, if you're if you're a fan of Avatar, I still think this is fun to watch. There just might be a couple moments like that where, like, you roll your eyes and you're like, okay, come on, like, this was a, this was a low hanging fruit. Just do what you know people are gonna like. But, and I think there's also still a lot of entertaining shit in here. So, um, I think it's fun for anyone who's a fan of Avatar. I, I didn't walk away as satisfied as I walked away with the One Piece live action adaptation, but you know, mm -hmm. I heard they also uh, got rid of Sokka's sexism, so he has no progression Wild. as a character. You know what? Wild. <laughs> I actually have something to say about that because um, that was a big thing online, where I think it was a uh, two of the actors had you know tweeted about that that they took out some of Sokka's sexism in the show because it was iffy, and a lot of people got really mad online. Because, you know, they're like, oh, that's such a big part of season one is that, number one, Sokka has to break away from those sexist ideals. And the, by the end of the season, he get, he breaks away from it, one, by meeting Suki, who kicks his ass, and also seeing his sister ascend to a waterbending master, which yeah. is kind of the Sokka side of the sexism plot in season one. And Katara obviously has, like, you're not allowed to learn combat waterbending, and she does anyway, and she kicks ass. Mm -hmm. And so that's why people got mad, I think. They, they had a response to that, which I kind of liked, is they're like, it's not that we're, we took out the sexism because sexism bad and you can't have it in a show. They said the way Sokka says those jokes in the cartoon, it's like obvious that it, he it, he's being ridiculous and it's meant to be bad um, and it's something that they're going to change. But when you say the same lines of dialogue in live action, they're like, frankly... It, it just doesn't sound as good in a live action as it does in a cartoon. You can um, so easy no, you could so easily rework the well, lines to come off as passive aggressive sexism. Like um, back to One Piece, the way that Sanji flirts is a lot less cartoony because you can't write. Yeah, Sanji's like you can modify lines. it like they did with him. So uh, they could have very much no modified it. So I don't know. Yeah. I heard no, they made yeah. Suki super horny in contrast. So uh, there you go. So <laughs> Suki like Zuko perfect looks she looks just like her acts just like her um i think they did great with suki um but with the uh oh yeah that reminds me so with the sexism thing i think what they kind of replaced it with on sokka's side of things is um he still has some of those feelings but i think it's less focused on katara you can't do that and it's more like inward i think he has a lot of struggles with like what a warrior's supposed to be what a man is supposed to be what would mm -hmm. his dad want him to be Which and you see him there, yeah which were always there, and uh, I think they just, I think they decided to dive into those themes on him harder. Nice. Okay, so there's a trade-off. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, let, I'm going to toss it over to you with Health Kitchen Joe, but you, the kitchen's on fire. you got to go somewhere okay. quick. I, I woke up in a cold sweat after having a fever dream, and I was like, I have to watch Gordon Ramsay's Hell Kitchen uh, for no reason other than a weirdly, like, triggering system in my brain. Um, I watched the first three seasons of Hell's Kitchen, Um I think the first season is really interesting and really cool because it's a lot less reality TV show and more documentary style of like, it feels like Gordon took a bet saying like, I can take 12 people and out of those 12 people, I can make one of them a phenomenal chef. And it's his journey of like crafting and finding that individual um, with that reality TV show on top of it. Um, that, that, that show is very fun. It's really, really funny. At one, at one point in the show, um, have y'all have any of y'all seen Hell's Kitchen at all? Like a full season of it? Not like yeah. well, like I've watched it here and there. Okay, Watch clips I think. Uh, Idiot so sandwich. Like, yeah, so like the first in the first episode of Hell's Kitchen, he's just like, "All right, we're all gonna go in there and we're gonna start cooking. You all say you can cook. We're I'm gonna spend like three hours teaching you my dishes, and then we're gonna open Hell's Kitchen and we're gonna serve the food. They start serving the food. Gordon Ramsay's doing his thing. About three hours in the service, he says, fuck it. Close the kitchen, kick everyone out, we're done. Like, he just fucking shuts the whole thing down. Which I did not know about the show that he would just do that. Um, and he will just, like, shut down the kitchen, like, midway through a service. Which is crazy to me. 
and people will sit there for hours waiting for food they'll never get um but it's a uh, it, the first season like they really try to ham up his like mean side because like it's during that like uh american idol era with what's his name um simon cow and like that was the big mm-hmm. rage place having like yeah. a really mean judge um but like a li- but like in season two and three they kind of like let's actually show a little bit more of like gordon's like teaching side and they and for my hear like in later seasons they do more of that of like no he he does get really passionate he gets really angry and really mean but deep down he is trying to like get these people to, to the level he wants them at um but uh but the show was just kind of it really is trashy and it's fun and like people make me laugh they get out there in the first day and they're like i'm gonna cook a dish that gordon ramsay is going to fucking love and they open up the tray and it's eggo waffles with maple syrup on top of it and they're like what (laughs) oh not good oh my not good at all um highlight moments um one of the patrons uh was really upset that they didn't uh get their food they weren't getting their food and um uh the mater d comes over and he's talking to them and the mater d goes like um he's like i just like you know i like things take a while if you were a little bit more educated about how the system works you would understand that there's a priority system and the guy goes like you think i'm uneducated are you, what kind of education do you have what kind of education do you have i have a phd in musical theory what kind of fucking education do you have <laughs> it's like it's like whoa <laughs> relax my guy um that was really funny uh, if one of the challenges they have to make like this three course meal potential like service for a wedding and um, the girls team um, really fucked up because of this one individual and when it came down to like show the bride and groom like oh here's our potential dish for you the girl was like oh no I'm not I no I can't show them this I can't and she was just flat refusing and Gordon's like you need to show them the fucking dish or you're off the show and she brings over the dish and she opens it up. It's literally an, it's a single overcooked duck breast with three vertical cuts in it. Mm. And that's all they were able to make in like an hour and a half of time. Uh, it was just like, oh my fucking God. It's How were they doing? Of, yeah, it's, it's just crazy. Like the arrogance that some of the people have when they come into this show. Uh, but it's also just really, really easy to figure out like, that person is going to win this season and that person is going to win this season because they really have that drive and that motivation like from the get-go season two especially the winner like uh episode one she burns her hand and starts like still like tries to write people and like divvy things out i was like okay that person is going to win because she knows what the fuck she's doing compared to everyone else um but it's a fun show i understand why it's like been going on for like 24 seasons or whatever um, but man, it makes me fucking hungry watching it because some of the shit they do make is really good looking. Um, but yeah, it's fun. I, there's just nothing. There's not a lot else on there. Um, but yeah, also there's some really weird looking people in that show. At, at least in those first three episodes, nice. three, first three seasons. I <laughs> there's a guy on there named Dewberry. He's great. I'm sure. I'm sure Dewberry <laughs> is fine. All right. Yeah. Uh, I watched. A full season of an anime. This is a big deal for me. This yeah, I was like, that's that's a headline. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, Move I'm, on to the I'm next. Ta- that, that's enough uh, of, of that topic, yeah. basically. Um, Vinland Saga season one. Watched it dub. Yes. There's some people here who are accusing me of being a snobbist elitist about subs. I would like to point that out. Um, I don't know who that could be. I, I gave a one one word review to Joe and Tyler yesterday. It was a uh, fuck. Um, wow, <laughs> that was really good. Um, yeah, that is such a Willer Core series right there. I love it. It's a uh, the premise of Vinland Saga. Real quick, is it's a story about uh, Norse Vikings and also pirates. Um, mm-hmm. Some Norse ar- which are uh, just Vikings. Well. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and then there's also some army men that get involved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's based on history, apparently. I don't know what yep. elements it's, there are. It's, it's based yep. off of uh, real life people in real life events, um, which is some extra spice thrown in there. I wonder how it's closely. From, it's 10th century. Um, yeah. There's some shit that happens in season two that is straight up real. Like, yeah. that is exactly what happened. Yeah. 
It's kind of crazy. Okay, I'll lead with the question. Uh, the events of the end of season one, is that based on yeah. reality? I the, I would like to say uh, yes. I will double check. Um, sure. Yeah, um, I will I'm do not, that right now. Unfortunately, I'm going to try not to say much, as much as I would love to go spoiler deep, because I think Bradley would really, really, really like this. Um, yeah. It's got. It's like... When you started liking Attack on Titan, Bradley, it's like that from the get go. I feel with with the oh, let's fucking go. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic. Um, it's very grounded, but it's it's got cool fights. I will say my one negative with the series, uh, like literally, I think maybe the only one, is that the animes and adaptations like a little subpar. Like I don't know if that's a hot take. I've I've heard people like the animation, but. I was not very impressed by it. Um, like sometimes the characters aren't drawn super well. The the way fight scenes animate is nothing to write home about. Uh, but the music, the voice acting is all very good. But more importantly, the writing is excellent. So, Willer, for the ending there, um, shit happens, and no one knows a hundred percent what happened. At, in that moment, uh, but, but the but, status quo once that room, once they left that room, was what it was, right? Like yes, that okay. person went in there and became that other thing. Cool. Yeah, that's yeah. that's yeah. basically what I was curious about. Um, yeah. yeah, the characters are great. Um, this is also a revenge story for the main character for for reasons, mm -hmm. but it, it's a very much a story that highlights like the folly of seeking revenge, but also the cruelty of the world they live in. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Viking pirates in particular are real fucking assholes, and oh, yeah. <laughs> some scenes really make my blood boil. This ain't your One Piece adventurers, no sir. These no. are motherfuckers. Probably not. These this isn't your Pirates of the Caribbean either. These are dirty motherfuckers, and yeah. um, I hope they rot in hell. But my God, Askeladd. It's funny you say that about rotten uh, hell. Yeah. I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up! Stop! Stop referencing things I can't know, you little cheeky yeah. bitch. Um, ask a lad. I hate that man. What a fascinating character! Oh my god! Uh, the B character though, so good. A who? Or, ask a lad. Yes, P character. Yes. Um, Ugh. and like, it's crazy because for the longest time, my top one in the mm -hmm. show was Thor's. He had uh, he had a Shanks oh, effect on me. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Thorfinn's father. He was my favorite. Yeah. In the last three episodes, like the th the main three characters all shot above him. Like it all came together so yeah. well. Where like it was yes. a very good adventure, but it was like biding its time. To mm -hmm. like it kind of caught me off guard how intense things got there at the end. I um, you I could not guess that like that was where. Like, where season one ended, like, where... The, it felt that sudden, ends. right? But, like, looking back on yeah. it, it's not that it was rushed, but, like, it, the, they, they played the vibe, they, they mm -hmm. like, that it was just an event happening, and then you're like, oh, this is, like, a climax of all time happening all yeah. of a sudden, and so, it was fantastic. And, and in the manga, Willer, in the manga, it signals, like, that's the end of the prologue. Right, okay. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, so... Damn, that's yeah. a god-tier prologue, then, um... Yeah. <laughs> Um, God, I'm excited for season two. I I, uh, I hear it's two? controversial, so I'm super excited. Season two is it's yeah. so different, but it's actually peak fiction. I, I hear One it's controversial, the... Tyler, because some people are bored by it. Yeah. There's those are the, the Willer. Heart. Those are the same people who don't like book four of Stormlight. Uh, yeah. The, they're wrong. They're objectively <laughs> objectively there, speaking, they're trash. there is. One of the hardest lines I think I've ever read in a manga in season two. Damn. I'm yeah. excited. It, it's it's peak. It, like, it, it encompasses the entire theme of, like, probably the entire series. Uh, but, yeah, I... I Vinland it's probably side, I, the one that I Patch Wolf said in the recent Wolves versus Wolves. Bradley? It's, your, Yo. it's in your hands now, Bradley. Yeah, uh... I, it's it's like Megalo Box, but with Vikings. This is always one of those Berserk adjacent uh, yes. series that's like, oh, this is your next step after you finish Berserk. 
I, I really yeah. think it, it will scratch that Berserk itch for you. Because it scratches mine since Joe doesn't actually let me read more Berserk. He denies <laughs> us our rights. Um, They're locked in a box. I can't get to them. Go get your fucking box. I want to talk about more Berserk. <laughs> Honey, holding yeah. you to gunpoint. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'd like to have a more spoiler-filled conversation in the future if Bradley uh, gets yeah. to it. I, I like uh, the anime. There's a difference with how they handle it. And I am with Tyler on this one where I think the anime approach has really good merits. Um, Dude, that I fucking so music, dog. That fucking music. It, it goes hard. Man, like, uh, so I, I've been holding back buying the manga volumes for Vinland Saga, which are hardback, by the way. Ooh. Ooh, um, it really is berserk. Yeah, they have them all at my local Barnes and Nobles, and I'm just like, every time I walk in there, I'm like, nope, gotta, gotta, gotta wait. I need to read more. I'm, I'm at, I'm at, I saw like, I've been kind of, I like, I've watched the anime in like chunks. I'll probably watch more tonight. Um, just because it's like, sometimes like you just can't eat too much of a good thing, right? You just can only yeah, take no. so much. It, this is so yeah. much a pace yourself kind of series, which I did. Yeah. And, and the manga, I also kind of like, I had like, I, I like, I read through the entire of like season two in like a week and a half or two weeks or something. And I was just like, this is incredible. Like, every chapter was just so fascinating. This is literally me with Akane Banashi, Joe. So you have to yeah. bear with me because <laughs> you understand that when fiction oh, yeah, is that no. peak, you gotta you gotta take it slow. No, 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 I get it. Yeah, um, yeah. But it was, just, but like, season two is, like, like season one, it, like, season two is like an incredible companion. Like, if, if the series ended on season two, I would be completely happy. Damn. Um, oh, man. Yeah, I have it booted it's, up. There's a tab right there with uh with, yeah, with the episode, I, uh, season two episode one ready. There's there's a mini arc that it involves a character Tyler. I think you know who they go if they go to a different place that's not uh where they usually are. And, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Well, it involves it involves um the king. Uh, that is just so good. Interesting. Um, yeah. midway through the season, there was a, the, uh, an arc that was probably like where the show picks up extra. Like it was always good. The show picks mm -hmm. up in the, uh, arc that introduces Knut and Thorgale. Yeah. Um, Knut. uh, very, very good characters. Um, and yeah, the, that yeah. final arc is fantastic. And I feel so bad for Thorfinn and Thorfinn has become my favorite of the series now. So I think season two, two will change me as a human being so i'm ready um i'll give you my list my favorites are Askelad or uh, thorfinn then Askelad, then thor's is still up there but canute the priest priest willembaum underrated character mm -hmm. uh and thorkel so that's like that's my gang right there um that scene where canute and ragnar have like that moment shit yeah chills Ra ragnar is a good honorable mention he was a great character as well i want to point out that uh knut's grandfather is the namesake of the term bluetooth okay wow yeah that's i just wild. think that's that's just yeah. very random yeah oh king uh, swain was also good uh in the season as well yes mm -hmm. man escalade's backstory episode though that shit went so hard oh man okay that's enough of that tyler we're going from peak fiction to hopefully peaker fiction with as you talk about Full Murder Hobo book one. Oh yeah, and I'm at the end of book two as well. I think I've got like thirty minutes into it. You were so telling me about, about this well. one, and it seems like there's some like this compared to Dungeon Crawler Carl. It seems like there's just more like out there ideas. So this wow. is another lit RPG. As I've been going down the rabbit hole. Fun fact: This is not a Tyler's twenty nine and having a quarter life crisis sort of thing no. <laughs> um there's this old book series uh this old book that i read in like intermediate school called epic um, dude bradley <laughs> knows what the bro bradley. i loved that book in middle school i read it like three times and a few years ago i wanted to reread it because i'm like i want to see if it holds up as an adult and i reread it and i was like this is ass oh it's oh, so I remember bad you telling me about that bradley like a book you were super excited about for your child oh my god i remembered it being the coolest shit ever in sixth grade i reread it and i was like this is some booty i think in that book they're like they describe a computer like what they would describe to like 
someone who was born in the 10th century, how yeah. you would have to describe a computer to them. And uh, also the main character is like a Chinese wow gold farmer. And that's how they <laughs> feed their family. <laughs> but then instead of farming gold one day, he goes and beats a raid and gets really rich. And the government comes searching for him. They're like, and they're like how dare much, you? How, you can't how, have that much money in game. Yeah, they're like, how dare you beat the raid? That's impossible. Nobody can beat the raid. Uh, anyway, uh, Full Murder Hobo. Um, the actual title of it is called Everything Full Murder Hobo. This is a fantasy lit RPG. So this is set in a pure fantasy uh, setting where this kingdom is going to war. And they are recruiting young teenagers that are like 16, 17 years old uh, to go into the army. But there's this wizard who comes along and he's like, if you have mana powers, you know, we're going to send you into an alternate dimension to train where time is faster. So they put them in the hyperbolic time chamber uh, and then they'll come back and they'll be like super warriors. Um and so our four main characters all have super good powers, um, except one of them is called a true bard, and he's actually the one who's narrating the story um, in the prologue and epilogue. And he, instead of, like, them treating him really nice, they, like, beat the fuck out of him. And they're like, if you don't accept this brand on your head right now, where you can, I, the next words out of your mouth are either I accept uh, this oath, or we just kill you and shoot you in the face right now. Um, it's harsh. Yeah, so, like, they all have these sigils on their head that, like, like binds them to being loyal to the kingdom, and so, like, the kingdom can command them as, like, slaves or something. They're like, you can't disobey us. Like, that, the, the sigil just makes you become obedient. The pawns. Sort of thing. Yep. Yep. Hmm. Um, so they all go into, they're like, the wizard's like, oh, you all have special powers. I'm going to take the girl who's going to be a magician. She's a namer. She can name spells. Uh, she's going to be my new apprentice. And everybody's like, oh my God, the head wizard is taking on a new apprentice. It's like Dumbledore, like taking on, uh, it's wish. Harry. Yeah, yeah it's some wish. shit like that. But the other main character, the hobo, his name is Luke. Luke doesn't have like he has weird mana. Um, it comes out as like solid or liquid instead of like gaseous like the others. Mm, and and uh, comes out liquid. Yeah. So the wizard, in order to send them to the right dimension to train with their like master that's gonna teach them, he like pushes some mana through them and then it opens a new portal. Well, when it comes to Luke, he can't like get it through him, and so he struggles. And, it, and then finally he does, and he's like, oh, see, look, we have the right dimension open right now to the healer, like, cleric dimension. You're going to go be a cleric. And then he pushes him through, and he just, like, disappears. Like, he just evaporates into nothing. And the guy on the other side of the portal is like, oh, no, he didn't make it through. And then the head wizard's like, oh, oh, well. And the girl's like, you just killed my best friend of, like, 15 years like, what the fuck? What do you mean, oh well? And he's like, you can cry about it on your own time. We got shit to do. Um, and so she's just sitting there with this trauma that her best friend just died. Uh, turns out, he goes to a dimension with no trainer. Um, time's, time moves faster than any other dimension that's ever been discovered. And he goes into, like, the starter zone. So, like, this is his starter zone. And he, like, there's just goats there that are, like, knee-high. But uh, the goats start beating the fuck out of him. And uh, he, like, barely survives the goats. And he has to, like, train on karate chopping the goat spines. And he kills, like, 18,000 goats to get past the first tutorial area. Um, anyway, he gets, like, stuck there for, like, 40 years. And he goes, he turns into a crazy person being stuck somewhere for 40 years. Uh, they, all of their, like, masters and stuff are really abusive and, like, using the people that they're training to their own, like, goals and stuff. So, like, the druid guy, uh, his master's like, oh, if I berate and gaslight and treat my apprentice like piece of shit, he'll learn faster. So, he puts thorns in his feet, not thorns, uh, spikes in his feet. He, like, punctures them. His and name's then Thor's. No, no, his name is Andre. 
Okay. Um, he puts thorns in his feet, ties them to a tree, and says, if you can't make this tree grow apples to feed you, you're going to starve to death. And then he leaves them there for, like, three months. Um, and then he's like, oh, yeah, you learned to be a druid, you know? Like, now we can finally start your training. And he's like, that wasn't it. Um, the wizard guy, uh, the girl, like, has to name spells in order to capture them. So, like, in her dimension, like, spells are like Pokemon. And she has to go, like, capture spells in order to use them. Ooh, it's pretty neat. It's kind of neat. Um, so, like, she's a namer. He calls her a namer. But he doesn't really know she's a namer. He just thinks she is because that's what he wants to replace him. Because he's a namer. So, like, he brings her in front of this spell. And there's only three chances to, ca like, capture this spell. Because there's three instances of it. And she succeeds on the first one. But... If you, if you run out of mana and keep trying to do something, you'll start using your HP instead. So, like, she runs completely out of mana, and she, like, almost runs out of HP, but she name, figures out how to name the spell, and she captures it. And he's like, holy shit, you actually did it. And she's like, what do you mean I did it? I thought that's what you expected of me. And he's like, well, that's what I expect out of all the apprentices that came before you. And she's like, wait, how many times have you fucking tried this? And he's like, way too many. He's like, too many that I've lost count. Um, dick. So yeah, everyone's a dick, but they all go train. And that's kind of like what the first book is about. Uh, is like, they're all slow, like, insanity, like, gains that they get trying to become, like, more powerful. Um, and it kind of bounces around between the three main characters, uh, Andre, Luke, and Taylor. Um... But the reason we don't ever focus on the bard is because he doesn't go to a different dimension. He has to stay in the real world. Um, and, like, he only gains XP by interacting with people. But they, like... Anyway, it's stupid. But they they level up. They get stronger. And there's all this, like, government conspiracy shit about how they're controlling them. And, like, they're, like, taxing their EXP, which... Oh, there's a fun name. They... The, they, the Wizard King guy hates yeah. all the names for video game terms. So he's uh, like, it's, it's called Exponential... It's Exponential ex, uh, Xenomorph Potentia. <laughs> yeah. Whatever, man. And, and, and then she's like, wait, it's leveling up. And he gets really pissed. He's like, no, it's not called fucking leveling up. Whoever fucking called it leveling up is a fucking idiot. Whoa, whoa. Like, yeah. So Me like, but be friends. how is uh? There's all but, this normal terminology, but I thought you said it's a fantasy series, like it's olden time. But okay, the sigils bring up their menus so they can see all their stats and shit. Like that's okay, part of it. Okay, and then some old guy just made level up an exp yep, thing. Yep. And HP. Yep. No, it's experience xenomorph. Sorry. Potentia. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Which you get from killing other things. Uh, it's weird to apply this system to. Uh, it's it's just I, maybe I'm too used to Carl. I don't know. I can't see how you have, if it would feel really forced to apply this system to so, certain other settings. I feel, but they have like stats like body, mind, presence, capacity, and things like that. So like as they level up, they get a point into that. Um, they can only unlock skills by actually doing accomplishments and stuff. Weird genre, um, dude. <laughs> it is a weird genre. Your but, quarter life crisis but, is coming in a different shape than mine. I don't know. But I will say this is better than He Who Fights Monsters, where the guy gets dropped into this world and he's like, What's a monster? What's it? EXP? Oh, I don't know what monsters are. He's like, Oh my god, we can die here. Tyler, and that, I'm like, That one was the first one recommended to me on uh, nope. Spotify, but I remember you were talking shit about it last week. It is awful. Um, I don't recommend this book to anyone except maybe Bradley for how weird it is. Ho hobo? <laughs> hobo as well? Yeah, full murder hobo. Uh, I don't recommend it to anybody, but, um, it eventually ends up being, like, the four characters come together and they form a party. And they start doing, like, world quests, but all their world quests are suicide missions. So they become, like, an infamous suicide squad of, like, fantasy characters. And one of them is called a murder hobo, 
where like he he kind of starts getting an itch to kill people after three weeks if he doesn't get to and uh it's it's a good time uh the murder hobo is not like a caveman he's like uh he's like trying to reason with the guy from the office he's like why no use long sentence when few word do good? Mm. <laughs> as, um, uh, as Audible keeps throwing lit RPGs at you, we'll, you'll have to let us know if any that oh, Trump actually, Tar will come out. Yeah, what, which ones are yeah. not trash. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm inter th This entertained me on my drive uh, to and back from Dallas last week, so I'm, I'm not mad. You I'm know? A toss I, I, I guess. I'm going to toss I, the, I, the baton back to you, Tyler, because you're going to follow up with Devil's a part-timer here in a sec. Oh, man. So, getting into that, though. So, Devil's a Part-Timer, Season 1. Hold up. I remember watching Season 1 a long-ass time ago. I really like Season 1. Season 1 came out in 2013. I was about to say that, because I was like, it, it, was there a big-ass gap between seasons or something? Uh, 10. See, yeah, 10. About why, a decade. Why did they even make a second season? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but they did, and it's great, because... Uh, this is a story about how the devil's life got twisted, turned right, upside sorry. down, uh, and now he works at McDonald's, um, which is great because I watched this, and literally at the same time this year, McDonald's started their uh, Wick Donalds. Wick, Wick Donalds. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, this is a great, this is a great time to be Tyler. Um, so there is the devil and the hero Amelia, who like kind of have this. I hate you chemistry going on. Um, and it's going to be a spoiler for the first episode of season two. Y'all y'all remember at the end of season one where it's like, ooh, they kind of hate each other a little bit, but is there more? Oh, I've never watched this. I don't know. Um, well, I'm going to spoil it for you. At the very first episode of season two, um, an egg drops out of a portal and a tiny child hatches out of it and mm. says that uh, the devil and the hero is her mom and dad. So now they have to raise a kid together. Oh, I'm see I think I'm seeing it in the uh, Google images now. And hilarious. good time. Hilarious times ensue with this child. Um, because it starts to get into some, like, Bible shit about the world tree and some... some it's actually stuff. a Christian yeah. anime. Yeah, it's a Christian oh, anime. I mean, the devil's in it. So. Um, I, I I didn't think I would enjoy more hijinks, but I did. This is like the bit, most slice of life I get. Um, it's got some terrible quality animation. Uh, good voice acting for the dub. I, I highly recommend the dub if you're not uh, into sub. This is a very uh, casual, I don't have to think about it anime. Watch yeah. all of season two. Left left is wanting more as I did of season one, um, but uh, if like I wouldn't be shocked if season three came in another decade and I don't care anymore. Just like happened mm. with season two. I was about to Oof. say the fact that this got a new season after ten years is going to fuel my hope for various other series for years to come. <laughs> That seems yeah. like the kind of thing where Tyler would be like, um, if it took more than six years on the dot, it's trash. <laughs> but but you love this. This is like one of your favorite anime, Loki. Yeah. So you've always been big oh, Okay, but like, this is like my favorite trash anime. Like, yeah. I, this, I, this I, has I, some I, substance to it. It doesn't for seem a slice like trash. Of life anime. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think it's, I think season one's really funny. I, oh, I laugh my ass off watching it. It is yeah. funny. Are you? Is that on Crunchyroll? I guess it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can I can I bum one of y'all's Crunchyroll? They literally don't let me pay. Like I, I they I, don't I thought, accept I my card. Mine. Wait, I thought you were bumming mine. No, I can't get it. I haven't been able to get in for years. Well, they only allow you to stream on one platform now, per per user. So mm -hmm. I'd have to pay God. for more users. We're living in a dystopian society. I'm yeah, just gonna go awful. back to piracy. I'm just like uh, yeah, do it. Just like um, goes. Yeah, the, the cool thing, though, is there is some, like, character growth in Season 2. Like, they kind of, like, there's some cool emotional things that happen into it. I would say Season oh, 2 is so. worth as watching yeah. as much of Season 1. Nice. Glowing review from... ABC. And I've got one more on the table, right? Uh, who Who's quiet on the set? Is that Joe? That's uh, Bradley. Ooh, that is That's me. Bradley. Ooh. Are we jumping into it? Are we? Yeah, let's rotate that in because that'll be like 
five Tylers in a row if I don't do this. So, yeah, I'm kind of dying a little bit. Yeah, let's let Tyler take a vocal, vocal break. All right, Bradley, what's Quiet on the Set? Yes, Quiet on Set is a awesome. documentary that recently came oh, out. Yeah. And um, it's just kind of interviewing and hearing stories from a lot of people who worked on Nickelodeon during kind of its its reign uh from you know the late 90s to the early 2000s and i i don't i I don't think it's been a secret and it's almost been a joke on the internet about you know how kind of gross some of the stuff in these shows were and what the people who made them might have been into which i have some direct uh um evidence for yeah and i just Here's the thing. I've never been the kind of person to give trigger warnings for stuff, but for survivors of sexual assault, this might be a little intense. There were moments I couldn't even, I couldn't even look at the screen, and I kind of didn't want to listen either. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. That's the thing. Like the the stuff that is in here is substantially worse than I thought it was going to. Oh, be. okay. I like I. I'm surprised people aren't talking about more if it's like that serious. Oh, I see it every, all over Twitter. Okay. I, I see it all over. Yeah. Everything, I was brought yeah. to tears watching this, um, okay. just because like it's it's that horrible that it happens to anybody at all. And even then, some of these are, yeah, so, some of the some of this stuff is. I grew up on TV watching these people uh-huh. while their the lives t- are being ruined, and at the time, like most specifically Drake Bell, at the time. I was watching him. He would have been 15. And at that time, all of the worst stuff in his life had already transpired. Wow. And I'm like, just imagining what these people who, you know, at at the time I was watching these, they're so much older than me. And I see them now and I'm like, that is a child. And hearing about some of the stuff they went through is just, it is, it's bad, y'all. So you're telling me like Jeanette McCartney was like the tip of the iceberg I'll say I think uh, yeah, a lot more people seem you know cool with sharing their stories and stuff, especially since then. I think Drake Bell has come out and like explicitly said who um, did things to him and what he did, like 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 a public like statement kind of a thing. And it was Dan Schneider. It was not actually. It was not. Um, there is a new I, episode of the documentary that's coming out later this week. Oh, um, it's episodic. I thought it was just... That's the thing. Like, right now, there's four episodes of the documentary out, and there's another one coming out, and uh, at least as far as I've watched, he is Dan Schneider. He seems creepy. He was a misogynist. He was an asshole. People working for him were glad he was gone when he left. But unlike some of the other people in this documentary, I don't... I haven't seen any explicit... Um, sexual assault they're saving, but i don't know they're saving an episode's worth <laughs> yeah they're saving it for that. the schneider episode uh where are you watching this because this seems really interesting uh, was max. it on netflix or hulu or max even ah shit okay yeah at first i thought uh i went looking for it on paramount and i was like they're not gonna fucking put it on paramount because that's where all the nickelodeon <laughs> yeah. stuff is that would be wild that would be it's on paramount because you were interested in victoria you might want to check you out. might want to watch uh, the making of victoria wow. it's called quiet on set <laughs> wild uh but no there's not a whole lot more to it's say on, about it's it on max or amazon prime it's on max it's on max. okay yeah. but um yeah no i think for anybody who grew up with nickelodeon it is a it's a wild watch i think they even like when the documentary starts i think they straight up say like i'm just warning you like if you're a millennial gen z who grew up during this time your your world's gonna be blown wide open jesus mm-hmm. well which ooh hold Bradley. on so there is more stuff um because a, a big portion of the documentary focuses on Drake Bell but another big portion focuses on Amanda Bynes and there is oh, a lot yeah. of st- we might learn more about this because um people think Dan Schneider might have been more involved in what happened to Amanda Bynes there's even stuff saying like they might have he might have gotten her pregnant um so I don't know we're gonna see what they say in the future documentary episodes, but wow, okay, it's intense. I gotta follow this because that is like, while I was not, why I didn't grow up with cable all the time, I still watched these shows here and there, and like I know all the characters and all the actors and stuff, so that's pretty wild. Um, to lighter things, why don't we uh, yo yo mushi pedal our ways to a 
lighter conversation, Tyler. Uh, before we pedal off, um, it's wild to me how popular this is gaining traction right now. Because, like, I thought all this was already known, like, seven or eight years ago. Well, I don't think it was, like, definitively. Oh. Like, it was hinted at and, like, talked around because Ooh. of the power that these people still hold, hold over them. Yeah. But, like, uh, also, like, Jeanette McCurdy's autobiography, oh, if you haven't right. listened to it, is also really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in a weird perversion to wrap it all up, how does Nickelodeon Girls by Pink Guy still on YouTube? Uh, I, I listen. I, I heard that song earlier today, <laughs> and I was like, "Holy shit!" Like, and I and like the comments are people talking about like, "Did you come here because of Quiet on Set too?" <laughs> That's crazy. And they're like, and they're like, obviously, like he like it's satire. It is, but it's it's fucked up how it's become more and more real. It was he. It was spot on the satire. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Yawamushi Pedal. Uh, Yawamushi Pedal is the sports anime that got away. Um, this is a story about a nerdy kid who wants to make the anime club at school. Um, so in order to make the anime club, he races against a guy from the bicycling club. Because the oh. guy from the bicycling club sees him ride like a mommy bike up this giant hill. And he's like, how the fuck are you riding that bike up the hill? He's like, man, this ain't nothing. I ride like 45 kilometers a day so I can go buy minifigures from Akihabara. And I ride my bike so I can save money instead of using the train so I can buy more anime and minifigurines. Before you continue, I wanted to stop on the term mommy bike. Yeah. Like okay, yeah, let's back. <laughs> that's what they call it. Oh, okay, that's what they call it. That's not a Tyler term. Nope, that is a term okay. in Japan okay. to describe a simple bicycle that has no gears or anything. Typically, accessorized with like a basket on the front. Now, is this um, mommy M O M M Y or like mommy like M A M I like a Japanese word? M O M M Y. Okay, this is all important stuff. So I'm glad we're covering it. Yeah, it is a it's, it's it, just. It is a typical everyday user generic, okay. like casual. I'm gonna go for a bike ride on the beach. You are right? free to continue. That's why. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, if you Google mommy bike, you will see what I'm describing. I'm real worried if I do that, but I'm gonna do it anyways. No, hold on. I'm let him cook. <laughs> I no, no, I no, just no. did it. There's nothing. Anyway, uh, Onoda is our character's name, and uh, he races him, and he's like. He goes, yeah, if you beat me, I'll join the anime club. So that's how he gets them to race him, because he needs members to join. Gotcha. And, uh, like, he gives them, like, a 15-minute head start on this, like, two-mile race or three-mile race or something. And it ends up being a good race. It's a very wholesome anime. It's a little bit earlier anime. Um, it's from 2008, I believe. So it's got a lot of... Uh, older tropes when it comes to like sports anime um i haven't gotten into anything that's like fantasy related when it comes to sports animes it's a little bit more grounded like they're like this guy's a sprinter this guy's a climber no right. that's the sec yeah they're, they're like that's the section of the race that he really likes to do you know yeah and they're like Lots oh yeah they're like this guy's really good at chasing people down this guy's really good at escaping from people on his bike and they're like Oh, there's these two guys who are really in sync with each other, and they're really good at riding next to each other. My favorite crashing. brand of that is so there's there's levels to this, right? There's Kuroko where there's like borderline superpowers, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's uh there's blue bo blue box blue no, lock blue lock yeah. that has like demon stands a little bit. <laughs> My, yeah, yeah, they have demon stands. My favorite representation is something more like Haikyuu or Ice Shield, where they like will hyper, like, hi, like hyper present a normal thing that's happening, but make it look supernatural. Just it's like, it's more like Haikyuu. Yeah, I like that kind of stuff. Like they're like, oh shit, this guy's really good at changing gears on his bike, Let's and they go. like overemphasize. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny as shit. This is peak genre. Um, yeah, it's fun. It's entertaining. It's very lighthearted. Would I like um, this, I made it through the first season of it. 
um the the main character's kind of like yeah i like biking like this is a very fun thing because he's done it his whole life he's like always been riding a bike since he was like eight years old but he only did it so he could go buy anime and like nerdy stuff but he's like coming around to figuring out himself and like what is high school as a young adult you when see. you've been a nerd your whole life what is it like to make friends how are you supposed to act around people you know dude you um, see the bike is a metaphor for sexuality it's probably not. it's a it's a <laughs> metaphor no, it's, for it's, the springtime of youth um it's definitely not <laughs> well would i like this tyler i think willer because i think you would like it but you'd be Run like with me the wind where it's is like more is also the other one the tyler god if you haven't fucking ago. watched that yet i'm gonna stab you you should because it was in the very first roundabout cast <laughs> yeah <laughs> like talking about <laughs> Run with the wind like oh Man, bro, I'm you know watching anime is like like mentioned earlier is an achievement for me. Bradley, you should watch Run with the Wind if you want to cry about it. Oh my god, I remember you talking about that one. That actually yeah. did sound pretty good. Now, Tyler, it's not over yet. I'm I'm, I'm relying on you for more content. Uh, tell me about <laughs> Delicious in Dungeon. I saw a little gif of this and it looked cute. We, I talked about this, by the way, last podcast. I don't know if y'all even remember. I vaguely. Okay. Um, I do, and because I know Joe watched it, and I and I avoided my ears on it because cool. I was like, Kelly saw one episode, said she didn't like it, and I immediately go, I'd probably like this. <laughs> um, it's consistent yeah. at least. You got a system going. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Tyler, let me know how do you feel about it. Uh, yeah, so I just got through the episode today. I, it's like, I think it feels like it's winding up. They just kind of achieved the goal they set out to do when they first introduced the anime. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that's Which, the most latest episode. I, I, I'm assuming you've read all the manga. No, I haven't, actually. I've okay. read zero of the manga. Our, uh, our, fr our friend Sirket has read all of Delicious and yeah. Dungeon. Which, Sirket which never reads. She, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, like, here's the main thing. I got into this anime not expecting a whole lot out of it. I was, like, mm -hmm. yeah. was not expecting anything. So, Joe's talked about it. So, I'm going to give you my viewpoint on it, yes. since we don't have to go back into what it's about. Yeah. This is done by Studio Trigger, who yeah, also did Hunter that Hunter. Last time. That's a uh, so, <laughs> this shit is fucking beautiful. Yeah, it is. Like, that was kind of it. They're like, oh, do you like it? And I was like... It's made by Studio Trigger, so it's high quality. It's like, I don't care about this anime, but it's good because it's Trigger. Like, uh, also, uh, like just hearing that studio's name makes me want to watch it. It's like saying, uh, like, Quentin Tarantino made a new movie. It's like, I don't care what it is, you're going to watch it because it's Quentin Tarantino. You know, it doesn't matter what the subject is, you're going to like it because it's going to be entertaining. Well, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, yeah, I'm not a fan of Jackie yeah. Brown either, because it's his I, earlier. I work, was literally, but... literally just today thinking about how good I, Jackie Brown is. <laughs> literally, I, like, I, I need to rewatch it because I watched it during a hangover, so I don't know if I really processed no, everything. No, 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 that's not the way. Yeah. For me, um, it's actually but any... Pulp Fiction is. I'm a, I like. I'm a heretic, but whatever. Yeah, it, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Um, I would recommend Delicious and Dungeon. Unfortunately, it's a Netflix exclusive, so. Uh, set your sails up to go find out where it's at. Um, and it's Episodic Weekly, which is very weak. Um, I would recommend not watching this until the first season is all done. This is a very bad weekly I adaptation. Wonder, I wonder if... I, I mean, I've been enjoying it for, like, my Wednesdays of, like, oh, I'm just gonna sit down and watch this. <laughs> it's while I go to bed. Or it's Thursday, sorry. Uh, today's X-Men. Fraud detected. Yeah. Oh, Joe, you're not talking about X-Men! It's only it's only two episodes. I want I gotta let it cook first. I've heard insanely positive things I, about this I show. I believe they, they put Cyclops in one episode and everybody liked him again. Oh my god, I'm so happy they they gave me <laughs> such good Cyclops content. Sorry, um, sorry, sorry. Let's. But yeah, it's really never been like. Anyway, no, he's never been cooler. I'm so happy yeah. he's getting his limelight. Anyways, uh, Delicious and Dungeon is a food anime. Um, about them eating monsters in a dungeon. Yes. And yes. it's delicious in dungeon. It's entertaining. It's good. I would recommend it once the first season has wrapped up. Um, I This is Netflix exclusive. 
uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of a good tag to have on some of their animes. Because they also have, like, Devilman Crybaby as, like, an exclusive Netflix one. Am I not mistaken? It is. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they also have... So Seven Deadly Sins, so... Seven Deadly it's Sins, which is, like, their flagship one. Um, I would not... I, I would really like to see this replace Seven Deadly Sins as in terms flagship. of quality. I yeah. I think so. And I, this, it's looking like it. This is such an all-rounder... Mm -hmm anime that nice i don't know if i would say like your parents could enjoy it no no it's but, still too anime yeah but uh, like but like i recommended this to our friend austin mm -hmm. because i think he would enjoy it because it's high quality it's like that top austin tier likes of, cute, you know cute stuff it, yeah. it hits it hits both entertainment and animation quality in terms of an anime to bring to it's, a person who doesn't watch them so much yeah and it's also like you, it's very episodic where like each yeah. kind of like episode is contained but it has an overall plot and it and the plot is progressing like it's so yeah not... oh. uh, dude there's some lull though there is a bit of lull that is kind of a thing which, which is why i recommend waiting until season one it of seems the like i watched the whole season in in a yeah. week kind yeah. of like because that's yeah. what i was doing i was binging it and then i thought i'd be done by now i thought it was done i thought season I one did, was I, over I, 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 thought I, the last episode I was the last going to be the last episode but apparently I, no. I got to like episode eight or nine with the water oh no yes. it was it was like two weeks ago right before they're about to do everything and i was like mm -hmm. what the fuck do you mean this is weekly <laughs> Wait, yeah. what do you mean <laughs> um, what do you mean yeah, what do you mean? Anyway, you Delicious mean... Intelligent. Watch it when yep. season one is over. Sounds yep. delicious. I, I also agree. But I'm watching it weekly because I enjoy it. It's my bedtime stories. So Joe likes his routines. I do. All right. All right. Let's talk about a video game. Little known game. Uh, oh, slightly revolutionary. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is oh, the 12th Final Fantasy VII game. <laughs> Final... <laughs> Actually, though, which one is it? It genuinely, it's like the ter the thirteenth of the Final Fantasy franchise. But if uh, we're... so, it's Final Fantasy Seven Thirteen. Yes, if you're counting them all, like Snowboard Kids and Crisis Core, which we but, of course count. <laughs> but what you should count it as is Final Fantasy Remake Part Two. Yeah. Um, of three. I've seen people say that this game. They say it jokingly, but also not so jokingly, that this game has some Yakuza DNA in it, because uh, you can just do all kinds of shit. Oh, uh, it's got so much goofy side content and, like, main content, um, vibey Yakuza-style quest. Side quests in this game, massive improvement over Final Fantasy VII Remake. Oh, good. I, I played Seven Remake without doing a single side quest, because, like, none of them looked interesting, and I was right. Oh, my God. Um, you, you're, I 100% I in that game. What the? God, that is wow. the least Joe thing I've ever heard. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Not 100, 100. Like, well, I you did all the quests, side quests. That's and crazy. And all the missions. That's yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know why I did it. I, I think the point being was that, like, I... Because I knew you weren't doing it, so I was like, I feel like obligated. I should do it so I can have a take on this content. In this one, Man, that was, a good way to yeah. handle it is, like, do half the side quest in each region. And you'll get, like, a, okay. a nice sampler course... Because they're very, they're very good. There's one where you're in a town, and the cool thing with the side quest here, it, they actually one up Yakuza in this instance, where mm. especially Yakuza seven and eight, the JRPG ones, um, where you have these party members and you bond with them, but you have to do the bonding event separate to side quest. And the side quest is just Ichiban or Kiryu. Here, they do this clever thing where every side quest is tied to one of your party members and. Anyone who knows the part Final Fantasy VII knows that that party gets big. It's nine total by the yeah. end. And by the end of Rebirth, you have the full party, though two of them Ooh. are guest characters. But they're, okay. like, you still get that sense. It's like, oh, shit, we've gathered the, up all the crew. And, like, next game, we'll get to play a Sid and Vincent um, as well and get, like, everyone's uh, playable. Damn. Um, I heard people were hyped about Vincent, so it's kind of Vincent is that. very cool. The thing is, I never even got Vincent in Seven. 
Vincent and Yuffie are optional wow. party members in Original Seven. I never even saw Vincent. So he's by default my least favorite party member. Uh, the other least favorite would be Yuffie, the other uh, side character. Uh. She's great in Rebirth. I'll get to that in a second. So every quest has a party member that you go do the quest with. So like This quest is a Cloud and Red 13 quest, and this one's a Cloud Tifa. There's like some cute ones where like Cloud and Tifa stumble upon these kids that like they go into a pond that turns them to frogs, and they play around as frogs. And you're like, what the fuck? But you got to remember... Getting turned to a frog is a status effect in Final in, in Final Fantasy VII. So they just like took that status effect and be like, "This is a thing that exists in this world. We're not going to sugarcoat <laughs> it. You can get turned into a frog. So why not make a quest?" And everyone knows about it. Like it, it's just normal thing. It's real. It, it happens. You can go to the corner store and pay a guy a nickel to turn you into a frog. It's no big deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, you get anti anti frogging things are sold in your general mm-hmm. store because it can't happen. You know, there's fiends. Um, so you go there, like you go, you turn into a frog, and your whole party has different like frog forms, and you get little frog attacks to fight. And once you beat that, the kids are like, "No, keep playing with us." And then Tifa and Cloud, like they're flirting and they're playing, and you play Fall Guys as frogs with the frog kids. It's like it's great, it's cute. Like there's a quest where you follow around a dog called Salmon. Uh, Dunky talked about this in his video if you watched it. Uh, it's a Cloud Barrett quest. During the quest. Barrett is talking about how difficult it is to be a dad to, and watch his little girl one day grow up. And he's like, I don't want to be the dad that stifles my little girl's growth. But at the same time, I'm afraid I'm turning into that kind of person. And all the meanwhile, you're chasing this dog to this banger dog theme that ex- exists exclusively in this quest. Like, they made a music track just for this quest. And when you get into battles in that quest, there's the battle version of the dog theme. That they didn't have to do all that. Like, they just put so much life into the quest, both through Barrett's dialogue, but also, like, the little touches, like the music, um, makes them all very memorable. However, mm-hmm. the later sequences, the later maps, Gongaga and uh, Cosmo Canyon in particular, are a pain in the ass to traverse. Traversal in this game is kind of poopy in general. Um, your chocobo clashes into everything. Like, little rocks, it, it has no jump buttons, so you have to, like really wrangle that thing it's very annoying and those those particular regions are where i kind of like tapped out of doing the quests um i did like a little bit of the overworld stuff like they got some ubisoft kind of like checkpoints for you to go get in the open world um and that's all great i'll talk about the combat as well um i raved about final fantasy 7 remakes combat this is even better than that and this is what tyler wanted final fantasy 16 to be because this is a fucking rpg bro you are making builds you are you're like is it it's the same is it it's the same as like, the previous one joe okay okay but like i just wanted to make, i really like that so i wanted to make sure they didn't like it's over, even like, better like they added team up attacks nice. both as like so you have like nice. offensive and defensive team up attacks that you can do for free it's just basically like mm-hmm. tifa has no way to fight stuff in the air but one of her team moves is that Either Cloud or Red 13 will launch her into the air, and then that's how she can get in the air and do air combos. Or Cloud can bounce Barrett's bullets and hit enemies. And that, those are just basic additions to their movesets. Um, but then also you build up, like, team supers, like Chrono Trigger, Dual Techs. Every pair has them in some way. Some of them are so fun. Like, they really, really cooked. I love this battle system so much. Uh, they added a dynamic difficulty, which is what I played on. Um, that's, like the game will scale with you, which a lot of people don't like in RPGs because they like over grinding, but it's perfect for me because no matter how little or how much I grinded, the game will give me a good challenge, which is, I I thought it was really well executed. Um, Yeah, like I think Tyler would really like this system because it's an action system, Tyler, but you're building up ATV gauges that you freeze the game to input <sighs> in a, a RPG command. Like, you Do would. I have to I... know Final Fantasy VII to play it? You don't. <sighs> but you really should play the first one. No, like, if it's going to stop you from doing it, period, don't. Like, like yeah. if it's one okay. or the other, like, it, you'll be fine. It's just that the game plays with your expectations from seven. Um and remake, if you mainline it, goes by very quickly. Um, it's a very smooth game. This game is a lot oh, longer. I, <laughs> oh, I thought I thought you meant play the first remake. Yeah, I, not I the oh, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I may consider it whenever you play Mass Effect. 
fucking I'll shake your hand right now and download Mass Effect right now. I, I won't because I've got other priorities yeah, to yeah, finish. You're not you, you're not willing to deep dive. No, towards, I, have man. To, I have to beat Elden Ring. You do. No, no. We'll, we'll talk about this later. Um, I'm just still amazed at the grip Final Fantasy VII has on gaming. So many decades later. Now it's this, down by the balls. There's parts that I was dedicating this conversation to you, Bradley. You played seven, right? You're the only That's guy the who's played seven original, right? Alone. That's the thing. I played seven. I think Years I was like ago. fresh. I was fresh out of like high school. I was like 18, but I played it, and I was like, I see why this rocked everybody's fucking world when it came out. When I played seven in 2018, uh, one of our early podcast episodes, I re I renounced that the story super held up i was actually really really invested in the story of final fantasy 7 the gameplay is to this day probably the worst final fantasy it's just very simple yeah um, all the uh the the quality of life stuff they added in the uh i think the port that you told me about where it's like oh you can either speed stuff yeah. up or choose not to run into random encounters i'm like Huge. holy shit i wish i had that when i was playing <laughs> no yeah this is this is why my final fantasy adventure has been fun because on the older ones i just get to like cut out a lot of the bullshit um my problem with rebirth and something that like people are glazing the fuck out of this game glazing is a new term by the way in the internet it's the i know i recently <laughs> learned that one I feel, it's the I feel same nice. as sucking cock you're glazing the dick um oh. and this game is getting glazed and they should be i think it's an incredible game on a gameplay level i have story concerns that like i think people just don't have and i feel like I don't know. Did we come in here with the same expectations? Because, like, they're taking the middle portion of Final Fantasy VII, which is rather mm -hmm. aimless, um, and their solution to it is we're going to make it more bloated and even, like, more aimless, potentially. Like, what they do, Bradley, do you remember the rogue guys in Seven that, like, are all congregating to a location? They're rogue guys that just keep saying, like, reunion and... You, eventually they meet up to like kind of the climax of the game and they're like they're going towards Sephiroth basically yeah I think um, I know what you're talking about they base this game the first half of the game is just aimlessly following these guys but the story takes itself more seriously when it when it takes itself more seriously because it's also very goofy it's a very charming goofy game but when it does mm -hmm. take itself more seriously because of that you kind of pay more attention to these elements and when like the reason to follow these rogue guys is so loose. It becomes like a the first half of the game is so aimless, and you're just going to like charming location, and charming location, and like the character development, it, like the character interactions are all great. These characters are better than Final Fantasy VII characters, but they're in a worse story, which is crazy. This should be unequivocally a better story than the original, but because they're adding so much, it feels more aimless. And there's, like, really bad tonal issues. Like, uh, do you remember the character of Dine by any chance? Probably not, Bradley. But I'd like, have to look that one up. Dine was, is Marlene's dad, a.k.a. Barrett's daughter is Marlene. And, like, he adopted okay. Marlene. And Dine was Barrett's friend. And there's a section in Final Fantasy VII where you meet up with Dine again. And it's really sad and tragic. Um, they nail that section in this game. They change some stuff, but it's really great. Literally... Like, five seconds after that section, a guy shows up in a goofy frog mech. <laughs> like, the saddest thing that's happened in the game so far. And you're like, oh, yeah, finally, some good emotions, because I know they can do it. You immediately run into a guy in a frog mech, and then they're just like, yeah, I know you're sad, Barrett. Anyway, let's fight this guy. And, okay. then, and then you have a sequence where you, playing as Barrett, have to shoot down, like, a hundred Shinra grunts riding motorcycles. And it's like, oh, we won't kill damn bad guys, by the way. But we're going to have Barrett mow down these Shinra grunts in this, sec right, like, right after the saddest moment in his life. And it's just, like, it's just so tonally jarring. And then, like, a dude shows up, and he's like, hey, I brought you a sand buggy uh, for you to travel in this desert area coming up. And then all the girls and Kate Sith are like, oh, shit, a sand buggy. And Cloud's like, uh, yeah, sorry, Barrett. Anyway, stay strong. Stay strong. Like, like they spare one line towards Barrett, and then they're just like, oh, cool, buggy. Let's go adventure and be charming again. Like the game is afraid of being sad for too long for the first half, especially. Now the second half is much better narratively. It's a lot more consistent, a lot more focused, a lot more emotional, um, while still having all the charm. I will say. I, 
I should is does everyone know the main death in Final Fantasy VII, or do you oh, yeah. y'all somehow miss yeah, this? Yeah. Tyler, do it's, you know? I know? It's Sephiroth, right? No. The, no. the main death, not the main antagonist. This is, this is like Snape killed Dumbledore, but even yeah. older. Okay. Oh, yeah, because I didn't know that one. Okay, um, never mind. Uh, I no, won't... Okay, no, 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 this is just, it's just some random bitch. It's not. No. It, it is it's not, not some random bitch. Um, it's, it's like your wife, right? Well, my wife is Tifa, but for some people, yeah, <laughs> like I'm a I'm a Tifa boy myself. But you you can be your wife. Uh, by the way, this game has a game long dating sim. Oh, uh, I should have brought that up with the quest. Doing the quest. Me and Red character. Thirteen. You, literally, your date could be Red Thirteen. So oh my god, saying. I was joking. Uh, um, chapter twelve, you go back to the Golden Saucer, and depending who you dated the most, you can get a scene with them, and then a romantic scene with them if it's uh, one of the girls, I think. Or no, they called intimate scene, so you can get it with the boys as mm. well. Um, mm. Barrett is so dreamy, by the way. That is a handsome man. I gotta say, they <laughs> they model the shit out of that guy. Um. So all that the games the dating stuff. I was talking about the main death, right? I will yeah. say, they kind of botched that scene. The most important scene that they had to do, oh, they made it no. overly complex. Um, yeah, because it's in the in the it's, in the cutscene in the original. Perfect. It's very simple. It's such yeah. a perfect cutscene in the original. They made it very complex and like, like slight spoilers. The character sticks around in Cloud's mind. But a powerful thing of the original game is after that death happens, you have a missing piece. Like, in fact, in your mm -hmm. party member menu, there's just a missing block there for the rest of the game, as I recall. So it's like yeah. the weight of that loss is felt, but then in the final cutscene, something er <laughs> well, yeah, you know, something girl did earlier um, comes back, and you get a glimpse of of that p character praying, and it's like a really powerful moment of like. The influence of that character is still live in the live stream, which is like the the planet. Um, mm -hmm. But by having that character like show up and like if if they show up more in three as like a memory ghost, it's gonna dilute from that moment. It was Arkham Knight the whole time. It, well, Arkham Knight is actually really good with that, so I, that's a yeah, dis I dishonor to Arkham Knight. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's like yeah, that all to say better characters in a slightly worse story but it should be better characters in a better story so that's why i can't yeah. give this like I, I like a full score because i do have more narrative problems than i think most people will um yeah that see that the, that screams to me like people really like that character and were really exactly. heartbroken and like we need want to keep them around it's like no you know the, there's even like the the original game director was like it's really important that in a game about life you you have death in it because that's that's the end of life so you have to represent that in some way through mechanics and things like that now ultimately um, this they could yeah. still make this work really hard because there's now this is something joe won't know um there's a yeah. bigger twist in final fantasy 7 that people tend to not know um no i know that twist okay i didn't know that twist yeah. there's, there's a yeah. scene where cloud learns the truth um yeah about that kind of stuff and that would be a good moment for him to also come to reality with what happened with the lost party member. So yes. that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Yeah, 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 they're, yeah. they're extending it a little bit, but they're, they're going to like make a good climax. These, I've, these narrative I've, complaints. I've said, core. I see. Gotcha. Uh, there's stuff with Zach in this game that I didn't oh. care about at all. That's another part of the plot where I was like, this didn't, oh, you didn't do it like? for me at all. You might like it. Um, mm. As cause I, everyone likes Zach who played crisis core, but I'm like, I yeah. like Zach for what he represents in original seven which is You're, yeah something cloud strives to be and that's that's all i need zach to be so yeah um uh the the bosses are great uh the combat's great sephiroth shows up a lot more in this um of course but you know he, he's great i love sephiroth um mm -hmm. he's actually a very good antagonist which was a big surprise for me going into seven so yeah like all like these narrative complaints i have said i'm actually like super optimistic because i liked Re remake a lot rebirth was even better than that it's it's almost perfect as a game like there's something like if they trimmed it down with the plot and like made the traverse a little better it would have been like one of the greatest games ever made so with this trajectory i think part three 
might be insanely like out of this world good because the people who love rebirth like maximilian dude uh for example is very big final fantasy 7 fan um streamer and he is head over heels for this game and i'm like i i wish i didn't have my narrative squabbles because the charm i want to be like where mm-hmm. you're at because i i was almost there but not quite but i think with three with a more focused plot um with not having to speculate what's going to happen in the future uh it's going to be great Whew. It- all right uh unicorn overlord joe joe and Bradley, y'all take over for me this is the fucking game right here i've been waiting for the new vanillaware yeah. forever uh yeah this is a new game by vanillaware famous developers of 13 sentinels which three of the four of us have played at this point yes and really really liked uh second place winner runner up third place runner winner of the 20 20- 20 game of the year awards Badass. i think it lost out to pathologic and the winner was what was the persona winner Persona 5 royale mm. fair because i i hard pushed for fair. persona 5 yeah um that's a good top three yeah uh but uh this so this is a wildly different game it's a strategy rpg game I think is the best way to describe it. But, like, it's not like the simple, like, oh, you have guys on the map, and then they run into a fight each other. Instead, you create these units of up to five characters um, of different, like, classes, like you would have in Fire Emblem, like a knight and or they're a like soldier. And they're, like, in a, a six-character grid where the positioning matters. Yeah. yeah. And two-by-six grid. And where you put them matters, because you really want your tanks up front, and you want your squishy guys in the back. Um... And they all have like their rock, paper, scissor matchups uh, that you can do as well. But the issue is, is that you have no control of these units when they come into contact with other units. They instead do like an auto battle sequence, like in like team fight tactics or any other uh, auto battlers, chess. auto chess, stuff like that. Um, but you're able to program each individual character's actions for specific things. Like you might have like, this is your generic sword slash, So that's going to be like your base attack. However, if you're going up against an armored unit, you should use this attack instead. And if there's this flying unit in here, you need to use this passive ability as well, or instead of something else. So you end up like creating these kind of like if state a bunch of these if yeah. statements uh, for each of these units, and it's delicious to dive into it's 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 so good oh man some of my people have like eight or nine different conditions on them because i'll be like oh only use this buff at the start of battle if there's a type of enemy it would be good against or like oh right only prioritize using this move if i have two or less allies currently because i have less allies on my squad so this character needs to play more defensively yeah um The mind expansion moment was when uh, Joe pointed out to me that you can reuse the same move in the command list, which means you can yeah. make one yes. move have three different like little branching paths of how it's used. Mm-hmm. Um, very clever. Like that system. Like I, I'm just gonna say they've created a amazing, like near revolutionary combat system in my opinion. Um, yeah. It's very so cool. clever, so deep. Mm-hmm. There's no like wrong way to do it like anytime you well, spend into your arm like you have to really fuck up to do something like horribly yeah. wrong. anytime you spend on your army is going to lead to some tangible improvements on the battlefield mm-hmm. um and that's not even like the stat system goes deep equipment system goes deep equipment gives you new skills so you have to like yeah dude with those. <laughs> i love equipment in this game because i hate when equipment is just stats yeah, like stats. E- equipping mm-hmm. a particular sword to this character could totally change oh yeah play style and all the conditions you put and on it does I'm in, yeah i'm in an area where like i i have to use the area specific enemy weapons because like they do get buffs because you're fighting that type of enemy or they debuff that enemy instead and it feels really good to use them and they're really strong and that's the other thing too sometimes you just get effects that like feel very weak but i feel like every effect in this game has its niche purpose yeah. that's like really useful there's like one item that me and willer were looking at we're like i don't really understand who could use this but i know there's someone out there that can use it yeah like it's you can go so deep like just just yesterday me and joe were like we were playing and i was streaming it and like for the last 10 to 15 minutes of that we were discussing how to like strategize three mm-hmm. three individual characters basically because that, that's like yeah. how much you could shoot the shit and like 
go back and forth on the scenarios that you'd want these characters to to perform in. Um, I view this yeah. as this is to me this is team building the game, yeah, oh, which yeah. is so yeah. fucking fun to me. But at the same time, you know, I'm playing on expert, which I kind of like how are. the difficulty. I like how the difficulty's tuned. Like if I get to a brand new mission that I'm right at the level four or right below, you know. I might have to restart the mission once or twice to like once mm -hmm. I learn like the routes enemies go and what I'm fighting, and then I can beat it. And but then at the same time, you know, I talk about how to me this is like team building the game. You can lose yourself in these systems, but if you don't want to do that, you also don't have to. Because like for example, Emmy's yeah. playing on normal, and she you know she's going through the missions, and she's like you know it. I mean it gets harder later on, and you know you have to either train a little bit or move your stuff around, but um. That's what's I, cool is like you don't like the systems are there, but you can still have fun even if you're not yeah. diving in. And true to Vanillaware, you can switch at any time. They really, yeah. I, I've now played multiple of their games. They really care about you having fun and like not being locked down. Yeah. Um, so I've always appreciated that about them. I, I will say when it comes to difficulty, Bradley, at least on expert mode, uh, I've had like two or three units that have been like at the cap essentially of like yeah. you can you can go up once you hit like three above whatever the average unit level is in that mission you don't gain xp or you gain like one xp i still there are still missions that i've i'm at this level with like units and those units are still getting like countered and like destroyed by certain configurations Strategy which just gets me excited because yeah. that's what i love yeah uh, dude like so it's just, the expert mm -hmm. difficulty is so fun because by having a limit on items you can do it, yeah joe was saying to me yesterday as well it makes each item you so valuable and important Mm -hmm. um, and like not even just in the necessary of like oh if i like like if i use this item i lose this item it's more like if i use an item right now i'm not gonna be able to use one 10 minutes from now where it might be more critical or vital or could save me like you have to be very deliberate with every item that you use and when you use it which brings me to another point of this game this might have one of, if not the best gameplay loop, loop, gameplay loop yeah. specifically of any game I've played. Because, like, I don't, it, there's something so scratching my mind when you're just yeah. vibing out in the field. Like, you can be spending 30 minutes just running around the field, which mm -hmm. is, like, the most basic thing you could do in a game like this. But I don't. It just integrates so well because, like, it's all about liberating this world. So being able to push deeper into territory, like, explore for things that will tangibly make your army better, that's all mm -hmm. great. And then you can spend thirty minutes in just the menus, and then go do thirty minutes of battles. And that all, yeah. every single one of those thirty minutes chunks of of gameplay fed into each other, and were all equally fun in their own right. Like, yeah. it's so impressive. I love this this world that they crafted. Um. Just no, walking up I, uh, and pressing X on shit just makes me feel good. I don't know. It's, Talking about that yeah, and like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was gonna say like, in regards to like the map, the map is also like it. It's like scaled to already what like what the battles are going to be when you fight. So like when you walk into an area, you'd be like, okay, this is the town I'm gonna liberate next. What's in this area? There's like a mountain and a river here. There's a bridge. True. I have to keep those things in mind. Oh, that yeah, that's a good point. You're doing the battles in the same location as the overworld. Like you're seeing the terrain of the combat as you're exploring oh, as well. I love that, because then I'm going over the overworld and I'm visiting these cities, and I'm like, I actually recognize this place because <laughs> I, I remember I sent my cavalry unit here to kill the guy and free this place, you yeah. know? Uh, you were going to say um, something about the loop, Bradley. Yeah, I just, I had a moment where I consciously realized how addicted I was to this game, because I just, like, you, you, you finish doing a battle, and then you get so much shit from the battle. I have so much money. I can go to the last town I was in and <laughs> finally buy all those items I wanted. And then I have this new territory. I can run around and I can pick up all the supplies. And I can pick up all the, uh, like, divine shards. But then in doing so, in beating this battle and getting all these new supplies that lets me buy all the stuff I already wanted, I also just liberated two new towns, which have their own stores with stuff oh. I now can't afford which makes me want to go to the neighboring town and beat it. And I get $10,000 and I come back here and I buy all the stuff I want, but now there's more towns and it's just, it's the perfect loop. The <laughs> thought of finishing this game is crushing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that being said, are we going to get a patch that adds 10,000 bonus levels to the post game? No, but the Bradley, I don't know if you know this, but when you beat the game, you unlock a higher difficulty. That I do love that. 
And that and higher difficulty permadeath. has permadeath, which is badass. Yes. That is badass. It's permadeath if your unit dies. So all the characters in the unit will be killed, but if one individual character dies. Yeah. So I can, okay, okay. But I also heard there's a ton of post-game content. So let's oh, see. Oh, okay. interesting. Um, yeah. I, uh... We'll see when we get there. No spoiler. Uh, I haven't looked into it because I've I've been very much same. loved like discovering all this on, on my own. I even got my other my friend uh, that uh, I might, I talked to my friend about because he's also like he's like one of my friends that like I talk a lot of strategy games, and tactical games with. We yeah. share a lot of, like what we're playing. Um, I told him about it and he got it and downloaded it and he he beat the game before I did. Um, wow. Which I, yeah, that's um, that's a testament to this game, by the way. Multiple weeks have come out since it came out, yeah. and Joe has not beat it yet. That is to be a fair, testament to this game. To be fair, I have a lot less time on my hands because I have about four hours true, between true, getting true. back home. You're from just work good at locking in and, and focusing at one at a time. So, yeah, so and so time. like, but but even then, like he 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 had like a he took a whole weekend and beat it. Um, he liked it so much he went and picked up thirteen Sentinels and is now playing that. Oh, That's man. what I'm fucking talking Beautiful. about. Beautiful. Yeah. And oh. he's, it's really funny because he's like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Perfect. Oh, I was just saying, yeah. they, uh, I was waiting kind of for the other shoe to drop in, thir- in uh, Unicorn Overlord because I'm like, oh, this is the same yeah. company that wrote that 13 Sentinel story. But I think I'm realizing that they just allocated all their points into strategy RPG yeah. over yeah. narrative. Like, well, it's interesting. This was going to be the last thing I was going to bring up. So this is a good like closing yeah. discussion is you guys know Vanillaware as a 13 Sentinels company. I know them yeah. as the Odin Sphere Dragon's Crown company. They are actually okay. really good at making gameplay systems. 13 Sentinels yeah. is their first game where Weird. they went hard on uh, the story. Um, okay. So like they're exceptionally good at making gameplay, um, and this shows in Overlord. Like they're well, yeah. But like that said, I'm really warming up to what they've done with the story. While it is a like a very like very generic, generic, simple uh, uh-huh. army story, the the beauty in it I think lies in the kind of like sprawling world nature of it, where like. This character mm-hmm. I got early in the game has a little bit more to him. He has more stories to tell in later areas because his he's lived in this world and he knows people. And by knowing people, he has new connections to kind of tie into, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Like, um, very recently I got Travis's sister. He's been like a go-to from the start of my game. And like yeah. there's some friction there and like they're still resolving it. So it's like, that's just like one of my 50 units that has his own little storyline mm-hmm. going on. Um, yeah. So I really like that, but then also like I do like the prose dialogue and voice acting. That also like it it, yep. it helps it from being just like a very generic story. So even when like the simplest vanillaware story, I think they're executing it in a way that's interesting because there's also good world lore. Like there's that town yeah. in uh, Drakenhold, Drakengard. Uh, Drakenhold. That... It has, like, a couple of towns where they send a bunch of sick people that the Zanarian uh, yeah, government yeah, yeah, yeah. has, like, biological warfare, and there's cool plague mask people. So, like, the world's sprawling, and I like it for that. Um, that said, like, even, I would say, Odin Sphere and Grim Grimoire, other Vanillaware games, have more, like, non-linear uh, stories than this, and, like, more, like, spicy stories, but I like what they're doing here and the approach that they went with is like you can take this game in any order so i think that kind of also limits how they want to do the game but also like yeah. all the characters are lovable in their own little bite-sized ways like they're very memorable likable mini characters that kind of the the they sum up to a greater whole like none of them are like as great of, as a character as like a 13 sentinels protagonist um but like individually, they're like all little cute, and like they they make a cohesive, cool cast, um, and you can very much find your favorites in that cast. So yeah, I'm gonna be working on this game for a while. It's it's yeah, it seems I'm at, long. <laughs> I'm at 64 hours. And I just hit like the 75 percent complete on the map thing. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna savor my so, time because it's it's fan- yeah. fucking fantastic. I. Um, it's great. I also think it's funny because, like, I've been we haven't done I haven't seen a check off in Bradley, but like the way I build units and the way Willer builds units are like completely different. I don't like streaming um, for Joe because I can feel his judgment. But I'm like, I don't, I'm, I'm beating judging. the missions, brother. <laughs> That's the thing. I'm like, I can't, I'm, I build some of my people and I'm like, I, I just know 
the others probably built the same character so differently. <laughs> oh, dude. I, it's, it, it's, it's so long as you beat it, it doesn't matter. Like, but I just, I just think it's the, the thought process is because I come from like a very strategy game mind. So like you want very specialized units that do what they do and they're really good at it and you send them out. Whereas like, I think y'all create more balanced units. that kind of have yeah. a little bit of spice of like one or two different categories. Like immediately when the game started, I took all my cavalry units it put them in one unit and that's was like, so that's my weird. cavalry. You're a fucking freak, bro. I don't and that's the thing. Oh, like, man. all of my bro. units are very balanced ones, like Joe was saying, where yeah. almost, almost every unit has a tank, a damage dealer, some kind of healer, stuff like that. Though, I did make one unit that is explicitly my cavalry unit, just mm -hmm. because, oh my fucking god, they oh, go, like, so five times faster than everybody else on the map. Yeah. That's a weird, like, thing for me, by the way, is, like, your speed on the map is determined by, like, your... Com combined mobilized like value why not uh, of that unit because if morden if morden's in the team we're gonna move a little slower you know he's a big boy <laughs> that's fine but like the point being is that like when your units get bigger they should overall move slower because it's it, it takes a longer time to move a larger army than like a smaller one if that makes sense yeah, like there yeah, should be get a your logic out of here it's good yeah game i know i don't know it's a small thing but it, it's fine for what it does um but man, I, all I'm saying is that like I had that cav unit and I was doing like 300 points of damage in Cornea. It was great. For me, uh, uh, that's insane. You're an insane person. Um, for yeah. me, like a highlight character that Joe was like, I didn't even use this guy, is the uh, like praise kink Osh. wizard Osh. Like he, yeah. his, his, he's like the cornerstone of this deadly unit that I have set up. And that's just great. Mm -hmm. Everyone, no one's going to play this game the same. It's almost impossible to, yeah. to build your army out in even a remotely close way as a friend in this i'm um, really i'm really excited to show y'all like what i've been working with with my guys when y'all are able to like catch up or like when y'all you know, beat the game or something like that because yeah. it's 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 fun to like theory craft of like here's what i did with this unit and how it's been functioning and, and stuff like that um because it's because we have like some similar strategies like with uh bernice and Berengaria in that unit. Like, it's God. very, very close. Yeah. My two, my two girls, man. I might be ahead of Bradley even yeah. uh, with some of the characters I found, which is cool. They took, like, that so. non-linear story approach and very much applied it to how you go with the game. Uh, all yeah. right. Uh, let's talk about Dungeon Crawler Carl. <laughs> Tyler, how to go, how to go. Tyler's excited. Um, here's what I have to say. New achievement! Cringe enjoyer. <laughs> You finished Dungeon yeah. Crawler Call Book One. What does Dude, that say time, about you? <laughs> every time you, I I feel happy every time we, we get a wave of achievements in the in the audiobook. I love how that motherfucker cringe ass AI reads out new achievement. It's always so satisfying. Oh man, y'all y'all are enjoy like. Here's the thing: at the end of Book One, I wasn't sold. I told Bradley. Really. If it, it book two will change you, maybe, to... maybe I'm sold because I know you like the whole series, so I'm like, oh, this was very fun, and it gets better. Okay, cool. No, Willer, he yeah. ain't kidding. Because here's the thing: I was in the same boat where you know Tyler had always said like, oh no, this this writer he really hits a stride on book two, and I'm like, I mean, I liked book one; it was enjoyable. Uh, so far in book two, oh my god, there's one particular chapter that that haunts me. Like, I never thought I would say something in a book called Dungeon Crawler Carl is haunting, but this dude did some damn good writing. Well, like, that's the thing. He's a pretty good writer, actually. Like, yeah. he's got a really good grasp of just, like, character development. Like, my main concern was that this game, this book would be overly, like... I don't know, nihilistic, snarky, like, you know, like a, the kind of, like, mean-spirited. It seems like something that would have been mean-spirited. And there is some of that. I mean, it's a cruel system that they're put in, and the game kind of, the book kind of revels in it a little bit. But also, no. it's not devoid of, like, tender moments and heart and actual character development with the character. So, like, it works out. It's a good balance, I think. Um, um, so hearing what? that, like, he's cooking even better in two is very interesting. Oh, he's cooking so good. But uh, I want to hear more stuff that you liked about book one. Because uh, I know there are little moments that, uh, at, at least for hi him as a writer, I think uh, he's really good at knowing when to move stuff along. Like, for mm -hmm. example, 
maybe they get new gear and then it'll be like Carl's like, okay, then we spent the next four hours moving in this direction, killing mobs along the way. And I'm like, okay, that's good. We don't need to hear those full four hours. Oh, he's mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. good with pacing, actually. Like, I think pacing might be one of the story's strongest suits because he knows exactly when to slow down and break down and like, okay, let's go actually go over the loot boxes we got and all that. And like, when to explain lore and characters. And yeah, it, it just all works out. And also the story has a good rhythm where... Like, it gets a lot better halfway through. It's particularly when you run into Maggie May and, like, what's what's the husband's name? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. Cool. That, that was when the book yeah. went from, like, mildly enjoyable to good. Uh, was when that they, their first encounter with a human, basically. And the way that it played out, the intelligence that Carl shows, the utilization of the game rules... And that how it's, it's an ongoing like uh, ongoing conflict now. Just on all accounts, like that was a step up for the book at that point. It was definitely a shining moment of like his his like knowledge of the system so far. He picked up on stuff that I, as the reader, didn't. But when he explained it, I was like, that totally makes sense. I want to highlight other things that are really good in book one. Carl is actually a very good protagonist. Um, yeah. It seems like he would be uh, kind of a dumb meathead, but I think he's the perfect way to execute a, like, generic action, like, white buff, like, act, like hard-headed go-getter kind of protagonist. Like, he's a really good way to do that kind of archetype. Um where, like, there's still tender moments to Carl and, like, that chant that he keeps telling himself, like, you're not going to break me. And uh, his relationship with Donut. Like, the reveal that he was going to kidnap Donut and try to, like, kind of, like, move in with her is, is like, a really good moment for both those characters where it's like, oh, Carl needed this cat more than he would let us, let on, like, believe at the start of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, where they're just bickering at each other. Um Donut's another character could have easily been annoying, but a combination of stellar voice acting and just enough like bringer down to earth moments made uh, Donut a very fun character as well. This thing, I love the dual nature of like Donut's a cat, so obviously they have this just huge image of the of the so like just delusions of grandeur about yeah. how great they are, but also they are brand new to being sentient and. They, I think there's like a moment where they get like spam, like congratulations, you're the millionth whatever, and she's like, oh my god, Carl, you're not gonna believe this. We're <laughs> we're the millionth visitors. This is great. We 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 win a prize. Her na- <laughs> her naive moments are so cute. She she's great. It's the, it's the combination of I'm the shit, but also she's just so unaware of how naive she is. A couple of other highlights I want to bring up. Um. There's a moment where we hang out with some goblins and get their motivation of, like, what they're doing as they do yeah. as, as a mob. Like, they're like, we keep fighting so one day we can move to a lower floor and not have to worry about you people showing up again because you're all, you're not going to make it that deep. Like, that's their motivation. And I think that's really interesting. I gave a motivation of that to, like, the mobs. Um, yeah, it's like it's almost peaceful for them to be on the lower, more intense floors because they're like, okay, well, no one goes there. Goes there. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and then Carl proceeds to kill a bunch of the babies. I was like, all right. So the... the, the, the been unlocked. But, you know, like, as mean as that is, it's it's a deliberate plot decision that Carl takes seriously, and it motivates him even more to retain his humanity. So I feel like even at its, like, zaniest moments, I think it's doing something interesting. Um, uh, I like Carl's build. This is a weird thing to talk about in the story. Um, bra- you know, he's, he's the fist fighter. He's good with his yeah. feet, uh, to his detriment. Um, <laughs> I like his, uh, I really like the meta game of the game they're playing, where because Carl wants pants so bad, they're not going to give him pants. He's a more entertaining character for wearing boxers. And um, yeah. ultimately, like, the theme of the story, I feel, is like it's a very, like, anti-capitalist message of, like, entertainment taking to the umpteenth degree. It's like it's a it's a Hunger Games satire. It is. It's yeah. It's it's got that level of satire of like, this is what happens when you take entertainment and mixes mix in people's lives and dehumanize them and like all the interviews are super good. Glurp glurp. Glurp glurp. Hell yeah, brother. Speaking of that, um, 
I was so happy when uh, Zev got introduced because her and Dota were like best friends. I was about to talk about Zev. Zev's such an important character for the story, I feel. Um, he was like wary of them, and it's like, I'm only here because it's my job, and like this is kind of gross. And then the second Gossip Girl came up, she's like, Oh my god, y'all are my best friends. It's hard. You can't, like, Zev is important because it shows that not all the Kua teens are in the same mind. Like, there are people that think this is barbaric, but, be, like, that's what I say. Like, this is how they make mo these planets make money as far as i understand like they're stuck in a per per perpetuating system where to make money they have to host these games and use lower life forms as the bait so like there's a message here it's not all just like lol's humor there there's a story here there's a message so surprisingly good um i think i mentioned last time that's a little more video gamey than i expected like distra distractingly so sometimes where it's like i don't know it's just it's a genre that's that, that I don't know. It, it's just a weird genre where like your punch has a stat, and by punching more, your stat gets big. Like, how does that work? Do they have nano machines? I think they're in a simulation. They um, get into that. Yeah, I imagine they have to. If I have to guess, <laughs> that is part of the plot. Um, my guess right now is simulation is always a a good way to explain this. Um, Bradley, do you have a guess about it? No noted now last when bradley talked about this tyler snuck in a sneaky he's like there's a side plot going on that i wonder if you caught so as i read i was like can i catch the side plot um i don't think i did like is the side plot that the ai likes carl because like that's just that's not side plot that's just plot like that's just part of the main narrative um is it maybe that <laughs> the there's stuff going on with the pig clan i don't know it could be just like the politics going on that that might be where like stuff that i missed like maybe grander politics so i don't those know those are all good 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 looking outs but not necessarily what you were talking about maybe uh maybe maybe it was maybe it wasn't but even then a lot of that stuff i, I feel like just continues to get built on which oh, yeah. is cool. The world building's good, actually. Um, How did y'all feel about the rage elemental? That, se that sequence was sick. <laughs> oh, that whole segment was badass, because um, I think before they actually did their plan, like the like the instant before they did it, uh, Donut pings Carl on all caps, like, everyone, everyone in the universe is watching. <laughs> <laughs> Donut's all caps typing is so charming. And I love how, I love how the reader reads it. Carl, I'm scared. <laughs> like... Oh yeah, the reading is perfect. Um, that yeah, but that was mentioned. Interesting. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, good plot. I'm interested to see where it goes. I will. I will definitely check out book two, but not right away. Uh, I did this because Tyler is a good pal, so I wanted to read one of his books for once. But I've been trying to read Shogun, and then they made the yes. Shogun TV show. So it's like I bought this book. I should probably read it before I watch the TV show that everyone likes. So mm -hmm. we're doing that now. Shogun, good. Um. Anything else worth bringing up? Uh, the rage, yeah, I, that was another point. No, again, outsmarting the system. Um, yeah, I really want to know how all this superpower shit works. Uh, if there's anything how do you else. feel about the Meadowlark residents? Man, that is a heartbreak just waiting to happen, uh, dude. And Carl knows. The beauty is, Carl knows that it's a heartbreak waiting to happen, but he can't let it go. He's he's a he's a good person at the end of the day talking about them i thought that was such a good like setup throughout the book where every time they get um like patch notes for example there's always something about like okay the toilets work now you don't have to pee out in the hallway and then it's like okay seriously don't pee out in the hallway and it's like it's happening throughout the book and it, then you get to the point where that old guy pees on the wall and then you're like oh my fucking god i'll, I'll also throw out that i think Donut and Miss Beatrice is another heartbreak waiting to happen. One way or the other. Either Beatrice is alive and that's its own heartbreak, or she's dead and Donut will have to find out one day. And both of them are going to be fucking disastrous. That's all I know. You should keep listening to Dungeon Crawler Carl. New achievement. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's like, I think at the end of the audiobook they had like achievement unlocked you finish the book and yeah. I was like oh okay that's fun <laughs> there was a cute finale there um yeah those are all my main points Tyler you, you got me you motherfucker this piece of trash pretty good actually 
I win. I dude, I I I I let y'all know when something isn't worth it. I was it's true. I was insistent it's upon this one. Is this is one's different? I promise. It is. It was worth. It was worth. I like the whole time. I was like, the solid three, three point five. It might be like a four stars for me. Like that was just good. Like very few notes. I just had fun it listening. Was, it was a fun it. time. Fit fun quick. Um. I hope it keeps this up, and I hope it keeps, like, its balance of humor to serious to emotion that I think it's writing really well right now. Um, man, that that fucking Glurp Glurp show, that was, like, another <laughs> moment of elevation. Carl was so good in that sequence. Exactly how to play everyone. And the way that the narrator read the Glurp Glurp every time, I was like, I just fucking love this. Glurp Glurp! <laughs> you can hear, like, background voices, like, over... over... The, lapping on each other you mentioned the voice modulation is is very nicely done very tasteful um tasteful is a word i wouldn't i wasn't expecting to use for dungeon crawler crawl one there I, it is one last thing actually i struggle to visualize the dungeon and maybe it's because i glossed over like key ways that they describe it like i don't know how, how would y'all like there i there were times where i might have a hard time picturing it but then like a chapter or two later they would clarify something about like the way the brick or the floor looks, and I'm like, oh, okay, I can... Like, are they walking this. through hallways a lot of the time? Is it tubes? Like, I, I, I get it's lost. Like it changes, hate. It's like a tube, but like a cave for, like, the first bits, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like, imagine imagine the underground for Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Okay, that is... Yes, you, you hit me. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> book two? But the boss rooms are, like... Oh, Oh. Very different, like yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, book two, it's very easy to visualize. Um, I don't like the overarching plot of book two, mm. but I like the progression. Um, I like the concept. I think I I don't like some of the like arcs that they go through. Man, I will um, say uh, the little moments in book two I think are even better. Yeah, because yeah, that's some of the highlights for me. Um, uh, book three. Whew. You just said book two would change me and then went, yeah, that plot kind of meant, though. <laughs> three is when you'll be back like, yo, I need to fucking talk about Dungeon Crawler Carl. Damn. Damn, that good? I wonder if, huh. if it's going to be two floors per book. I think that's what we covered in... Yeah, we didn't get... To... Yeah, we just got to three. Okay. So maybe that's the pace. That'd be an interesting pace. Or there. I feel like we're gonna break out of this. Like <laughs> it's gonna get like Hunger Games Book Three, where it's like no more games. It's war now, kind of thing. Joe Dungeon Crawler Carl win. There's your answer. Oh, uh, yep. Sorry, I, I was on mute while y'all because I was eating chips. Um, I don't know. Uh, what's twenty hour book do you want to read? <laughs> uh, wait, hold on, hold on. Ass. Wait, uh, hold on, Joe. Let me yeah. quickly gain access to my Audible, and I will sell you on something. Hold on, hold what, on. What are you what gonna sell I'm me excited. On? I have no idea. What I am too. Doing. I've got the perfect one to to. So I've got two. I've got American Gods, which is 19 hours. Okay. I've and, never read American Gods, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a whiff. Um. All right. My bad. My bad. Hyperion. I've never. I don't know what that book is either. Is that a Bradley book? It's probably a Bradley book. Which one is that? Hyperion. I want to read that motherfucker so bad. Joe, how long is yeah. Tax Test book? Thirty what? hours. What is Tax Test book? He talked about Tax Test book for like three three sec sections. Oh, you called it... I didn't know what you meant by that. Yeah. The the Chinese dynasty one. What's that called again, Joe? Yeah. The first book is called The Grace of Kings. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, That's phenomenal. We're going to talk it. about Dragon's Dogma for it no more than five minutes because it is... What I would be playing if Unicorn Overlord didn't come out immediately before it. Uh, okay, I wanted to lead with this. This screams Bradley to me. Is, is that just me, yeah. Joe? No, um, this... Uh, Bradley, this game is inspired by Berserk, and that's kind of where I'm going to end that recommendation on. Uh, well, I mean, so, shit, yeah. Clips, a clips of the first game, and it looked like the most fun shit I've ever seen in my it's life. It's got so. the it's, Bradleyism it's, of, like, yeah. stupid shit happens, and you're yes. swinging a big sword. And, like, yeah. 
<laughs> it's and the it's very I I've been really enjoying the combat uh from the classes I played. The rogue's the only one that I've kind of been like. Mm. Oh uh, no! Once you learn to right. pin people down, like you jump and do the pin attack with the rogue, it's really fun. Um, I have been doing that, but it's just also like I like big sword, and I like because like the big sword has like the the fucking short you can like sword attack that I really like doing. Big sword um, is what I'm using most recently. I need to unlock more moves. Um, yeah, Ar they made archer fun, uh, rare. Yeah. And you only rare. Capcom can make archer fun. Is what I've learned. Um, this also feels a little bit of like proto. Uh, monster hunter like there's some like i get some monster hunter vibes from like the way it moves and mechanics wise but i also feel like this game is way more unwieldy than monster hunter which is weird to say do you feel that way willer sometimes not all the time mainly because there's no lock on i think that's yes it. that's it you just have to position yourself more um yeah. i will say i have more complaints with this game than i think joe and sir Ket do definitely sir Ket. um uh I think this game Go this game expects you to have no life, which is a weird complaint. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. you get it? I was like, just... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like, this game expects you to have all the time in the world. Like, it, it's asking a lot of the player where, like... And I respect it. I respect the fuck mm -hmm. out of it. I just... It, God, I have, I have to play Persona 3, my guy. You can't be, like, making me walk this much. And, it's like, got... It has a... It has a lot of content, and, like... I, I, it's an open world game and I feel like the big thing about world open world game is that you have to get you have to make game from point A to point B very interesting either that's the way your movement mechanics work or the your Advent interaction like the are... adventure aspect of it is what yes. this game nails um, yes but it can I, be I, grading I, like sections yes. where you barely make any progress even though you put in like over an hour mm -hmm. and a half and like yeah. you feel like you've accomplished nothing kind of section or it's like i have to go to this town and it's a little bit out of the way to get there and it's like i'd rather like take a bus to get there like I, but maybe when i get there i will get the bus it's so like jarring like there's the town that you save in the south and i'm like they come back in a few days it's like well it's been a whole week so i guess i should come and check out to see what the hell's going on now um so Brad, but yeah do you know about the <laughs> pawn system and how that works no do you want to hear I'll, about this system? Um, I don't know, cause here's I know nothing about this game. Like, yeah. I don't know any motherfucking thing about these games except I've seen gameplay, and I'm like, I'm just gonna like it. it uh, you do well with some spoilers, though. I feel they, they incentivize you, yeah. so I think you'd yes. be interested in this. Um, okay, Joe, you probably you can probably explain it best. Um, basically, you when the game starts. Like really starts. Uh, you get to make a second character that is like your your pawn, which is like your buddy oh. that follows you around everywhere you go. It's a nice word for slave. But, yeah. Um, well, you know. But uh, but the thing is that pawn can also show up in other players' games, and they can hire them on, and you can oh. send them out on quests like, "Hey, go kill a cyclops," and whoever kills that cyclops with you gets this prize and you physically give that pawn like a prize to give that does person, that remove it from your inventory joe because i just got yes, a book from Robin. okay thank you yeah thank you for the book <laughs> <That's pretty laughs> yeah. uh, it's very cool um it's like a, i think it's like one or two tiers below death stranding mechanics when it comes to kind of that interplay um yeah but that like so because joe is ahead of me robin yeah. is pawn based on yeah. the robin can mm -hmm. help me out with a lot of quests because she's done it with Joe. So she knows yes. how to lead the way to the quest. So Robin yeah. cuts a lot of my searching time if I'm playing with mm -hmm. her, if Joe's already done that content. Um, yeah. My, my pawn is Sakamoto from Sakamoto Days because I just didn't know what to make. I was like, it'd be really funny if I just isekai Sakamoto into this. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, like, the thing is, I think the pawn system is a little bit overrated is my hot take um mm. it's not quite as emergent as i like as people make it seem like it is like yeah the pawns are based on personalities and once you've heard them talk like you realize that truly aside from the things they've done and like the the locations mm -hmm. they can lead you to and like how they're built their actual ai personalities are like four different people um 
It reminds me of Animal Crossing Villagers, and yes. it's like, you're going to interact with them until I've identified all the personalities, and then if I meet someone, after their first sentence, I know which personality they are. That's exactly, it's that, but your Animal yeah. Crossing guys have done things that can help you out, so it's like the, the yeah. one step above Animal Crossing. Um, the, the one thing is, though, I will say, is that we've played it on, uh, on release weekend, and it might over time unlock more stuff as more players have done more in the game and have they have more dialogue to talk okay. about. If that right. makes we'll, sense. See. we'll see. We'll see. I don't a hundred percent know, but like I, it I might know. be one of those like kind of yeah. I might be one of those situations where it's just because not everyone's like as far on like an average normal distribution. Um, we might need to just wait to see what else develops because I have gotten some more interesting dialogue you can't specialize uh, your pawn in gameplay ways like my pawn is particularly yeah. good at killing uh ogres so Ooh. like that's what i'm working for right like if your pawn kills 30 ogres mm -hmm. you give them a badge so that when your pawn is hired the ai will perform just straight up better against ogres yeah. and it'll be more useful so like it's cool yeah. but i also feel like the emergent gameplay compared to like something like a hell divers or monster hunter it, that's also not quite as, as high as people claim it is. Because, like, the emergent gameplay amounts to, oh, I ran into a funny mob on my trip to this town, and he threw my my pawn into the river and then destroyed the ox cart. Like, I don't know, man. I had to do a quest where, like, I had to escort this ox cart with stuff, and then a griffin came in and attacked the ox cart, and I had to physically carry the stuff to the town. That sounds um, like a fucking nightmare, brother. What? But also, like, that's adventure. It like, is. That's, that's... It is. But, like, that's, like, it, it's gonna amount to a lot, like, that's yeah. a, that's a rare, it, usually it's gonna amount to running into a fucked up, like, fight that's happening and you walk into the fight and help them out. Like, it's, yeah. I think it's a yeah. little bit overstated what it is. But that's, we're like, also, we're, we're also very we're early in the game. game. Um, because I also ran into an enemy that was like, I had fucked this thing and I, I believe <laughs> traveling at night is scary in it's, this. It's yes. fucked up, <laughs> but it's I need really to kill not, some ghosts really cool. to help a, a, yeah. a girl who needs medicine from ghosts. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have to figure have, out how to travel at night. Well, like on the flip side though, too, like I had to find this boy uh, that got chased by wolves and the search went on for so long that it turned to night and it just made things way harder. And, and like, just, it made it way harder, but it turns out, he was collecting these flowers that glow in the dark, so I was actually able to find his trail from the nighttime That's much pretty easier. Neat. Pretty neat. Yeah. So like, there is some stuff. Like There's we're stuff. not too far into it, but we'll see. it is a game that's like, it is an MMO sized game where it's like this is going to be the one game you play all year, kind of a thing. And uh, by the way, don't go on the subreddit. Uh, people from the first game are not ha are not happy. By Damn. The way. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they, they are. Uh, right. You know, maybe. But I, I also think there, but there, it's also one of those like I played 120 hours and I just I don't know, man. <laughs> it's 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 that it's the long game syndrome. It's, long, it's yeah, like I gotcha. It's yeah. No wonder you're tired of the game. You played you nothing play but it for three days. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Yeah. Chip you didn't play it for 100. You didn't play it for 120 hours. You played it for 250 hours because you also played the last game. <laughs> so you've played it before. Like, Take a breath, nerd. Like I said, this is a game yeah. for no lifers, and like, I play a mm -hmm. bunch of video games, but I feel like I'm accomplishing things. This game is like, oh my god! Like, I feel like I'm stuck in this. Like, it's immersive in both negative and positive ways. That being said, like, when I sit down and play, I am having a really good fun time. Yeah, it's doing a good vibe. It, it, it's a good vibe. Um, it can get taxing at times, and it's definitely one of those things where it's like, you know what? It's starting to drag. I'm gonna save, and I'm gonna go do something else, yep. and walk away from it. And I am an adult that can do that and understands that I have precious, uh, precious. focus time. To close it off, I would be so curious to see if this is if this is yeah. up Bradley's alley because like Bradley, I think it's getting played this year. You like you, okay. you like Skyrim, right, Bradley? Like oh, fuck yeah. This is like Skyrim, like but good. You know, like yeah, <laughs> exactly what you mean. Yeah, no, that's I'm always think mm -hmm. I'm always playing. I'm like this is like what Skyrim wanted to be. Oh, with yes. modern technology and shit and yeah. Bethesda could never they could, no and they will never all right and we didn't touch oh, yeah, we yeah. didn't touch on i was just gonna i was gonna say like we, we touched on very briefly um one thing about all fantasy games is like I, magic systems i i kind of like i'm always just like i want to see what they can do 
apparently you can do some crazy shit with the magic this stuff is good this magic game. they made good mages yeah. in this one and even if you're not a yeah. magic user you can just read a book and it'll cast a spell like live True. Well, that's, that's the book i gave willer yeah uh, I, I, I don't know i was just like i have a ton of these here you go <laughs> all right yeah long ass podcast that's enough yeah i'll catch you guys in the future <laughs> bye-bye yeah